From the Embers, Ember Society Book 3, written by A. R. Colbert, narrated by Jennifer Groberg. Chapter 1 Hands balled into fists at my sides, feet primed and in position, I was ready to run. I would sprint over the hills, zig and zag past the trees. I'd swim up the river if I had to, as long as it took me away from this place. I didn't know exactly where to go, but I knew I wasn't going to stay here. Claren, don't be rash, Rafe pleaded with me again, his dark eyes like open expanses, full of depth, full of concern, always pulling me in. I hated the way I was drawn to him. Even now, angry as I was, there was a part of me that wanted to forgive him. I wanted to pretend I didn't just see him standing happily with his beautiful spouse match. I wanted to pretend he felt the same way about me that I felt about him. But it just wasn't true. I'm not being rash. My words sounded as bitter as I felt. But there's nothing for me here. I need to get away. I turned and started for the forest at the edge of the camp. The other embers, both those who had been with the cause for some time and those who had just joined the movement, chatted cheerfully across the clearing, blissfully unaware of the turmoil churning inside me. That morning I strode proudly into the camp ready to join them. Those who knew better told me not to, James, Felix, and even my dad. They all urged me to stay in the center. But the truth was, there was nothing left for me in the city either. I was a misfit, neither meant for the embers nor the center. Not a rebel, not a leader, just no one, alone. At least let me help you get back to the city. Rafe caught up to me and placed a warm hand on my arm, turning me back to face him. I can drive you into town, and we'll figure out what comes next. I don't need your help, Rafe. I told you. I'm going away. A flock of birds erupted from the tree line in the distance, drawing Rafe's eyes away for a moment. I used his brief lapse of attention on me to wrench my arm away and keep moving toward the trees. It had taken about thirty minutes by car to get here. If I wanted any chance of walking back to the city before nightfall, I needed to get moving. Please, don't do this, he called out as I began my retreat. I raised a single hand in the air, not looking over my shoulder. I couldn't face him again. It still hurt to see his face and imagine him with her, Marissa. Goodbye, Rafe. He groaned, and the crunching of leaves under his feet as he jogged back to the camp brought me a bittersweet satisfaction. I hated to say goodbye. Selfishly, I wanted to be the girl by his side, fighting for the Ember Society. But deep down, I couldn't say that I was surprised. I knew he was matched back in the city, and Dax had warned me that he was still with her. I knew it. I just didn't want to believe it. None of that mattered anymore, though. I was off to new places. It stung that my dad urged me to go back to the city, but his insistence had to mean something. Obviously, there was still work to be done there. Whatever Emmeline's offer entailed, it was really the only option on the table for me. My pace quickened as I stepped through the tree cover. Out of sight of the embers back at camp, I no longer had the need to keep my emotions in check. I set them free, allowing my legs to pump hard as they pushed me over fallen logs and overgrown brush. I leapt and ran faster, dodging unruly branches and vines that scraped against my jacket as I pushed my way through. I ran until my muscles ached and my breathing was jagged. My face was wet with tears I didn't realize had escaped. I couldn't hold them back anymore. Succumbing to my own self-pity party, I leaned against an old oak and allowed my body to slump to the ground, giving my muscles time to recover and my eyes the freedom they needed to empty the wells inside. I didn't intend to stay there long. I just needed to get it out of my system. I had to clear my head with the cleansing power of a good hard cry, but even that seemed too much to ask of the world. Just minutes after I'd sat on the forest floor, the rumble of an engine cut through the trees, disrupting my little sad fest. I choked out one final sob and wiped the tears and snot from my face. 
Pulling my knees up under me, I moved into a squatting position, listening and waiting to see who was coming my way. The engine noise grew louder and louder until it stopped just a few yards away on an overgrown path through the trees. I knew it was Rafe before I saw him. I could feel his presence. I hadn't realized how much my skills as an empath had grown over the last several months since I'd begun using them more often. But there was no denying it now. I could feel Rafe's concern for me as though it had its own texture, or maybe it was more of a harmony I heard, unique only to him and meant just for me. I couldn't explain it really, but our connection was strong. It was definitely him. Claren! Rafe's voice called out to me clear and loud. I silently cursed to myself. He could feel me just as easily as I could feel him. Why did he follow me? I told him I wanted to go alone. Claren, I know you're here. Let me drive you back to the city, please. I just want you to be safe. I didn't need him to keep me safe anymore. It was time for me to learn how to take care of myself. Didn't he realize how much it hurt me to look at him now that I knew he was with Marissa? I swallowed a lump in my throat and shook it off. I shouldn't have been crying in the woods over some boy. I needed to pick myself back up and move forward. I didn't need Rafe to do good work for the embers. I could do it on my own, and I didn't need my dad. I didn't even need Felix. I'd been offered an opportunity to rise above them all in the district leadership. That was my lot. That was my purpose. I'd break the system down from the inside. I straightened my shoulders and lifted my chin with new resolve right before Rafe stepped into view from behind my tree. I have to admit, you made it way further than I expect. What's wrong? Are you hurt? I must have been a mess. Dried leaves tangled in my hair, puffy eyes, a blotchy nose and cheeks. Rafe's grin was replaced with panic as soon as he laid eyes on me. He quickly dropped to my side and reached for my hand, but I scooted out of his reach and stood. I'm fine. I was just resting. He stood as well, silently appraising me. His brows slowly pulled down over his stormy eyes, but he didn't mention my appearance. Come on, he said, reaching for my hand once again. I'm going to give you a ride. It wasn't an offer. It was a command. And frankly, I was tired of people telling me what to do. I ignored him, marching forward to the road I knew lay just ahead. Why are you being difficult? He didn't attempt to hide his frustration as he scurried to catch up to me. I stopped and turned in place, feeling the heat rising in my cheeks. Oh, I'm being difficult now? I stepped toward him and he squared up his shoulders, preparing himself for whatever kind of attack he thought I might deliver. I came here today because I didn't know where else to go. I'm tired of working with those snakes in the center Rafe. I wanted to go home, and this is as close to home as I can get right now. So imagine my surprise when my dad turned me away again, and then you. I dropped my accusing finger, unsure of how to finish. The truth was, he didn't do anything wrong. We weren't anything to each other, not officially, anyway. I looked away and caught my breath before continuing. You have other responsibilities now. Rafe's expression softened, and my stomach flipped as he took a cautious step toward me. I'm sorry it didn't go well with your dad. I sniffled, fighting the pressure that was building up again behind my eyes. It's fine. He hasn't really been a part of my life for a few years. I don't know why I expected that to change now. I have, Rafe said, moving closer to me yet again. I've been a part of your life, and I'd still like to be, if you'll have me. I put up a hand to block him from coming any closer. I could feel the warmth radiating off his chest with my fingertips. No, you have Marissa now, and I have to go. I looked away, afraid that if I stared into his eyes any longer, I'd completely lose it again. I had to change the subject. I've been offered another position with the district. The district? 
I thought you said you didn't know where you were going. I don't, not exactly. I don't know what kind of work I'll be doing. I just know that I have to leave class and city. Well, then I'll come with you. I snapped my eyes back to him. Was he serious right now? I already told Frank I was taking you back to the city, he continued. I'll call him when we get there and let him know I'm leaving too. He stepped forward again, taking my elbows in the palms of his hands and pulling me close. But I kept my hand in front of me, pressed against his chest to give me room to breathe. I couldn't think straight when he was so close to me. Our feelings became one tangled mess of emotion when we were this close, and I had a hard time deciphering what I was feeling from what he was feeling. I pushed myself away again. I had to think. Rafe, stop, please. I'm trying to be strong and do the right thing here, but you're not making this easy on me. I have to go, and you have to stay. The embers need you here. Your wife needs you here. My wife? Claren, what are you talking about? I know about Marissa. Dax told me all about it, and I saw you two back there. You don't need to pretend. I can handle the truth. I raised my chin again, thinking if I maintained a look of strength on the outside, I might just feel it on the inside, too. I told you that wasn't what it looked like. There's a serious misunderstanding here. It doesn't matter, I interrupted. Not anymore. You can take me back to the city if you'd like, but then I've got to say goodbye. For good this time. Rafe opened his mouth to object, but he was cut short by a low rumble in the distance. He instinctively dropped a few inches lower behind the brush, pulling me with him. Shh, he whispered. Follow me. Together we inched closer to the main road, the rumble growing louder and louder with every passing second. We were nearly there when the rumble rushed past us with a whoosh and a roar. Two flashes of black flew down the road before us, sending my heart into a frantic beat against the inside of my ribs. What was that? I whispered back to Rafe. He was still supporting my arm, but I realized I was holding on to him just as tightly, with his jacket clenched in my fist. I'm not sure, but it looks like they stopped. I followed his gaze up the road to the top of a gradual hill. Atop the hill sat two black motorcycles. I recognized them from pictures from before the Great War, but they were peculiarly out of place in our world. Yet it wasn't the motorcycles that set off my alarms. It was something about the men who rode them. The men were too far away for me to hear them, but I could see them from our position behind the bushes. They were dressed in full black, from the tips of their toes right up to the shiny helmets on their heads. And something about the sight of them twisted my stomach. These were not good men. The shorter of the two walked close to the trees near where they stood and gestured in the direction of the ember camp Rafe and I had just left. The taller man turned to examine the area as well before lifting his arm to point at something in the woods. As he did, the collar of his black jacket fell open, just enough to reveal a thin blue band flush against the skin of his neck. Who are they? I asked. I have no idea. I've never seen anything like that before. Rafe turned to face me, and the look in his eyes matched the way I felt perfectly. Something was very wrong about this. Chapter 2 Let's follow them, I whispered as the men climbed back onto their motorcycles. Absolutely not. Rafe left me no room for objection. You have somewhere to go, remember? Yeah, but they're obviously up to something. What if they're going to rob the camp? Then they won't be able to take much on those bikes. I glared at him. You know what I mean? They're making plans to do something. We've got to find out what it is. Claren, no. This is not up for discussion. Two men won't be able to do much damage to the camps, if any at all. The embers are prepared for this kind of thing now more than ever. They had to learn quickly after the exiled moved back into the area. But what if we can stop them? What if you can't? There was a hint of desperation in Rafe's eyes. 
You have gone through so much already. Please, just let me keep you out of danger this once. I'm begging you. The men were already riding away, the tops of their helmets disappearing as their bikes roared over the other side of the hill. The impending sense of doom they left behind, on the other hand, still hung thick and heavy in the air. I don't like this. I know they're up to something. I can feel it. And I appreciate your consideration, but I don't need you looking out for me. Go back to Marissa and the others. Let them know what we saw. I stood to walk away, but Rafe's next words stopped me in my tracks. Maybe I want to look after you, Claren. Maybe it's for me just as much as it is for you. And I wish you'd quit mentioning, Marissa. We're not married. We're not even together. I paused, but I didn't turn around. Okay, you should still let them know. He quickly caught up to my side. That's it? You don't even want me to explain? It doesn't matter. Whatever your explanation is, it won't change anything. The Embers need to know about a potential threat, and I'm leaving. I don't have any other options. My shoulders fell as I met his eyes. And neither do you. I want to explain anyway. He stopped and raised his hands as though he wanted to reach for me, but he didn't. He dropped them back to his sides. And I'd really like to drive you back to the city. I don't want you walking back with those men we just saw on the loose. I can talk while we head back to the vehicle, and if it's still what you really want, I'll say goodbye once I know you're safe. It wasn't what I really wanted, and the look on Rafe's face said it wasn't what he really wanted either. But I was repeatedly told not to stay outside with the embers. I had to trust that my dad and the others knew more than I did. I had to trust that I was capable of doing more from the inside. I nodded, and the corner of Rafe's mouth twitched into a small, sad smile. He reached out again, and I allowed him to take my hand this time. His warmth crept up my arm and spread throughout my body. I tried to block my reaction. I didn't need to complicate things with my feelings for him. But it was useless. I wasn't capable of hiding anything from him. His smile widened as he laced his fingers through mine and led me back toward his vehicle. So you know I was matched, and you're right about it being Marissa. I tensed as we walked. Rafe deserved the chance to tell me what really happened with Marissa. He said they weren't together, but the mention of her made my chest feel tight anyway. What you don't know is that I was her third match. Her first two didn't work out for various reasons, and I was her last shot. If she wasn't able to successfully match with me— his voice trailed off, so I finished the thought for him. Then she'd have to spend the rest of her life alone. Rafe swallowed. Right. And women who aren't able to successfully match are essentially considered defective. The government believes there must be something wrong with someone who is found to be undesirable by three different spouse matches. And do you find her undesirable? The words tumbled out of my mouth before I could stop them. My cheeks flushed with embarrassment, but the question was already posed. He cut his eyes over to me, but he didn't answer directly. There's nothing wrong with her. She just doesn't appreciate some bureaucracy trying to tell her who to spend the rest of her life with, and I can't blame her. I couldn't blame her either, though I wouldn't have been too upset if I were matched with someone like Rafe. So you told her about the Embers? He nodded. Not at first, of course. But the more we talked, the more I realized she would be a great fit for the cause. She's tenacious and determined, and she hates the government more than just about anyone I've ever met in the city. Once I knew she could be trusted, it was a no-brainer. That makes sense. She looked happy back at the camp, I said. But there was something still nagging at the back of my mind. So, Dax was wrong then. You never actually married her? Rafe's hesitation told me everything I needed to know. We never wanted to be married, Claren, and we don't consider ourselves married now. We never did. But technically, according to the courts of Classen City, yes, we were. I dropped his hand like a hot pan. But it wasn't my hand that he injured. 
My heart felt like it had been slammed with a hammer over and over again. I couldn't catch a break. I had to remind myself that it didn't matter. Rafe was never mine to begin with. Claire, he started. I'm fine. It's just a surprise, that's all. I figured you might have mentioned something like that. I wanted to. I thought about it back at your dad and Carmen's place, but I didn't want to add anything else to your plate that day. And it's not like it was ever real to begin with. We were running out of time. If we didn't make the marriage legal, they would have taken her away. I thought, that might not have been such a bad thing, but instantly hated myself for it. She was trying to live her life just like I was trying to live mine. Really, Rafe, it's okay. You did the right thing. It doesn't feel like it when I'm standing here with you. He reached for my hand again. I didn't mean to hurt you, Claren. I met his gaze and almost fell headfirst into those dark eyes of his. There was so much sincerity behind them. I knew he was honest now, even if he hadn't been completely forthcoming before. Not trusting myself to keep my distance, I quickly looked away. I couldn't let my mind go there again, back to thoughts of a lifetime with Rafe. It wasn't fair to him. I'd made my decision. What's done is done, I said at last, and I'm glad I know the truth, even if it did come a little late. I shot him a look from the side of my eyes. Understood. He bobbed his head. The off-road vehicle Rafe drove through the woods earlier sat waiting for us on a path just ahead. After catching a glimpse of the strange men riding around, I was grateful that he was here and ready to give me a ride back to the city. I was even more grateful that the vehicle was too loud for conversation. I needed a chance to clear my mind. I hopped into the passenger seat, and he shifted the vehicle into gear. Thoughts rattled through my brain as we bumped over the rough trail that led us out of the woods, and I wasn't any more certain of myself or what lay ahead when we arrived at the gas station than I was when we left. Rafe pulled his vehicle around to the back of the abandoned business, near the door closest to the entrance that led to the secret tunnels. Those tunnels were the only way we could get back into the city without being caught by protectors. Are you sure you know how to navigate your way back inside? he asked as I stepped out of the vehicle. I do. I nodded proudly at my one small accomplishment of the day. James, my point of contact in the center, told me I needed to memorize the tunnels, so I did. I pulled a piece of paper from my back pocket. But I still have a map he drew me, just in case. Rafe grinned and began walking toward the door. He hesitated outside, with his hand on the handle, preventing me from going inside until he pulled it open. So, I guess this is goodbye, then? My breathing quickened. I supposed it was. Shoot. Now that I was here with him, I wasn't prepared to say goodbye at all. He released the handle and took my hand instead. It doesn't have to be, you know. I would go with you if you asked me to. I would go anywhere with you. Just say the word. I averted my eyes. He was drawing me in again. His care and longing swirled inside with my own so much that I didn't know what was real. But I did know that I didn't want to be the one to pull him away from the embers. Not now, not ever. I can't take you away from them, Rafe, and I need to find a way to make this gig in the district work for us. Whatever it is, I've got to go and do my part, too. He brushed a stray piece of hair behind my ear, leaving my skin tingling where his fingers grazed against it. Can I at least walk with you back through the tunnels? I promise I'll leave as soon as I know you're safe. I couldn't say no, not when he looked at me that way. Okay, I said softly, but no farther. I felt his spirit sink, but I had to stay strong, and I was certain the embers would be needing Rafe here, too those motorcycle men didn't look like they were messing around. He leaned in close enough that I could feel the warmth of his breath, my eyes reflexively closed, waiting for the touch of his lips against mine, but they never came. He pulled the door open instead. No farther. He repeated my words as he gestured for me to go in, just as I promised. Chapter 3 
Neither of us spoke of the mysterious men we saw as we made our way through the tunnels. We didn't speak of Marissa, either. I think we both really wanted our last couple of hours together to be positive. We laughed and played word games. We shared personal memories from our lives before everything got so wild with the embers. We opened our hearts to one another, while somehow never once mentioning the elephant in the room. It was clear that we cared for each other. It didn't need to be said. I slowed my pace as we neared the metal steps that led up to James's house in the center. I wasn't ready to say goodbye. I guess this is it. I stopped and gestured to the end of our line. Rafe stepped up first, working to push open the hidden entrance that sat in the floor of James's hall closet. I'll just make sure you get inside, okay? He said. He obviously wasn't ready to say goodbye yet, either. His feet disappeared through the ceiling above me, followed by his hand reaching down to help me up. I took it, not because I needed his help, but simply because I wanted to touch him again. He pulled me up into a small hall closet. Surrounded by coats and boxes, there wasn't much room for us. Our bodies were inches apart, and the darkness of the space stamped out any signs of hesitation either of us may have felt. One of Rafe's hands still rested on my hip, where he'd steadied me after I climbed up. The other wrapped itself around my back. The closet was silent, minus the sounds of us breathing, our breath mingling together in a surprisingly intimate way. We didn't need to speak, because the emotion was palpable between us. Again, I found myself leaning into him, unable to pull away. I casually wrapped my arms behind his neck and lifted to my tiptoes, slowly inching closer and closer. But right before our lips met, the door swung open and light poured in, exposing us from behind the barrel of a gun held by a very frightened and angry James. Oh, shoot! James exclaimed with a laugh, though shoot was probably not his best word choice, given the shiny weapon still gripped in his hand. You two nearly scared me to death. He waved us into his home, and if he noticed our proximity to one another, he didn't mention it. I wasn't expecting anyone, so when I heard the floor slide open in there, I thought I might have been outed or something. He was still chuckling and breathing heavily as he led us into his small living room. What brings you back so soon, Claren? Did something happen out there? Is everything okay? Yeah, everything is fine. I avoided making eye contact with Rafe, partially because I was still embarrassed over almost getting caught kissing in the closet, and partially because I was upset that the kiss didn't happen. I was also a little angry at myself for wanting the kiss in the first place. I was such a mess. But I talked to my dad after I got out there, and I think you were right, I continued. I should have listened to you from the very beginning and saved myself a trip. It looks like I'll be much more useful working from the inside than I would be working out there with the embers. James nodded, but there was no, I told you so, or anything to make me feel bad. Only positive support. I always appreciated that about James. He had a heart of gold. This is Rafe, by the way. I turned and placed my hand on Rafe's shoulder, guilty that I hadn't thought to introduce him before that moment. James extended a hand toward Rafe. Good to see you again. Rafe smiled and agreed as he shook the older man's hand. You two know each other? I asked. Rafe worked in the edges of Morton before going fully outside. I wasn't sure when he would have had the opportunity to get to know James, a man who had spent all his years working in the center, living a double life between the embers and the leaders. We've met, James said. After Frank's trial, Rafe added. Of course. They must have used James's help to get Frank out of the center after I turned him in. That seemed like a whole other life ago now. Right. Sorry. No need to apologize, my dear, and thank you for escorting her back. James turned to Rafe. Can I feed you some supper before you head back out? Rafe eyed me, and I gave him a subtle nod. I wanted nothing more than a few extra minutes with him, and he probably needed some sustenance before his long walk back anyway. That would be wonderful, thank you. 
Rafe said to our host. Mind if I wash up first? Go right ahead. James directed Rafe to the washroom, and I seized the opportunity to speak to him privately. I appreciate you looking out for us, James. Of course, that's what I'm here for. I returned the old man's smile. You've done so much already, I hate to ask you for one more favor. Go ahead, I'll help any way that I can. I nodded and glanced down the hall to make sure we were still alone. Emmeline offered me a position in the district. James raised his eyebrows, impressed. And I've decided to take it, but I'd like to keep it quiet. Would you be able to help me get into contact with her, without Felix finding out? His brows pulled together. I can, yes, but why don't you want Felix to know? Felix had practically begged me to stay with him in the center. He was willing to change his entire inner circle for me. But I knew I was a distraction for him, and deep down, I was afraid he might be a distraction from me as well. I didn't really want to go to the district, and if he asked me to stay behind again, I wasn't sure I could say no. I'm not sure what the position entails just yet. I'd like to get settled in before I notify him. I'm afraid he'll worry otherwise. It was a weak excuse, and I wasn't sure if James was totally buying it, but he agreed to help me nonetheless. I see. Well, that should be just fine. You can stay here tonight, and I'll find a way to get you in to see Miss Fraser in the morning. I whispered a thank you as I heard Rafe rejoining us from the hallway. Dinner was simple but delicious. Though James lived in the center, he was still just a worker, and therefore not entitled to the personal chefs and other luxuries experienced by the leaders. Rafe and I helped chop vegetables and clean up after we ate, and I soaked up every moment. I was happy to remember him like this, and grateful he insisted on following me out of the Ember Camp. I would have hated for our last encounter to be the terse discussion we had after I saw him with Marissa. He may have been stubborn and refused to take no for an answer, but it was all part of his charm. In another time or another place, I could have easily fallen in love with Rafe, bullheadedness and all. But this was New America, and we didn't get to choose who we loved. As the evening came to a close, I found myself lingering awkwardly, unwilling to get to the part where we said goodbye. And James, sweet man that he was, didn't seem to get the hint that we would have preferred a moment alone. I knew I couldn't keep Rafe in the center any longer. His day wouldn't be over until he made it back to camp, and every second I delayed the inevitable would only make his trip that much more difficult. So at long last, I walked him over to the hall closet with James, biting the inside of my lip to keep from crying as I wished him farewell. Be safe, Rafe, and thank you again, for everything. He wrapped me in a hug, and I fought even harder not to cry on his shoulder. After placing a quick kiss on my cheek, he pulled back. His eyes said everything he couldn't utter out loud, and I longed to hear the words. Maybe someday, after I destroyed the new American government from my new position, I would get to. Goodbye. It seemed so insufficient for an ending for us. Goodbye, Claren. For now. He flashed a half-crooked smile, shook James's hand, and then he was gone, dropping down into the darkness of the tunnels below. I turned immediately and retreated to the bedroom James made up for me. I had to get away before I broke down in front of him. Inside the door, in the quiet solitude, I leaned against the wall, resting the tips of my fingers on the spot Rafe kissed on my cheek. Claren? James knocked softly on the outside of my door. Sorry to up and run, I said, trying to keep my voice steady. But it's been a long day. I think I'm going to go ahead and retire. No problem. Get your rest, sweetheart. I slumped down to the ground, alone at last, and allowed the tears to stream silently down my cheeks. I sat for some time, reliving the last several hours with Rafe, and remembering what good times I could still recall from my life in Classen City. 
I didn't know if I'd ever see this place again. A shuffling sound came from the hall, and I suspected James was restoring the closet to hide his tunnel entrance again. But there was a lot of shuffling. I inched closer to the door, straining to listen to what I could barely make out as hushed whispers. Multiple whispers. My body lit up, alert as I tuned into the exchange on the other side of the door. Who would James be talking to now? Unable to make out any words, I carefully turned the knob just enough to crack my door. With my body crouched down low, I peeked out. The hall closet door stood open as well, perfectly blocking my view of whoever stood on the other side. James had a serious look on his face. He nodded and turned across the hall toward his own room. I waited, my breath halted in my throat, hoping to catch a glimpse of our new visitor. Rafe had only been gone fifteen minutes or so. Had this new person seen him in the tunnels? Was Rafe okay? Concern racked my nerves, but the stranger never showed himself. Eventually, James re-emerged with a backpack. This should be enough, James said quietly as he handed the bag to the stranger. Thank you, the stranger whispered back. I guessed it was likely a man, but I couldn't hear well enough to be sure. James didn't look alarmed, but I couldn't shake the feeling that this had something to do with Rafe. I could practically hear his melody in my mind from where I sat. You'll have to be careful, James said. We're all counting on you not to let anything happen. Don't worry, the stranger whispered back. I won't be able to live with myself if I fail. James dipped his chin and closed the door as the stranger made his exit. I never saw his face. Silently pulling the door closed beside me, I turned back to my spot and stared thoughtfully at the floor. Who was the stranger, and what was his connection to Rafe, and what was in the bag? Chapter 4 James didn't say anything about the mysterious exchange the next morning at breakfast, to my dismay. I didn't ask about it either. It was obviously not something I was supposed to see, or else he would have alerted me to the visitor when he first arrived. I learned through previous exchanges with Frank and the other Embers that some things were better left unknown. I guess I hoped that I was a big enough part of them to be let in on some of the little secrets they shared now, but evidently not. My only solace was that Rafe was safe. James surely would have said something if he wasn't. And it was further confirmation that I was making the right decision in leaving class and city. They didn't need me here. After a simple breakfast of lightly buttered toast, I gathered my things and met James near the front door. I'll walk you back to the municipal building, he said, but we'll split up before we go inside. I need to get to work near the front entrance, but Emmeline normally arrives around the same time I do. You should be able to meet her in the parking lot around the back. Felix likely won't be there yet, but when he does arrive, it will be through the front. He won't see you. He locked up his small home, and we began our short walk to the building that housed most of the leadership's offices. Thank you again, James. I really do appreciate everything you do. It's my pleasure. Just remember, whatever happens in your new position, you can always call me. Help is never too far away. There was a flicker of worry behind his smile, and I wondered what on earth he thought I may need his help with in the district leadership. Why do I always feel like you know more than you're letting on? I asked. My tongue was playful, but my question was serious. James chuckled. Because I usually do. But in this case, I'm not sure what you should expect. I haven't heard any mention of your new position around the building. You don't think it's a trap, do you? I don't know why the thought suddenly crashed into my mind, but I wouldn't put it past them, especially not Justice Hines. James paused as though he were trying to piece together his words before responding. No, I've run through several possibilities, but I don't see how promoting you could be a trap. If anything, they may be trying to get you out of their way here, but I haven't been alerted to anything concerning. 
Still, it doesn't hurt to be prepared. I nodded solemnly as we walked ahead. Don't worry about it, though. We won't let anything happen to you. James's smile reached all the way to his eyes this time. Am I doing the right thing? You're doing the best you can with what you know. It's as close to the right thing as you can get, I suppose. That wasn't the answer I wanted to hear, but we were nearing the municipal building, and it was time to say goodbye. Be safe, James. Always, Miss Greenwood. You do the same. He nodded his goodbye. Any other visible interaction could have been harmful if seen by the wrong people. We didn't want to blow our covers, but it felt abrupt. I lingered for a moment alone on the sidewalk, with nothing but my backpack and a dash of anxiety swirling inside. My time in class in city felt unfinished, and this was such an unceremonious goodbye. But then again, who else did I have to say goodbye to? With a deep breath, I took off around the backside of the building. Emmeline's little black coupe pulled into the parking lot right on cue. Miss Greenwood, she said as she opened the car door. What brings you back here so early today? She had that same probing gleam in her eyes that I'd become so familiar with, like she was searching my mind for answers I wouldn't reveal out loud. This was atypical behavior for me, meeting her in the back lot unannounced, and she almost certainly knew something was going on. I stayed strong and didn't break eye contact. I didn't have anything to hide this time around. Good morning, Miss Fraser. I'm glad I caught you here. I was hoping to speak with you as soon as possible. Do you have just a moment? I do. Let's go inside where it's a bit warmer and speak in my office. I cut my eyes over to the building. I didn't want to go inside. I didn't want to risk running into Felix. But I didn't have a choice. Emmeline would definitely suspect something was going on if I insisted we talk in her car. So I reluctantly followed her inside. Emmeline's office was on the fifth floor with corner windows overlooking the entire center and even a little beyond the walls that kept our leadership safe. It was a crisp, clear morning, and I had a difficult time pulling my eyes away from the view. It's nice, isn't it? Emmeline asked. It is, I agreed. Class and City is beautiful, but it pales in comparison to Lewisburg. They've got such interesting architecture there. It is truly a sight to be seen. Her crystal blue eyes sparkled as though she'd caught me being ornery. Of course she knew why I was here. I couldn't get anything past that woman. So, you know why I'm here, I suppose? I have a guess. A hope, really, because I think you'd be quite happy with your decision if I'm right. I sat in a chair in front of her desk. You're right. I've come to talk about the position you mentioned at Felix's party the other night. I'm glad, though I'm also a bit surprised. Senator Walsh led me to believe you were taking some time off. He said yesterday he wasn't sure when or if we may be seeing you here again. I had a change of heart. I didn't want to hash it out with Emmeline. It was none of her business, and I really wished she'd just leave Felix out of this. She studied me silently with those cold eyes of hers. I was cringing under her scrutiny. I wanted nothing more than to look away. But she needed to see that I was serious and that I wasn't intimidated by her anymore. Does Felix know? No. And I'd rather you didn't tell him. I don't think he'd be very happy with me leaving. Emmeline nodded in agreement. She knew how he'd push to have me in his inner circle. Hopefully that was all she knew about our relationship, however. I didn't want this to get any more complicated than necessary. Very well. How quickly would you like to leave? I believe there is a plane carrying medical supplies to Lewisburg today. If we act quickly, we may be able to secure you a seat. I was hoping to maybe learn a bit more about the position before I go. You know, just to make sure it's... There won't be another plane for a week. You can stay with Felix until then if you'd like. Otherwise, I suggest we get moving. We can talk on the way. She glanced at a clock on the wall behind me. He'll be arriving soon. Would you like to stay? 
No, I said, standing. Let's go. We hurried down the stairs instead of taking the elevators. I didn't know why Emmeline was being so helpful in keeping me hidden from Felix, but I was grateful for it. Unless, of course, James was right, and getting me out of class and city without any objections from the new senator was in her best interests. Emmeline was never the type to do things from the kindness of her own heart. Did snakes even have hearts? My breath quickened as I realized the implications of getting on that plane. Leaving with Emmeline would be sealing my fate as a district leader. There would be no turning back. Was that what I really wanted? A ding from the elevator launched me toward the back door. Getting caught by Felix wouldn't give me a choice in the matter either, because he would refuse to let me go. No, I'd made a decision to go. I was going to stick with it. James assured me I would be safe, and there were plenty of other good people here to look after Class and City and the Embers in my absence. It wasn't like I was able to do anything for them anyway. I was more useful higher up in the leadership. I trotted along behind Emmeline, following her to the back door that led out to the parking lot. She pushed it open quickly, and we almost crashed right into the tall man pulling it open from the outside. His hand was still on the handle, and the black sleeve of his jacket drew my eyes upward to his muscular neck and the thin blue band that seemed to be tattooed into his skin. I gasped and quickly scanned his features, eager to see the face of the man who I believed was scouting out the Ember Camp one day before. His snow-white hair was slicked back away from his face, revealing dark eyes over a crooked nose and a smile too big for his face. Light wrinkles etched his forehead and eyes, and everything about him seemed staged. His smile was as forced as the chuckle he pushed through his straight white teeth. Excuse me, ladies. He held the door open for us, and I felt that same sinking dread I'd felt when I saw him on his motorcycle. His smile wasn't fooling me. He watched us exit and said, Have a nice day, as the door closed behind him. Who was that? I asked Emmeline. I tried to sound nonchalant, but she almost certainly heard the tremble in my voice. That's Conrad Reynolds, she answered. I quickly attempted to block my affect. I didn't want her to feel my fear, but something about that man stirred up some really strong emotions within me. She didn't mention anything about my behavior and continued speaking as though her next words were no big deal. He was sent here by the Supreme Leadership. That seemed like a pretty big deal to me. Chapter 5 The Supreme Leadership? It came out louder than I'd intended. I took a deep breath and tried to calm down a notch or ten before continuing. I wanted to ask why the Supreme Leadership was concerning themselves with class and city, but I had a feeling I already knew the answer. The only reason they would send one of their own here would be to finish the job we started. The job I purposely didn't allow Justice Hines and Dimitri to see through to the end. They wanted to destroy the Embers. Did they know about Frank's plan? Were they concerned the Embers were going to harm the citizens of Klassen City? Or did they just not like the idea of change? And how did talk of our outsiders get all the way up to the supreme leadership? Surely they had more important matters to concern themselves with. Emmeline stopped outside her car door and gave me a long, hard look. Swallowing the lump in my throat, I straightened my shoulders and collected myself. It seems odd that the supreme leadership would send someone all the way to class and city. Do you know why he's here? He's just a consultant. Emmeline unlocked her car with a couple of beeps, and I climbed into the passenger seat. A consultant for what? Emmeline kept her gaze fixed on the road ahead as we made our way out of the parking lot and toward the edge of the center's walls. I'm not exactly sure. He's been working closely with Justice Hines. I suspect they may be working with her on her, uh, style of leadership. She hasn't been winning over the hearts of our people lately with her coverage on the evening programming. Good. Maybe this wasn't as bad as I'd originally thought. 
the tension physically left my body, and my heart began to beat somewhat normally again. But it still didn't make total sense. So that's all? They sent someone from the Supreme Leadership all the way down here just to train Justice Hines on her people skills? Emmeline pursed her lips. It's just a guess. The Supreme Leadership operates on a higher level of confidentiality. You only get to know what they want you to know, and this consultant has decided that his work here is not pertinent for anyone but Justice Hines. Okay, so maybe it was still bad. The more I thought about it, the more Emmeline's guess didn't make any sense at all. But you're sure that he's from the Supreme Leadership? I was probably pushing this further than I should have, but it still wasn't clicking. Something was off. Of course I'm sure. Didn't you see his mark? The band around his neck? Yes. Once you join the ranks of the Supreme Leadership, you are permanently marked. They have access to everything you do and say for the rest of your life. It's a little like Triple T, but less in the mind, more just physical surveillance. They embed the technology in one's skin, recording every word spoken through fluctuations and vibrations in the tissue of one's throat. They also monitor basic health baselines. But aside from all of that, it is assigned to others, almost like a symbol of protection. If you harm a member of the Supreme Leadership, they will know. That band is your signal to stay out of their way. Why don't they teach us about the mark in school? I asked. It seemed like it would be useful to be able to recognize a member of the Supreme Leadership. Because they'd have to explain the technology behind it. We can't do that for obvious reasons. But the chances of a typical citizen running into a member of the Supreme Leadership is basically zero anyway. Emmeline was beginning to sound frustrated by my line of questioning. I knew I should have dropped it then, but there was one more thing I had to understand. So, if they can monitor anything and everything this consultant does, Justice Hines has basically been given a direct line to the Capitol. Does that concern you at all? Emmeline stopped the car abruptly, hitting the brakes just before we reached the guarded checkpoint at the edge of the center. Her eyes narrowed, and the look on her face chilled my core. Why would that concern me, Miss Greenwood? I just meant that the way she seemed to disagree with you so much on Triple T, oh, and also with how she accused me of working with the outsiders, but I couldn't say any of that to Emmeline. I let my guard down again. Emmeline was like a magician with the way she projected such comfort and it was never obvious until she dropped it. Like now. I was a fool for speaking so freely around her again. Never mind, I said quietly. I just hope they'll take multiple points of view into account before making any major decisions. And by major decisions, I meant destroying the embers. But obviously, I wasn't going there with Emmeline either. We drove quietly through the city, and I couldn't stop speculating on the real purpose of Conrad Reynolds' trip to Classen City. I was almost certain he was the man I saw on the motorcycle when I was leaving the Ember Camp with Rafe. And if he was there, then the supreme leadership was there in a sense as well. But why? The Embers weren't a threat to them at all. As we neared the outside border, I returned to my present reality. I was about to hop on an airplane, a piece of equipment I'd only just learned still existed after the war, and I was going to fly in the air to a city I'd never seen to start a job that I still had no information about. I looked over to Emmeline, who glanced back at me through the corners of her eyes. Are you ready to talk about the work you have in store? she asked. My eyes widened in response. She told me back when we first met that she couldn't read my mind, but I had a hard time believing that was true sometimes, especially now that I knew what the Supreme Leadership did. She was just too good at this empath thing sometimes. Yes, I should probably have some idea of what to expect before I arrive. 
The work will be similar to what you were doing here with Felix. There's a district leader there who has requested you join his version of an inner circle. I see. My shoulders deflated a touch. So I'll be working on a project to eliminate the outsiders that live near Lewisburg? Emmeline's flinch was almost imperceptible. Not exactly. You've been recruited more for your PR skills. What do you mean by that? I honestly didn't know if that was better or worse than another Triple T type project. I mean you're good on camera. This leader needs some help winning over the hearts of his citizens. Things are a little different in Lewisburg than they are in Class and City. You have a way with the people, and he's hoping you can help unite the people there. I see. So I was moving to a new city to be a decoration on another man's arm. When would I be taken seriously? This was getting ridiculous. But it was too late to go back now. I didn't say any more until we neared the small airstrip outside of our city limits. It was well hidden. Several fallen trees appeared to block a gravel road off the side of the main throughway, but Emmeline expertly weaved her small car between the logs. After a small stretch of gravel, the road curved around and opened back up into a well-maintained route to the small hangar that lay hidden by trees from the main road. We were far enough away from Class and City that the planes wouldn't be seen or heard by any of our residents, and far enough off of the farm roads that no one would know the airstrip was there if they weren't deliberately looking for it. It was a little unsettling how easy it was for them to hide something as big as an airport. How many other secrets did they have hidden from us all? Will you be coming with me on the plane? I asked. It's not that Emmeline and I were friends exactly, but the thought of traveling through the skies had me feeling a little uneasy. What was to prevent the whole thing from crashing down? Afraid not. She pulled to stop outside of the large metal building. I have work to do here, but don't worry. It may be a little bumpy at first, but then you'll feel just like you're riding in a car. Here, take this. She shuffled through her leather bag and pulled out a piece of gum. Chew it. It'll help your ears. Thank you. I said, accepting the gum, but I had no intention of chewing it. My ears were just fine. I'll alert the leaders in Lewisburg of your arrival. You should have someone waiting to drive you into the city. She shifted in her seat as though there was more she wanted to say. Do take care of yourself, Claren. I'm sure I will see you again soon. Emmeline extended her hand, and I took it, saying goodbye before I stepped out of the car and made my way over to the building. Two men stood, talking inside the open doorway. "'Are you Claire and Greenwood?' one of them asked as I approached them. "'I am.' It was nice to not be known for once. I smiled at the middle-aged man as he shook my hand. "'Nice to meet you. I'm Charles, your pilot, and this is Dusty. He'll take your bags. Do you have any bags?' I pulled the straps of my backpack tighter. Just the one, and I think I'll keep it with me, if that's okay. There wasn't anything of monetary value in there, just some clothes and a few personal items, but it held my letter from Cato as well, and I couldn't risk that letter falling into the wrong hands. I probably should have burned it long ago, but it was the last piece of my brother I had. I wasn't quite ready to fully say goodbye. That's fine with me. Come on, I'll show you to your seat. We'll take off here in just a few minutes. I followed the men through the hangar and barely kept my eyes from popping out of my head when we exited the other side. The plane sat out in the open air, shiny white and larger in person than I ever would have guessed from the pictures I'd seen. Charles laughed at my gaping mouth. First time, huh? I nodded still unable to pull my eyes away from the incredible feat of engineering that sat before me. Well, Dusty and I have done this hundreds of times. You're in good hands. He winked and led me over to a steep set of stairs that took us up into a narrow cabin. Soft, pale gray chairs sat on either side of a dark blue carpeted aisle. Take any seat you want, Charles said. There won't be any other passengers today, just you. 
I decided to grab a lone chair near the front rather than one situated in front of a table in the middle of the cabin. Buckle up until we get up in the air, then you're free to move around if you'd like. There's a small refrigerator at the back with some beverages and snacks. Help yourself. Do you want me to grab you a pillow or a blanket or anything before we get going? No, thank you. I should be fine. How long is the flight? I'd just eaten breakfast, and I didn't think the flight to Lewisburg would take long, based on Felix's trips. I couldn't imagine why I'd need to sleep or eat while we were flying. Plus, there was a small window near my seat, and I was pretty sure I'd be too distracted by the view to want to do anything else. It'll be about two hours. We'll have you there before lunch. Charles looked over his shoulder toward the cockpit at the front of the plane. Well, I've got to get up there. Holler if you need anything. The engines roared loudly just a few minutes later, and I sat white-knuckled with my hands gripping the armrests as I watched the hangar move slowly out of view through the window. We seemed so high up in the air already, but I knew the plane's wheels were still rolling slowly across the concrete below. The plane turned ninety degrees to the right and picked up speed, sending grass and trees zipping faster and faster outside my window. My heart was thumping almost as loud as the engines that vibrated beneath me as the plane lifted up, pushing my head back against the plush leather seat as the ground moved away below. Pressure began to build in my ears, and I pulled the gum Emmeline gave me out of my pocket. Maybe she was being kind after all. Its minty, fresh flavor washed over my tongue as the hangar came back into view below, smaller now, like a dollhouse, as the plane soared higher and higher. Before long, wisps of white began to block my view of the ground, and I realized we really were in the clouds. Down there, somewhere below, was everything I'd ever known. Classen City, Rafe and the Embers, Felix and the Leadership. I hoped I was doing the right thing. My mind wandered as we flew through the air, and it didn't seem like long after the plane reached its full altitude that it started to descend. More trees and grass came back into view, but it looked remarkably similar to the area we'd just left behind. I wished I could see the cities from the sky. That would have really been something. But I'd see Lewisburg soon enough, assuming Emmeline was able to get a hold of the leaders there. The plane shook with a bump, and I gripped the armrests once again. Buckle up, Charles's voice came through a speaker above me. We might have a bumpy landing with all this wind, but we'll touch down again in just a few minutes. Bumpy was an understatement. I don't know how I was still breathing once the plane finally touched down. I thought it was going to die. I thought it was surely going to crash us down to the rocky earth below. But we made it, and the scenery around us was full of sunshine, chasing my worries away once I knew we were safe on the ground again. I wasted no time unbuckling and hopping out of my seat. The plane was interesting, but I'd had enough. I was ready to get off. Finally, Charles came back and opened the door for me as another man rolled up and locked a set of stairs into place below. I stepped out, shielding my eyes from the sunlight. I was so focused on getting safely out of the plane and not tripping down the stairs that I didn't see who was waiting for me until I reached the bottom. Everett Walsh. Felix's dad stood with open arms and an oversized grin on his handsome face. Claren, I'm so glad you decided to take my offer. Chapter 6 Mr. Walsh, hello again. I tried to mask the surprise and irritation in my voice. I told Emmeline I didn't want Felix to know I'd gone to work with the district leadership. It would have been nice for her to give me a heads up that I was actually going to work for his father. It was only a matter of time before he found out now. And given the rocky relationship Felix had with his dad, he wasn't going to like this one bit. Everett took my hand and placed a kiss on the back of my knuckles once I reached the ground. It was a warmer greeting than I'd expected from him, but it was brief. He didn't waste any time launching directly into his welcome speech. Welcome to Lewisburg, he said with a wave. The people will be thrilled to have you here. 
I think we're going to make an excellent team. He gave me a wink and extended the crook of his elbow to escort me back to the hangar, but I didn't take it. I might have been hired to make him look good, but there were no cameras around at the moment. I wanted to set a standard of professionalism, and that didn't involve being friendly with him unless I had to be. I didn't know the man at all, but Felix didn't trust him, and that was enough for me to keep my distance. I've cleared my schedule for the day. I thought maybe I could show you around town. Also, I hear you have a birthday coming up, so perhaps we can discuss plans for a party when we get back to the house later. I'm looking forward to seeing Lewisburg, thank you, but I really don't need a party. I readjusted my backpack on my shoulders. Also, when you say the house, are you referring to mine or yours? Everett chuckled. Both, I suppose. That's what I was afraid of. I figured you could stay with me for the time being, since we'll be working so closely together. You'll be matched in a year, so there's no need to set up house now when you'll be moving before long anyway. Besides, I've got plenty of space. It made sense, but I didn't relish the thought of living with Felix's dad for an entire year. Maybe I'd be able to petition for a place of my own once the training was over. He winked again, and I found myself hoping my room would be set up on the opposite side of the house from his, at the very least. And as for the party, he continued, I thought it would be a great way for you to meet the other district leaders. They're all very excited to get to know you better. Again, he was right. It would be good for me to learn who was really in charge here at the district level, even if I wasn't much in the mood for a party. I suppose that would be fine. A small, simple get-together to meet the other leaders will be nice. Excellent. I'll have my attendants get to work on it as soon as we get back. I followed him out of the building where a black sedan was waiting. His driver was a younger man, probably in his twenties, and he looked bored until he caught sight of us approaching. He stiffened as we entered the vehicle, and it only took half a second for the driver's antipathy toward Mr. Walsh to fill the small space. Everett didn't seem to notice, but I'd have my work cut out for me if the rest of the city felt the same way about the man. Our car lurched forward over bumpy roads leading away from the airstrip. The trees surrounding Lewisburg were more dense than those I'd grown used to back home, but otherwise their outside looked very similar to the area surrounding Classen City. The roads became better maintained, and I noticed more abandoned structures as we neared the city limits. Everything felt almost familiar, just a different flavor of home, until we reached the boundary. Lewisburg was surrounded by an eight-foot-tall chain-link fence. Protectors stood guard at the entrance, looking just as bored as our driver had been. I wondered how many entrances into the city there were exactly. I knew Lewisburg was a little larger than Classen City, so maybe they had a more difficult time monitoring the roads, and that's why the fences were necessary. Or maybe they had a bigger issue with unruly outsiders. I shuddered, thinking about Milo and his exiled men. Hopefully Lewisburg didn't know the same kind of evils here, and hopefully the good outsiders still had a way to get what they needed from the city, despite the fences. I'd have to find a way out to explore soon and see if there were any connections to the embers nearby. Our driver flashed the guards an official document, and they peeked in the back windows before nodding and waving us through. I smiled at the man who looked in my window, but it went unreciprocated. I only half listened to Everett rattle off facts about the city as we drove through the streets. Most of what he had to say was boring, official information I could look up from a book on my own. I was far more interested in how the city felt. At first glance, it looked like any other new American city. I'd seen images of it flash across my evening television screen many times before, but video can't capture the true feelings of a place. Lewisburg had a peculiar energy that left me uncertain and a little on edge. As we neared the business district, more and more citizens were outdoors, ambling along the sidewalks. 
Some were dressed for work, presumably carrying out tasks for their jobs as they should be. But a surprising number of the people weren't doing much of anything at all. One man was actually just sitting on the sidewalk, arms propped on his knees, watching the other people stroll by. Observing this behavior from working adults was shocking. Never would we dream of sitting around during a workday in class and city. They all had one thing in common, though. As our car cruised past them on the road, they would turn and watch it with narrowed eyes, bitter, suspecting. I didn't know how I was supposed to change the attitudes of these people toward Everett when they clearly had some very strong opinions of their own. Tell me about the citizens here, I said. Are the people happy? The corners of Everett's mouth turned down as he glanced my way. I'd caught him off guard, mid-sentence about the architecture of some of the old buildings we were passing. What do you mean? he asked. His innocence was disingenuous, I could sense it. He knew exactly why I wanted to know more about the people. He simply didn't want to talk about it, not yet. I sighed. Forgive me for being blunt, but Miss Fraser informed me that my role here was to help with appearances, and it appears to me that the people aren't pleased. What is it that they are unhappy about? Everett's jaw clenched briefly before he quickly replaced any evidence of irritation with a faux smile. I forgot how perceptive your kind are. My kind? Was he referring to empaths? I probably shouldn't have taken as much offense to the statement as I did. It didn't sit right with me. He straightened in his seat, and the look on his face told me I should prepare for a political speech. Felix got the same serious expression when talking business. Unfortunately, the people of Lewisburg have a bit of a rebellious streak. It's one of the reasons the leadership here brought me in. I take great pride in the way I managed class and city. Our people there are obedient. We believe in structure and systems. We devote our lives to the greater good. They don't have the same respect for authority here. A flutter of excitement wriggled through me, but I tampered it back down. I didn't want to get ahead of myself, but rebellion had a way of getting me hyped up lately. Everett didn't notice, thankfully. The district brought me in to help after they witnessed my results back home, but there is a long history of weak leadership here. I raised my brows, and Everett responded with a soft chuckle. Between you and me, of course, he added. I would never want to disparage my fellow leaders. So what is your plan, exactly? Well, now that I have been placed in charge of the entire Greater Midwest District, it's my responsibility to get all six cities running as smoothly as Classen. I need to run a tight ship and let the people know I'm not playing around, which is why I've put a temporary hold on many of the people's wages. You did what? I couldn't even pretend to hide my shock. It was no wonder the people were angry. The standard wage was barely enough to get people by as it was. Withholding any part of it would leave people hungry, not to mention it wasn't fair. The law was pretty simple. Go to work, receive your standard wage. They stopped working, he said with a small shrug of his shoulders. I shook my head. There's no way an entire city would just stop working. It was a death wish. Surely that's not true. It is, for many of them. Some are still working and getting paid as usual, but many of the people here were beginning to take our generous wages for granted. They stopped going to work, or if they went, they didn't put in any effort. So I threatened to stop paying them. They thought they'd try to call my bluff, but as I mentioned, I don't play games. If I want something, I'll stop at nothing to get it. And right now, I want our people to realize how much they need us. The last thing we need is another great war. I sat slack-jawed, staring at the scowling faces we passed by. It wasn't right to let an entire city go hungry. But why would they just stop working? They knew how the system was set up. What about the other cities in the district? I asked. They're not as solid as Classen. But then again, maybe I'm just biased toward our hometown. None are quite as far gone as our district capital of Lewisburg, though. 
He leaned toward the middle of the car and pointed ahead between the seats. Look, we're nearing the center now. I followed his gaze, and beyond the roof lines ahead, I could barely make out the edge of an enormous brick wall. It had to be twice as high as the one in Classen City, and barbed wire swirled around the upper edge. How had I never noticed that on television before? Are the walls that high all the way around the center? They are. As I mentioned, the people here are different than they are back home. I couldn't imagine I would be too happy in a place like this either. Then again, maybe that's why the embers were so adamant that I stick with the leadership and rise in the ranks. Maybe I was supposed to come here and help change things for these people. Though what I really wanted to do was help the people take the leadership down. Past another set of guards standing outside of a large tower at the edge of the center walls, we pulled into the neighborhood where Everett lived. I recognized his estate from a block away. It was enormous, with two-story tan brick walls, ornate moldings around tall leaded glass windows, and towering copper spires glowing with emerald patina atop the third-story dormers. The home was surrounded by a grassy lawn and gardens, one of the few estates in existence that hadn't been transformed to fit modern New American standards. It was a marvelous ode to a world long gone, like a page from a foreign history book. We'd been led to believe it housed many people, the same way we thought Felix's house was actually an apartment building. But I was wiser now. I knew that this was one gigantic mansion for one man, and maybe some of his staff, and me now, too, I supposed. Home, sweet home, Everett grinned. One of his attendants, an older man with salt and pepper hair that hung past his ears, hurried down the walkway to open the car door, but he never made eye contact with me. He stared resolutely ahead, as though he wasn't worthy of speaking to me. Or maybe he felt I wasn't worthy of speaking to him. Everett didn't seem to mind the lack of conversation as he ushered me toward the door himself. A small woman, not much older than me, waited inside the grand foyer. She wore a plain gray dress, and her mousy brown hair was pulled back into a tight bun low on the back of her head. She stared ahead, like the male attendant had, until Everett addressed her directly. Joy? Yes, sir. She turned her gaze toward him stiffly. Her stance was respectful, straight-backed, and attentive as she awaited his next words dutifully. But that poor girl wanted to be anywhere else. I could relate. This is Miss Claren Greenwood. She's going to be staying with us for a while, as we discussed this morning. Have you prepared a room for her? I have, sir. Please show her there. I have some calls to make this afternoon— but I would appreciate it if you would give Miss Greenwood a tour of her new home. I want to make her very comfortable here. Yes, sir. Everett's eyes trailed my body, his lips tight with disapproval. And please help with the new wardrobe for her. She hasn't brought much with her, so she'll need to go into town to do some shopping. Maybe tomorrow? I can call the shop workers in the Western Business District to let them know you're coming. I glanced down at my jeans, the denim dirty from my run through the woods the day before. They were the only pants I'd brought, the only pants I owned at this point. I would be happy to, sir. Joy nodded her head toward Everett respectfully, before turning toward me with disdain in her eyes. Forcing a polite smile, she said, Follow me, Miss Greenwood. I'll show you to your room. Chapter 7 my bedroom was spacious, yet it still felt cozy and thoughtfully decorated, and like the rest of the mansion, it transported me back to a time period long forgotten. The glossy wood floors reflected light from giant glass doors leading out to a balcony that overlooked the back lawn. An old fireplace sat across from the bed beside the entrance to an ensuite bathroom. This room is stunning, Joy. Thank you for preparing it for me. The girl pushed air through her nose before forcing a smile. Of course, Miss Greenwood, I'm happy it pleases you. Can you call me Claren? She paused for a moment, caught off guard by my relaxed tone, but she didn't respond to my comment. Here is your washroom. 
if you'd like to get cleaned up before lunch, and I'm happy to give you a tour of the house and the grounds as soon as you're ready. Funny, she didn't look too happy to be doing anything. Joy stood with her feet together, hands clasped loosely in front of her. She kept her gaze fixed to the wall across from her. I watched her intently, opening myself to her emotions and trying to understand her better. I could practically hear her thoughts running through my mind. Can I ask you something, Joy? Of course, she replied, straight-faced. Why don't you like me? Miss Greenwood, I... She stammered for a moment, eyes wide. It's okay. I'm not angry. I haven't done anything to earn your respect yet. I'm just wondering, what have you been told that has caused you to develop these preconceived notions about me? Her cheeks flushed, but she quickly regained her resolve. I smiled, trying to encourage her to speak freely. I truly wasn't upset with her. I just wanted to understand. It's not that I don't like you, she started. You just don't trust the leadership, I said matter-of-factly. She made eye contact with me for the first time since I arrived. She was afraid, but she put on a very brave face. We stared at one another for a moment. I wanted to give her a chance to speak, but she clearly didn't know whether she should condemn herself by agreeing with me or condemn herself by lying with a denial. It's okay. I tilted my head toward her like we were sharing a secret. I don't trust them either. Her eyes softened in the corners as she relaxed. She wasn't ready to be my friend yet, but hopefully I'd at least made a move in the right direction. If I couldn't even win over the staff in the house, there was no way I'd be successful in my new position with Everett. We didn't speak any more on the topics of the leadership or distrust. I stepped into the restroom to splash water on my face and attempted to clean up the clothes I was wearing. The stretched-out denim had a brownish hue that tap water wouldn't touch. Joy, I said, twisting the knob and re-entering my room. She waited patiently near the door. Yes, Miss Greenwood? I'm afraid I don't have anything else to change in, too. Will this be okay to wear to the shops? I could picture the shop workers' frowns now, grimacing as I shuffled through the crisp racks of clothing designed for the leadership. I think so. The young woman's eyes sparkled as she suppressed a smirk. If anything, I think your attire will work in your favor— but I'll have them washed for you tonight so they'll be fresh and clean tomorrow. Thank you, Joy. I appreciate your help. She looked startled, and I wondered if she'd ever been thanked before or if she'd ever felt appreciated at all. With a quick nod goodbye, she left me to a quiet afternoon alone, which was just fine by me. I'd had enough of Everett for one day. The next morning I found my freshly laundered clothing waiting on a rolling cart outside my bedroom door. Joy didn't wake me, and I'd inadvertently slept through breakfast. I showered and dressed and found her waiting at the bottom of the staircase, with the simple messenger bag slung over her shoulder and impatience written all over her face. "'Sorry to keep you waiting,' I said. She glanced at me briefly before returning her eyes to the wall before her. Waiting on you is my job, Miss Greenwood. No apologies necessary. I peeked around the corner before stepping into the foyer, checking to see if the dining room had already been cleared. I hoped to grab a piece of toast or something before venturing off into the city, but the room was empty, as I'd expected. Director Walsh has already gone into the office, Joy said coolly, misinterpreting my actions. But he left me the card for your clothing allowance, so we're able to go to the business district as soon as you're ready. I nodded, unsure of how to respond. I didn't intend for Everett to pay for my clothing, but I hadn't received my own wage card yet. The idea of being even more indebted to him didn't sit well with me, but it seemed I had no other choice. Okay, I said with a shrug. Then I guess we can go now. Good, I've already ordered the car around. Joy's pulse picked up by half a beat, and she quickly made her way to the door. Once outside, I realized why. The driver from the day before was parked by the curb, his eyes glued to my attendant. She responded with a shy smile, and the corners of his mouth turned up as well. 
He hurried over to open the door for us, never peeling his gaze away from Joy. She blushed and turned away from him as we climbed into the car. The emotion in the air was thick as we made our way out of the center and into town. Not much was said after Joy gave the driver, who I learned was named Asher, instructions on where to go. I didn't want to interrupt their moment, so I sat as a silent observer in the back seat, pretending not to notice the looks of longing reflected in the rearview mirror at every stop sign. Eventually we reached our destination, a large clothing boutique in the Western Business District. I stepped out of the car and immediately began taking in the sights around me. Again, the streets were alive with people bustling to and fro. This part of the city was a hub for commerce, so the citizens here all seemed to have a place to go with a goal in mind. There weren't any idle hands like I'd seen on my drive into the center with Everett the day before. As I turned to glance down the other side of the street, I saw Asher telling Joy goodbye, his hand lingering on the small of her back longer than any typical working relationship would deem appropriate. I suppressed a smile as I turned back toward the boutique in front of me. A very flustered Joy soon joined me. Wow, I said, watching her from the sides of my eyes. You really like him, huh? A look of panic registered on her face. Miss Greenwood, I would never— I raised my hand to stop her. It's okay, Joy. I flashed her a genuine smile. You two are cute together. Her cheeks flushed. Asher's looks are none of my business. We are co-workers and nothing more. Uh-huh. I laughed and felt her guard drop, not completely, but enough for her shoulders to relax. Keep telling yourself that. She exhaled and gestured toward the storefront. Are you ready to go in? I suppose we better. We pushed open the glass doors, and a well-dressed shop worker strode immediately over toward us, her Cheshire-like grin fading as she took in my appearance. My clothes were clean, but they certainly were not leader quality. Can I help you? the woman asked. Yes, ma'am, Joy replied professionally. This is Miss Claren Greenwood, the newly appointed public relations manager for Director Walsh. She's just come in from Class and City, and we need to fill out a wardrobe for her work here. Ah, yes. We received a call from Director Walsh's staff earlier. I apologize for my inquiry. The shop worker resumed a smile, more forced now than before, and averted her eyes from me. It seemed as though the mere mention of my role in the leadership here had given me a stink the citizens could hardly tolerate. She ushered us toward the back of the store to a semi-enclosed area with multiple mirrors and two purple velvet plush benches. Joy took a seat on one while the worker rolled out a rack of clothes from behind a curtained doorway. Retrieving a black bag with multiple pockets from behind the curtain, the worker asked me to step up on a raised area in front of the mirrors, where she wrapped a measuring tape around my waist and jotted numbers down into a small pad. I don't think I caught your name, I said, trying to ooze sunshine into my voice to break the cold trance the women seemed to be under. Literally standing on a pedestal under the lights as the women tended to my wardrobe wasn't helping me to feel any less awkward. It wasn't helping their attitudes toward me much either. The worker never paused as she responded. My name is Agnes. Well, Agnes, I smiled. How's it looking so far? Do you think you've got anything that will fit me? I'm certain we do, Agnes replied without an ounce of humor in her voice. Joy looked up from her spot on the bench, her brows slightly raised. Agnes wasn't amused by me, but something was shifting in Joy. I met her eyes, hoping she'd see me floundering up here and toss me a bone. She looked away again, squashing the little hope I had. Satisfied with my measurements, Agnes rolled the rack of clothing nearer and began shuffling through the hangers. She pulled a lavender pencil skirt from the rack and held it up to me with a flowy white blouse. What do you think about this? she asked, turning me toward the mirror. My wrinkled nose and furrowed brow stared back. It looked like something Emmeline would wear, not me. 
Joy's face reflected behind me, her brown eyes twinkling with amusement. Okay? Agnes's eyes rounded with a huff of her breath as she returned the garments and began shuffling for something new. We went on this way for several minutes, Agnes growing more annoyed with every rejected outfit until she finally dropped her arms to her sides in exasperation. Why don't we start fresh, Miss Greenwood? Her jaw was clenched, her patience all used up. She strained to keep her composure together as she asked me. Tell me what you're looking for. What exactly is your style? I shrugged. I didn't have a style. I'd never had much choice in what I wore, nor had I ever cared. I looked down at the jeans and wool sweater I had on and held my arms to the sides. Something like this, I guess? Joy snorted behind me, but it wasn't hostile. The situation was hilariously awkward. Catching her reflection again in the mirror, I grew a grin of my own. Agnes pursed her lips in response. May I help, Agnes? Joy stood from her spot on the bench. Please do! Agnes blotted at her forehead with a small cotton handkerchief and met Joy at the rack of clothes. She'll need some things to wear to work, Joy started as she began pulling items from the rack. We'll keep them comfortable, she added, looking in my direction. I breathed a sigh of relief. Maybe Joy was coming around after all. She'll also need some casual items for the weekends, and a couple of formal gowns for events, and a birthday dress. She pulled items as she spoke and handed them to Agnes, who carried them to a waiting dressing room beside the mirrors. Thank you, I whispered to Joy, as Agnes pushed me inside to try the garments on. She smiled with a nod, and this time the smile actually reached her eyes. Joy spoke casually with Agnes as I went in and out of the dressing room, modeling each outfit in front of the lights for them to assess the fit and style. Eventually, Agnes began to soften as well, and within a couple of hours, the three of us were laughing together over a particularly ill-fitting blouse that went promptly back on the rack. Okay, Joy said. I saved the best for last. I think this would make a beautiful birthday dress. I took the floor-length royal blue gown from her and held it before me. The skirt was several layers of flowing chiffon, and the bodice was silk, form-fitting with several sashes that crisped and crossed back and forth to create a very feminine set of curves for the wearer. The back was open, aside from the sashes, and it all hung gracefully from one shoulder. Isn't this a bit formal? I asked. Trust me. Joy sighed. Director Walsh doesn't know how to throw a party that isn't formal. I stepped into the dress in my room, but I couldn't reach to fasten the clasps in the back. Back out on the pedestal, Joy knelt down to hold the back together at the bottom as Agnes began clasping from the top. I held as still as possible until my stomach let out a loud rumble, reminding me that I hadn't eaten yet. I placed my hand over my belly and apologized with a chuckle, but Joy stood with a serious look on her face. No, she said. I'm sorry. I should have woken you for breakfast. It's really okay, I insisted, but the remorse didn't clear from her eyes. I thought you'd be just like the others, she said, but I think I was wrong. I gave her hand a squeeze. Thanks, Joy. Agnes smiled as well, spinning me toward the mirrors and drawing our attention back to the gown. It's stunning, she exclaimed. And it was. It was the most beautiful gown I'd ever worn. I gave a small twirl, watching how the lights bounced off of the fabric. The skirt flowed around my legs as though it was enchanted, gracefully shifting with my every movement, like a waterfall suspended in air. As I spun around again, a dark figure caught my attention through the window at the front of the store. Tasseled ebony hair sat atop a tall, lean, sculpted body, and my heart stopped in my chest as I saw him peering through the glass. I may not have even noticed him if it wasn't for the harmony, the beat I loved so well, playing melodically in the back of my mind. It was him. It was Rafe. 
This will do, I said suddenly. I stepped down and reached behind me, frantically trying to undo the clasps and get out of there. Agnes stepped behind me to help, while Joy's mouth opened and closed, unsure of what to say. Her surprise was evident. I followed her gaze over to the window, but Rafe was gone. Hurry, please. I've got to go. Chapter 8 I guess we'll take them all, I heard Joy say uncertainly from outside my dressing room. I hurried to button my jeans and burst forth from the room. Depending on the cost, I added, breathless. Both women turned toward me with wide eyes. I suppose I did seem to have taken an irrational turn over the last few minutes. I could only imagine how panicked I looked as I tried to get out of there as quickly as possible to see him. Rafe had a way of doing that to me. But despite my rush, I had to put my foot down on spending Everett's money. I didn't want to owe him anything under any circumstances. I wouldn't spend any more of his money on these clothes than I could pay him back for, and with only about two months of work under my belt, that wasn't much. Miss Greenwood, can I speak to you? Joy nodded away from Agnes, who was gathering the clothing to take to the register up front. I followed her to the opposite side of the store. Director Walsh gave me your allowance card, she whispered. Right, but I'm going to pay him back for this. I don't want him to have to cover my expenses. Joy furrowed her brows. Forgive me for speaking out of line, Miss Greenwood, but do you understand how the allowance cards work? The confusion on my face must have been enough of an answer. She continued. Director Walsh didn't fund the card for you. The city did. All leaders receive an allowance card. It's intended to cover clothing, food, travel, and other necessities the leaders have beyond the scope of a normal citizen's lifestyle. Is this in addition to the standard wage? I asked, incredulous. She pulled her brows together and frowned. Yes, Miss Greenwood, it is. How much extra are we given for this allowance? Joy sighed. As much as you need. She gave me a moment to respond, but I was rendered temporarily speechless. Did you really not know? She asked after a beat. I really didn't. I should have known, or guessed at least. I rubbed my forehead, frustrated at how little I still knew of this world that I was a part of. It was no wonder Joy hated me before she met me. I hated the web of lies the leadership weaved, too. I've got your total ready here, Agnes called nervously from the cash register. Her lips sat tight in a hesitant line as we approached, and I tried not to choke when she called out the final cost of my clothing. Joy didn't flinch as she handed Agnes the card. She flashed me a sorrowful look as she handed the bags over to me, tucking the receipt into her own bag, probably for Everett's record books. How about we grab some lunch, she said trying to take my mind off of our little shopping spree. Sure, I replied, but my mind had already moved on, back to my search for Rafe. I scanned the streets for him as soon as we exited the boutique. There are some restaurants down here, Joy said, turning to the left. She began listing some of our different options, but I was only half listening, my eyes roving over the horizon, as I listened with my heart for the sound I wanted so desperately to hear again. Something inside urged me to turn to the right instead. Miss Greenwood? Joy asked hesitantly. Where are you going? Are there any restaurants this way? I asked, already picking up my pace as I moved down the sidewalk. I wish there weren't so many people out. It was hard to see more than a few yards ahead. I moved faster yet, weaving in and out of the crowds as the urging inside grew stronger, until I heard the music of Rafe again. I was getting close. Finally, I spotted him, leaning back against the brick wall of a two-story office building. He was watching me, and my heart fluttered wildly as our eyes met. But he pulled his gaze away instantly, looking regretful as he did, and turned down a side street, a familiar blue backpack bouncing over his shoulders with every long stride. 
I barely made it to the corner in time to see him disappear into a small shop with a green awning over the door. Here, I said to Joy, trotting up to the same doorway. How is this place? A sad sign hanging inside the window read, Sal's Sandwich Shop. Um... Joy tilted her head to the side, deliberating her next words. Did I mention your allowance card covers food, too? Any amount. It's paid for. Don't you like sandwiches, Joy? I didn't wait for her answer before pulling open the doors. Rafe was standing at the counter. He visibly stiffened as I entered the small restaurant, feeling my presence, but barely glancing over his shoulder at me as he turned away toward a dim hall leading to the back of the building. I turned to Joy, who had obviously been watching me watch Rafe. I need to use the ladies' room, I said, quickly stepping away. I'll be right back. She narrowed her eyes, but didn't object, as I scurried down the hall after Rafe. There were two doors for the public restrooms on the right, with an emergency exit at the far end of the hall leading into a back alley. I didn't delay making my way to the back, and the bathroom door nearly knocked me over in my hurry to get there. A strong set of arms pulled me inside and locked the door behind us. "'Why are you following me?' Wraith asked. The intensity in his eyes ignited a flame within me. He had me pinned to the wall with one arm propping himself up against the door over my shoulder. My breath caught in my throat as two opposing reactions warred inside me. I didn't know if I wanted to push him away for being so dramatic or yank him down and kiss him senseless. He leaned in an inch closer, the storm in his eyes telling me he was facing the same dilemma. I shoved down my attraction for him and allowed common sense to win out for once. Why am I following you? You're the one following me. What are you doing here in Lewisburg? Why are you surprised? He flashed his crooked grin and leaned in closer, effectively making my knees go weak. I hated it when people responded to my questions with more questions. But Rafe got away with it. Maybe it had something to do with his intoxicating scent, or the way his full lips sent my pulse racing. You should know by now, I'm no good at saying goodbye when it comes to you. You're also no good at following instructions. I ducked under his arm and spun around behind him. I told you it was time for me to move on. I asked you to stay behind. His shoulders sagged. I know. I'm not here to convince you otherwise. I'm actually here on official business for the Embers. Alarm bells were ringing in my mind now. I didn't get the sense he was being completely honest with me, but he wasn't lying either. What kind of official business? Did something happen? What's going on? Someone banged loudly on the door beside us before he could answer. I froze, panic-stricken, until a man's voice called out, are you almost finished in there? My son is about to wet his pants. Just a minute, Rafe responded in his deepest, most intimidating voice. Daddy, I heard a small voice ask. Let's wait over here. I'm sure he won't be long. The man's voice trailed off as he walked his son away from the door. This isn't the time or the place, Rafe whispered frantically. My mind raced with possible scenarios that would require his presence here. None of them were good. I doubt we'll run into each other again. Just tell me now. Oh, I'll run into you again. I'll make sure of it. He gave a half smile. But I've got to get out of here before anyone catches us talking to each other. I'm not supposed to set foot in any new American territory, not without explaining my disappearance first, anyway. His eyes traveled down and back up my body before he met mine again with a smile. And you have a way of drawing attention. I'll leave first. Wait thirty seconds before following me out. But Rafe... He stole a quick, hard kiss from my lips, interrupting me mid-sentence. Thirty seconds, Claire. And with that, he unlocked the door and swung around the corner. The bathroom was empty aside from me and my loud breathing from the sheer shock of our short interaction. 
I inhaled deeply and released the air slowly through my mouth, trying to calm my nerves before deciding thirty seconds had probably passed and turned toward the door. I watched his silhouette disappear through the front door as I stepped back into the hallway. A fidgeting little boy and his scowling father brought me back to reality as they squeezed around me to the now empty bathroom. Joy sat in a chair near the entrance, arms crossed, watching me with a quirked eyebrow and a knowing half-smirk. Actually, I said, approaching her, maybe you're right. Pasta does sound better than sandwiches. I pushed open the doors and glanced both directions on the street, but Rafe was nowhere to be found. Care to tell me what that was all about? Joy asked as she joined me on the sidewalk. No, I sighed. I'm not so sure even I know what that was about. Chapter 9 Asher picked us up after lunch, and Joy took care of my things when we returned to the mansion that afternoon, leaving me time to reflect on my conversation with Rafe. If he was here on official Ember business, did that mean the movement had already sprung to Lewisburg? It was nice to get to know Joy a little better. I wouldn't mind asking her to take me back into town, even if I didn't particularly enjoy shopping. I had to find some reason to get back out there and run into him again. Ultimately, I decided a more official excuse might work better. Later that evening, during dinner, I asked Everett if I might be able to go out and meet some of the peacemakers in the city. The peacemakers won't be of much interest to you in your position here, he replied. While that may be true, I'd like to meet them anyway. I think it will be good for me to get a feel of the culture in Lewisburg. The peacemakers are very much a part of that. He frowned. I don't prefer mingling with them. But if you insist, then I suppose we can invite them to your party next week. Well, that didn't work. I'd have to come up with a different reason to get out into the city again. I forgot about the party, I said, switching gears. I guess we have some planning to do. Everett grinned widely and waved my words away. Don't you worry about that, dear. I've already assigned the staff to handle all the details. All you have to do is show up with that beautiful smile of yours, and it will be a smashing hit. The rest of the meal consisted of me nodding along to Everett's plans for my upcoming birthday party. When he suggested we plan it together, what he really meant was that he was going to use this opportunity to throw the grandest event possible for any leader he deemed important enough to attend the swanky soiree. I got no input whatsoever. But the more I learned about Everett, the more I understood my time with him would be easier if I held my tongue on most things, and only spoke up when it really mattered. He was used to getting his way, and I wouldn't ruffle his feathers unless it was something important. I had to play my cards the right way with him. I had to let him feel as though he was in control at all times, even of me. I escaped back to my room the first chance I had after the meal and collapsed backward on the bed, staring at the ceiling in a much welcomed silence. But the silence didn't last long. A rapping sound coming from the balcony made me jump and roll quickly to the opposite side of the bed, where I dropped to the floor to hide from whatever intruder may be standing outside. But I didn't sense any fear or anger or determination coming from the doors. Instead, I had to fight the urge to laugh. It started softly, a giggle threatening to escape. But the longer I hid, the funnier the situation seemed. I peeked hesitantly over the top of my mattress, though by then I already knew who was standing on the other side of the doors. I just didn't know what he found so funny. I stood to find Rafe's handsome face leaning in toward the glass, his hands cupped around his eyes to help him see better through the glare of the light. His smile was wide, amused at my clumsiness, no doubt. His breath fogged the glass, cold from the chill and the early spring air. Looking over my shoulder to make sure we were alone, and my bedroom door was tightly shut behind me, I strode over and opened the balcony doors for him. The situation wasn't funny to me at all anymore by the time I got to him. Get in here before someone sees you out there, I scolded. 
What are you doing in the center after dark anyway? Are you trying to get exiled? I told you I would run into you again. Here I am. He was still smiling. Nice moves, by the way. I'm sure you would be totally safe from any real intruders. I hit him playfully on the arm. I can't imagine any real bad guys would be dumb enough to scale up to a second-story balcony on the district director's home. Rafe laughed. Love will do crazy things to a man. My eyes widened. Did he just say love? He continued talking, changing the subject before I could ask. He grew more serious as he moved to take a seat on the edge of my bed. I'd have to shelve his slip of the tongue until after I learned the real reason he was here. I'm happy to see you again, Rafe said with a frown. But that's not the only reason I'm here. I know. What happened with the embers? I asked, joining him on the bed. Nothing, yet. But you were right. Something is coming. Your dad pulled me into a meeting with Frank and a few of the others when I got back to camp after dropping you off at James's house the other night. I turned to face him better, hunkering down for the bad news that was certainly about to come my way. They saw the men on the motorcycles. Well, Tim did. He was leaving camp around the same time we did, and he said the men were circling the perimeter. He suspects they were looking for ways to access the camp without being caught. I'm afraid the exiled aren't done with us yet. I shook my head. No, I hate to say this out loud because I don't want it to be true, but I'm afraid it's even worse than the exiled. When we saw the men, did you happen to notice the blue band tattooed around the taller man's neck? Rafe shook his head. No, what does it mean? I think he might be associated with the supreme leadership. I never would have believed it either, I added quickly after feeling Rafe's skepticism shift into place. But then I saw another man with the same tattoo at the municipal building. Or maybe the same man? I'm not sure. There's definitely at least one of them in class and city on official business. I don't know how many others may be in the area as well. That makes no sense. Rafe's brows pulled together. What would the supreme leadership want with us? I don't know, I answered honestly. He shook his head again, unbelieving. Frank was so certain it was the exiled. We all thought it had to be them. Well, if it is the exiled, you know you can handle them. And if it's not, if you're right about it being the supreme leadership, then I'll get to the bottom of it. I just didn't know how yet. I sat thinking it over for just a moment before I turned to Rafe again. You said you were here on official ember business. Did Frank send you to tell me this? Or was there something more? Rafe's eyes softened, and he placed his hand on mine. Honestly, I was planning on coming to check on you anyway. I pulled my hand out from under his. But you said you wouldn't follow me any farther. I asked you to stay behind. I know. He dropped his gaze down to the coverlet between us. But I swore to your dad back when you first saw him again that I would keep you safe. So, in a way, me following you here is official business. I stood. I didn't need him to babysit me. He was only making the inevitable goodbye more difficult. No, you and my father have both made it very clear that you're okay without me, and I need to learn to be okay without you, too. I appreciate the information, but you can go back home and let them know that I'm fine, and then you can stay there. I'll leave first thing in the morning. No, you'll leave now. My voice was louder than I'd intended, and we both looked quickly to the door as footsteps approached. Is everything all right in there, Miss Greenwood? Joy called out sweetly. I'm fine, Joy. I held my breath, waiting for her to walk away, but the sound of her footsteps never came. Was there something else you needed? She dropped her voice to a whisper, turning the knob and opening the door just a crack so I could hear her. I tripped over my feet in my hurry to stop the door from opening any wider, but her pale face was already inside, looking surprisingly unsurprised. 
Would you like me to show your guest to the room I have set up for him across the hall? My jaw dropped as I looked back and forth between her and Rafe. She flashed an innocent grin. I, uh, never mind. It's the second door on the left, when he's ready. She smiled again before pulling her head back out of the room and retreating back down the hall. What is going on here? I asked, turning furiously to Rafe. He closed his eyes and ran a hand through his hair. I'm sorry. I thought you'd be a little more amiable to my being here. I crossed my arms over my chest. How did you get in here anyway? He cringed. I paid the guards to let me into the center. You paid them? With what? You're an outsider. You don't have any money. James gave me some valuables, tobacco, alcohol, and some old jewelry. He knew the guards in Lewisburg could be bought. He pulled the blue backpack he'd been wearing around to the front to show me how he'd smuggled the goods inside. I knew that bag looked familiar. I watched James hand it to him just a couple of nights earlier. I just didn't realize it was Rafe at the time. So James is in on this too? I threw my hands in the air. Wasn't there anyone who trusted me to take care of myself? I went back to him after I said goodbye to you that night. I had barely started back through the tunnels before I realized I couldn't actually let you go. I knew I had to see you again. I had to make sure you were okay here. So I went back. I told James I was going to follow you to Lewisburg. I told him it was because I made that promise to your dad. I groaned and dropped my face into my hands. Lies. Again. No, not lies. Mistruths. Enough secrets to prevent me from being able to trust him again. Why did he insist on breaking my trust around every corner? If he loved me, he wouldn't keep things from me like this. Rafe, I don't even know what to say to you right now. Say you'll let me stay, just for tonight. I'll sleep in the other room, and I'll return to class and city tomorrow. I'll let them know they may be dealing with more than Milo's gang this time around. I met his eyes, pleading with me from across the room, and I wished he didn't have such control over my heart. I was angry with him, furious, but I couldn't neglect the fact that he'd driven many hours here just to make sure I was okay, to update me on the situation back home, to confess his love, sort of. Rafe and I were nothing if we weren't complicated. You can stay, but this is it. The embers need you back home now more than ever, and I need some time to find my own way here. I don't want to see you again. Not for a long time, anyway. My chest ached as the words left my mouth, and Rafe visibly crumpled across from me. He gave a solemn nod and stepped toward me, stopping just inches away. He leaned down and paused. His voice was barely audible, but he was close enough for the warmth of his breath to tickle my lips. I can't promise to stay away from you. Energy buzzed between us, an inexplicable pull drawing me toward him, but I resisted. Kissing him would only complicate things further. I needed to push Rafe out of my mind. We couldn't be together. But I couldn't bring myself to move away from him either. Finally, he whispered, Good night, Claren. The breath I'd been holding slowly escaped through my lips. Goodbye, Rafe. And as he exited the door behind me, a single tear escaped as well. Chapter 10 Miss Greenwood! Joy urgently rapped on the opposite side of my door. Miss Greenwood, are you up? What time is it? I squinted at the sunlight shining too brightly from my balcony window and sat up in my bed. Joy pushed the door open and peeked inside. It's time for breakfast, and Director Walsh is asking for you. She made wide eyes at me. Apparently, I wasn't moving fast enough for her. The truth was, I felt as though I'd just drifted off to sleep, and I wasn't ready to get up. My mind whirled around for hours the night before, 
I tossed and turned, unable to succumb to the rest I so desperately needed. Now the morning sunlight felt like a blunt knock across the head. Then I remembered the reason for my insomnia. Rafe was here. I jumped out of the covers and dashed to the door, but Joy reached out to stop me from leaving the room. He's already gone. What? When did he go? At dawn, she whispered. I had to get him out before anyone else awoke. Asher took him back into the city. I crossed my arms and narrowed my eyes at her. Why? Beg your pardon? Joy shifted nervously on her feet. Why did you help him? I'd suspected she was a part of the embers somehow, but I needed to hear her say it. Joy shifted her gaze down to the floor, pulling her initial defenses back into place. Whatever progress we'd made toward friendship was crashing and burning now before my eyes. I may be new to working with Director Walsh, but I am not new to working with the leadership, she said harshly. I'm not sure what you mean by that. Visitors, she said simply, glancing up briefly enough to shoot a glare at me from under her brows. Well, I don't normally have visitors, I replied coolly. She was starting to frustrate me with her calloused attitude. I hadn't done anything wrong here. When she didn't respond, I added, But thank you for taking care of him. I didn't really have much of a choice. Joy sighed heavily and turned toward the windows. What do you mean? Did someone contact you about him? I was hopeful. Maybe this was her way of telling me she knew Frank or some of the other embers. Joy turned back to face me, confusion and irritation marking her features. I was there with you at the sandwich shop yesterday. I expected him to show up here. But when he saw me around the side of the house with Asher, I knew I would have to do whatever you said. Her cheeks flushed and her heartbeat increased. I smiled to try and ease her concern. I'm not going to tell anyone about you and Asher, and I assure you, Rafe won't either. Well, you never know. I learned a long time ago that the leaders play by different rules. Director Walsh can have as many... She froze mid-sentence, terror darkening her petite face. I'm so sorry, she stammered. Forgive me for saying anything. I don't know what I was thinking. The point is, I know not to make assumptions and not to judge others. She bowed and made a quick exit, pulling the door closed behind her and leaving me alone with my mouth agape. Well, that wasn't what I expected. Surely Rafe hadn't said anything to threaten her or make her fear that he would reveal her secret relationship with Asher. But she clearly wasn't related to the embers with that little mini-rant she let loose. What in the world was she talking about? Another knock sounded at the door before I'd taken a step away from it. Yes? Don't forget to come down to breakfast as soon as you can. Director Walsh is waiting. The words spilled out of Joy's mouth, and her footsteps led her away from the door just as quickly. It turned out Everett's impatience over getting me down to the dining room was due to a list of instructions he had printed out for the party. It was set to take place that Friday, and he asked me to lead the staff in ensuring everything was prepared and decorated properly. He wanted to hold off on introducing me to the other leaders until the day of the party, so I was essentially on house arrest until the big night arrived. He was so distracted by making sure all the details were exactly as he wanted them that he neglected to say or do anything on the actual day I turned 19, which happened to be Thursday before the party. It's not that I expected him to, or even that I wanted him to, but it was the loneliest birthday I'd ever had, despite being in a grand mansion surrounded by people. I didn't know any of them, not really and it was the first birthday that I didn't have my brother, Cato, by my side. Joy had been fairly distant since the run-in with Rafe, so I was surprised by her unannounced visit to my room Thursday night. Secretly, I hoped she'd come to apologize. It was nice having her as an ally in this house, but that wasn't the reason for her visit. This came for you, she said flatly, extending her arms to pass me a large brown package. 
Thank you. I turned the package over, looking for a return address. Do you know who it's from? She shook her head. It was delivered by a messenger from the parcel service. I examined my name, scrawled out in neat penmanship across the front of the brown paper that hid the contents inside. The writing was unfamiliar. I looked back to Joy, who stood motionless in my doorway, watching as I set the package on top of my dresser. Meeting her soft brown eyes, I knew there was more she wanted to say. I waited, giving her a moment to compose her thoughts before she finally spoke. You didn't report my actions with Asher. Her brows pulled up in the middle, vulnerable and afraid. No, I agreed. I told you I wouldn't. She dropped her eyes to the floor. Thank you, she said softly. Her heart ached, and I understood her dilemma better than she knew. Of course, I said. Love is a tricky thing. It's hard enough to figure out on its own. It's even harder when society tries to put you in a box and control who you're allowed to fall in love with. Maybe one day they'll learn. The heart can't be controlled. She looked up to me again, her eyes misty now with unshed tears. She nodded fervently, causing one to break free and leave a shiny trail down the side of her freckled cheek. Maybe I misjudged you, she chuckled. Again, I'm sorry. Reaching into the pocket of the apron tied around her small waist, she pulled out another package, much smaller this time. Happy birthday, she whispered, extending the gift to me. It's not much, but it's all we could sneak out of the kitchen. Go ahead, open it. Her eyes were alive now, eager to see my reaction. I untied the simple bow made of twine and unwrapped the butcher paper to reveal two small chocolates. One had a splattering of salt crystals across the top, and the other was drizzled with caramel. They looked and smelled decadently delicious. Joy! I exclaimed. These are incredible! She flushed. They're nothing compared to what you'll have at the party tomorrow night. But like I said, it's the best we could pull together. I hope you like them. I'm certain I will. I smiled and pulled Joy inside by her wrist, closing the door behind us. But, you know, gifts like this are best enjoyed with friends. Her brows raised, and she glanced from the chocolates in my hand back up to my face. Miss Greenwood, I couldn't. It's Claren, and please... For my birthday? She eyed the treats hesitantly before the corner of her mouth quirked up. Are you sure? I insist. Thank you, Claren. We sat cross-legged on the floor, enjoying the divine little treats, and my heart was happy. It felt good to have company, and I hoped this was the beginning of a real friendship here in Lewisburg. I needed a friend. We discussed plans for the next day, and I learned that I'd be primped and pampered by a hired stylist all morning before the guests arrived. A few VIPs would be attending a happy hour before the dinner, and I was expected to mingle and schmooze my way through the small crowd before the real party began. Joy informed me that Everett Shindigs had a way of extending late into the night, so she encouraged me to get my rest. Eventually, we said our goodbyes, and it wasn't until I moved to get ready for bed that I remembered the first package Joy had given me. I studied the writing again, running my fingers across the neat black ink before slipping them under the fold of the paper and ripping it gently away from the gift inside. My stomach somersaulted as the vivid blues and oranges were exposed in the dim light of my lamp. Quickly pulling the rest of the paper away, I couldn't suppress my grin as I looked at the stunning piece of art in my hands. It was one of Elizabeth's paintings, a glowing bed of embers under a brilliant, fiery, illuminated sky. Turning the piece over, I noticed a small note tucked under the edge of the wooden frame. The same neat penmanship spelled out a simple, vague message. See you soon. That was it. No signature, no explanation. 
Who could have sent it? It wasn't Rafe. I knew his handwriting well from the notes we'd sent during my training. But it had to be one of the embers. Were they coming here? Was I about to receive my first real mission from them? I smiled again, pulling the art close to my chest in an embrace. I hadn't realized how badly I'd needed to feel a purpose again. But this art from the embers filled a void inside. Something interesting was about to happen, and I couldn't wait to be a part of whatever was coming. Chapter 11 The sky had barely turned a soft shade of gold when Joy awoke me the next morning. She smiled apologetically for the early intrusion and handed me a steaming cup of tea and a scone. Your stylist will be arriving any moment. I thought you might want to sneak a bite of breakfast before she gets here. Here? In my room? Joy winked. I figured you'd be spending plenty of time with Director Walsh later today. Enjoy a few minutes to yourself. She stood to leave, and I had just finished my breakfast when another knock came from the door. Miss Greenwood, your stylist is here. Joy's voice was timid, and I understood why as a door swung open to reveal my next guest. Olivia Park, said a tall woman as she strode confidently toward me. I stood to shake her hand, brushing the crumbs from my cotton nightgown as I did. Olivia was at least half a foot taller than me, and all angles. Her cheekbones were sharp, her brows an unnatural shade of brown, and her full lips fiery red. Tight black leather pants hugged her lithe frame, and a long black jacket fell all the way to the floor behind her patent black heels. It was a startling contrast to the platinum blonde hair she had slicked back into a smooth, silky ponytail that was perched near the crown of her head. It was such a pale shade of blonde that it practically glowed white in the morning light shining in from the windows. Nothing about Olivia felt authentic. I feared I might look the same in a few hours. She gave me a thorough inspection, looking my body up and down with a calculating stare. Aware of her scrutiny, I straightened myself to stand tall and pushed a lock of my honey-colored hair back behind an ear, mustering up all the confidence I could find. Finally, the woman nodded, tapping her index finger against her temple thoughtfully as she turned to dig through a large bag she'd carried in with her. I have an idea, she stated loudly. Joy visibly relaxed in the doorway. With a large pink bottle in her hands, Olivia stood tall again, flashing a set of square white teeth that looked as unnatural as the scarlet-colored frame around them. Let's start you in the bath, darling. I'm going to make you look like a queen. Olivia took her job seriously, and she wasn't prone to chit-chat. Joy was in and out of the room throughout the morning, popping in every now and then under the premise of seeing if we needed anything, though I suspected it was more to fulfill her own curiosity. I was curious, too. Olivia was adamant that I not look in a mirror until my transformation was complete. I sat on the edge of my bathroom counter while Olivia painted something on the lids of my closed eyes when Joy came knocking again. I could sense something different about this check-in, though. She wasn't her typical cheery self. Come on in, I called out. Is something the matter? Olivia stepped back to allow me a peek at the young woman as she hung a long black garment bag on the back of my bathroom door. Nothing's the matter, Joy quipped through a fake smile. I was just coming to deliver your birthday gift from Director Walsh. Her shoulders tensed as she turned to unzip the bag. Inside hung a red satin dress and a stunning golden necklace with a pear-shaped ruby pendant hanging from its delicate chain. It's fabulous, Olivia beamed. Let's hurry and get it on you. It is lovely, but I already have a dress for this evening. I glanced at Joy for backup, but her lips were sealed. Olivia placed her hands on her hips, shaking her head rapidly from side to side. Nonsense! It would be an affront to the director if you rejected this beautiful gift. You will wear it tonight, for him. 
joy look to her feet, her silence deafening. Olivia had left me no room to object. Once again, my opinion didn't matter, even when it came to my own birthday party and clothes I chose to wear on my own body. A big part of me wanted to wear the blue dress anyway. I wanted to show Everett exactly how I felt about him trying to control every detail of my life. But the painting I'd received from the embers held my mouth shut. If they were going to need me here, I would have to play nice. Arguing over a dress was silly when I knew I'd need to speak up for a much greater reason soon. I couldn't use all my good credit with Everett yet, so I would bite my tongue instead, no matter how bitter the taste was. Olivia finished with my cosmetics and gave me some privacy to step into the gown. It was cut in a way that prevented me from wearing my typical undergarments, and as I pulled the satiny fabric up, I realized it didn't leave much to the imagination. The fabric was thin, clinging tightly to my hips and waist. The neckline plunged deep down the center of my chest, exposing skin that had never been seen by another human before. A small amount of structure built into the dress pushed me up and cinched me in, enhancing my natural curves and creating more where I didn't have any before. The back was high but made of itchy red lace, tickling the skin from my shoulders all the way down to the dimples in the small of my back. My arms were bare, as was my left leg, clear up to my thigh. Then again, the dress was so tight I probably wouldn't have been able to walk if it weren't for the slit in the fabric that exposed my freshly shaven skin. It was a high-quality gown, no doubt very expensive, but it just wasn't me. Wearing the dress gave me a sinking feeling that this evening was less about me networking with other leaders and more about Everett putting me on display for them. The thought revolted me. What a masterpiece! Olivia clapped her hands together as I swung the door open to get approval from her and Joy. Olivia murmured over the design and the fabric, spinning me around to take it all in, while Joy stood silently against the wall. If I doubted my sinking feeling before, it was all confirmed when I saw the pity in Joy's eyes. This night wasn't actually about me at all. I stumbled forward in the three-inch high heels Olivia brought along, with her long arms reaching out to my sides, guiding and teaching me how to carry myself. After several minutes of prancing back and forth across my bedroom, she decided I was ready. Come along, dear. The first guests will be arriving any minute now. I walked ahead to the landing at the top of the stairs and nearly fell right over the banister when I saw Everett standing at the bottom. Dressed in a tuxedo, with his hair combed over in a slightly younger-looking style, his resemblance to Felix was remarkable. The beat of my heart sounded off in my ears as I caught my breath before stepping down. It was surreal to think that just a couple of weeks earlier I'd been walking down the steps to meet his son before Felix's big announcement in class and city, and it was surprising how much my heart stung at the memory. I didn't realize how much I missed him. But this wasn't Felix. It was Everett. His smile and lingering gaze weren't charming like his son's. He was a little creepy. But if I could just make it through this party, I knew I'd have a lot more autonomy in my work. I just needed to meet the other leaders and then wait for my mission from the Embers. I could do this. You got my gift, Everett said as I made my way down the grand staircase. His eyes were appraising my every step and I felt like a bird trapped in a cage under his watchful stare. I did. It's lovely. Thank you. My tone was formal, and my eyes were already searching the foyer below, looking to see if any of the other guests had arrived. Everett took my hand in his as I reached the bottom step, bringing me back to him as he allowed a kiss to linger on the back of my knuckles. It's more than lovely. You are absolutely breathtaking. His whisper sent a shiver down my spine, and not the good kind. I quickly pulled my hand away and began walking toward the dining room, 
but I couldn't move very quickly in the dress and shoes Everett had arranged for me to wear. He caught up to me in an instant and gently guided me forward with his hand on the small of my back. I looked up to find Joy's fearful eyes watching over me from the top of the stairs. Was it too late to run back up there and join her? I hated this more with every passing instant. We passed the dining room into a large open library, where two women stood near a bar cart, drinking bubbly liquid from tall crystal glasses. Their dresses were purple and black, with V-shaped necklines almost as deep as mine. They looked up and greeted Everett with over-eager smiles as we entered the room. He made introductions, but I couldn't concentrate over my increasing sense of discomfort around them. They all seemed a little too friendly, a little too perfectly done up for the occasion. "'Would you like a drink?' the woman in the black dress asked with a smile. Her lips were painted pink, similar to the shade Emmeline usually wore. She lifted her glass and tilted her head toward me. "'Thank you, but I think I'll stick to water.' I grimaced, remembering the bitter sip of wine I'd had at the harvest dinner. Alcoholic beverages really weren't my thing. Everett poured himself an amber-colored drink from a green glass bottle and clinked his glass against those in the women's hands. To Claren, he said. To Claren, the women chirped back in unison. Everett watched me as he gulped his beverage down in one large swallow and immediately poured a second glass. Our attention was drawn to the doorway as an older woman made her entrance just moments later. She was striking, with alabaster skin and pale eyes that brought a chill into the room with every graceful step she took toward us. She didn't smile, and the intensity of her stare froze me to the spot. Everett tensed beside me as well, and his lady friends slowly retreated back into the shadows along the wall. Ah, Claren, here's another special guest for this evening. Everett plastered on his molded smile as the Ice Queen in her silver gown reached us. Please allow me the pleasure of introducing you to Madame Cynthia George. Claren Greenwood, I said, extending my hand. It was a struggle to keep my voice steady as I noticed the thin blue band tattooed around her neck. Our hands met, and I shuddered against the coldness radiating from her palm. Her icy fingers wrapped firmly around my hand as she met my eyes unflinching. "'It's so nice to meet you.' "'Indeed,' Cynthia said. "'I've been very eager to put a face with the name I've heard so much about.' My throat constricted, making my response squeak out through the nerves I was failing to conceal. Good things, I hope? I forced a laugh. Some think so. She tried to smile, but there was no emotion behind it, and she didn't do much to keep our conversation moving forward. I knew I should respond with something charming, but there seemed to be a disconnect between my brain and my mouth. I was too distracted by her mark to think. I worked to prevent myself from staring at it, it was more delicate than Conrad's, the other supreme leader I'd run into. Hers flowed and curled like wisps of smoke dancing around the curves of her throat. It was beautiful in a way, where Conrad's had been more solid and streamlined, almost authoritarian. But the deep shade of blue was unmistakably a match. It was bold and foreboding, like a menacing thunderhead at twilight. She was definitely a part of the same crowd. Meeting her eyes again, I pretended not to be distracted by the mark and what I knew it meant. Everything I said to her would be recorded and probably analyzed by strangers in the highest levels of our government. No pressure. A few more guests were arriving then, drawing my attention back to the doorway. Well, I'm honored to have you here at my party. Perhaps we can chat more later. I said, as Everett guided me to meet our new arrivals. Cynthia didn't respond, but I felt her cold stare on my back as I greeted the other guests. In fact, I could have sworn I felt her gaze throughout the rest of the pre-dinner mixer, but every time I turned to locate her, she was nowhere to be found. 
Even so, I knew I should be on my best behavior so she would have nothing to report back to the supreme leadership. There was no telling what Justice Hines might have been saying about me back in class and city, and I certainly didn't need to add anything to make a case for myself. Everett poured himself another drink. I'd lost count of how many he'd had at that point, and gleefully escorted me into the dining room as a new wave of guests were arriving for the dinner. His hand slid a little lower on my back to where the lace of my dress met the satin, and I wriggled free from him as soon as we stepped into the large dining room. I made my way toward my designated chair next to Everett's at the head of the table, politely greeting the multitude of new faces around me. I never liked being in crowded rooms like this. My nerves were on edge already from my interaction with Cynthia, but surrounding myself with so much excitement and the oceans of emotions flowing over me from our guests was overwhelming. Behind my seat sat a table piled nearly to the twelve-foot ceiling with gifts, each package was beautifully wrapped with shiny paper and ribbons. Brightly colored cards were scattered across the table as well, and I couldn't imagine one single thing in those gifts that I might actually need. It was such an extravagant waste. I inhaled deeply, finding it hard to focus under all the pressure building up around me. Noise from mindless chatter reverberated from the walls. The lace on my back was itching, and the waist was cinched in too tight. I couldn't breathe. The weight of everyone's thoughts and feelings was growing heavier and heavier, and I realized I was panting, gasping for air. I turned quickly on my heels and exited the dining room through a side set of doors. I had to get out of there just for a second before the dinner began. I was overstimulated. It was too much. I needed to breathe. On the other side of the doors, I found myself standing in an attendance hall. Several of Everett's staff members scurried here and there, carrying large silver trays covered in appetizers and drinks. They were all too rushed to pay me much attention as I scampered past them, deeper down the hall and around a corner to a quieter place in the house. I kept walking, wishing now that I had taken Joy up on her offer of a tour before. The halls all looked the same, and after a few more turns, I wondered if I'd be able to find my way back to the dinner. Finally, I rounded into a dimly lit office. The desk was cluttered with papers, and a bar cart in the corner held a multitude of glass bottles. But what really drew my attention was the mahogany door behind Everett's desk. A warm glow emanated from the crack beneath the wood, and my curiosity got the best of me. I tiptoed over to the door, somehow knowing it was wrong, but too tempted by the sterling silver knob to stop. I gripped the cool metal and turned it, but I was met with resistance. It was locked. I considered looking for a key, but the thought was quickly exterminated by the sound of a throat being cleared behind me. I smelled the whiskey on his breath before I could turn and see his chilling grin. Everett ran his fingers down the side of my neck and over my bare shoulder, smoothing out the goosebumps that dotted my skin. I would love nothing more than to show you what I keep in there, he whispered breathlessly. But it will have to wait for another day. We don't want to keep our guests waiting. Chapter 12 I'm sorry, I stammered. I just wanted a minute to catch my breath. I'm not sure how I ended up here. Everett inched toward me with every step I took away from him. He was broad-shouldered, like his son, and I'd never felt as small next to him as I did in that moment. He could overpower me without even batting his eyes. My heart pounded wildly against my chest, and I wasn't sure what it was about him that was ringing the alarm bells in my ears. Maybe it was the whiskey. Maybe it was the way his dark blue eyes had turned almost stormy with intensity. Whatever it was, I didn't feel safe. I wanted desperately to get back into the crowded dining room full of strangers. Everett smiled, twisting knots in my stomach with the curl of his lip. There's no need to apologize. I could never be mad at you in that dress. 
I faked a laugh, hoping it might hide the fear creeping up inside. It really is something. Aware that his eyes were glued to me, I gave a little spin, playing to his senses while simultaneously moving myself to the doorway. I'm glad you're not upset. I'll be sure to stay out of your office from now on. I intentionally kept my eyes away from the doorway. With any luck, he'd forget all about me snooping around and trying to get into locked doors. What's mine is yours, and what's yours is mine. He dropped his voice as he followed me to the exit. My spin had put enough space between us to allow me to move ahead without him trapping me near the wall. I didn't want anything of his. I just wanted to get back to the comforts of company. Back in the hall, I could see the foyer up ahead. I'd done a circle through the house, and relief flooded my veins as I quickened my pace back to familiar territory. Let's get back to those guests, I called out over my shoulder as I trotted back toward the party. Dodging an attendant pulling open the door for a new set of guests, I turned to the dining room without even glancing to see if Everett was following. Claren! A deep voice called out from the foyer behind me. I quickened my pace. Not only did Everett hold a slight resemblance to his son tonight, but he sounded an awful lot like him when he called my name as well. I hated it. It wasn't fair that a man as good and kind as Felix could come from such strange and discomforting genes. It was messing with my mind. Claren, he called again. Wait up! I paused and allowed myself a tiny peek behind me. I didn't want to get up my hopes because it was foolish to think that it could be him. But Felix! My vision immediately blurred with tears as I ran into his strong arms. Whatever emotions I'd been trying to stuff inside flowed freely now. I was safe. Felix was here. He pulled me into a strong embrace, and I buried my face in his chest. He smelled clean and strong. He smelled like home. I wiped the tears from my eyes, hoping they didn't do too much damage to all the work Olivia put in on my face and stared up into the face of the man who had quickly filled the role of my best friend in this new life. But he wasn't smiling back down at me. Felix's jaw was tight as he looked over my shoulder into the hall. Hello, son. I wasn't expecting to see you here tonight. Everett was approaching our little reunion in the foyer. Sorry I didn't RSVP. Felix's tone was smooth, charismatic as always but he was boiling inside. My invitation must have gotten lost in the mail. His jaw twitched a fraction of an inch. Ah, oh, that's too bad. Well, it looks like you arrived just in time for dinner. Everett reached out for my hand, but Felix turned his body just enough to shield me from his father. Come along, Claren. Everyone must be waiting for you. Everett's shell was cracking. Maybe not on the outside, but he couldn't hide it from me. We'll be just a moment. I'll bring her in as soon as we finish our hellos. Felix's voice was firm, commanding. It was rather attractive hearing him speak to his father in that way, especially since I could feel his hesitation. Felix was fighting through his fear, for me. Everett didn't move right away. Their eyes were locked onto each other in some sort of silent power play. Not wanting to get caught in their games, I looked away and saw another familiar face standing in the entryway. Ryder gave me a soft smile and the tiniest nod of reassurance. After a long pause, Everett finally relented and moved toward the dining room. You have two minutes, he said, looking down at his watch. It would leave quite the negative impression if Claren was late to the first course of her own birthday dinner. He lifted his chin high as he made his way out of the room. I hugged Felix again, my voice sounding muffled against the fabric of his suit. I'm so glad you're here. I had no idea you were coming. Felix pulled back with a frown. Didn't you get my gift? He elaborated after seeing my confusion. I sent you a painting and a note. The embers? I fought against the feeling of disappointment rising inside. It was thoughtful of him, 
I just hoped it might have been the start of something new, a symbol from the outside. I know how much you love the one in your room back home, he quieted as he said, home, and the pain in his eyes sent a dagger through my heart. Poor Felix. The last time I said goodbye, it was because I was leaving for the outside. I never mentioned I was moving in with his father. I didn't know it until I got here. He must have thought I was a total liar. Thank you. I reached for his hand, but he pulled it away. We better get in there for dinner. My father won't be happy if you're late. I looked to Ryder for some help, but he stood still, hands behind his back and eyes fixed on the wall ahead. Clearly he wasn't interested in stepping into this. Felix, I started, but he was already halfway across the foyer. The dining room was full of new faces, who all looked like caricatures. Wide smiles, overdone cosmetics, formal suits with stiff collars. Several of them had the same drunken glaze in their eyes as Everett, but none played it off as well as he did. Ah, our guest of honor has arrived. Everett shot a triumphant glance over at Felix, who took one of the last remaining chairs at the opposite end of the table from me. He tapped the side of his glass with a spoon, sending high-pitched tings through the air. He launched into an elaborate speech as I took my spot beside him at the head of the table, making me sound much more qualified than I actually was. I barely heard him over the internal monologue that wouldn't shut up in my brain. I had finally gotten to a point where I was satisfied with my lot here in Lewisburg. The painting gave me hope when I thought it was a sign from the embers. But now that I knew it was just a birthday gift from Felix, I couldn't stop wondering what I was doing here. These weren't my people, the parties, the luxury, the flamboyance and utter disregard for other people's welfare. I could look past it if I knew I had a mission to eradicate it, but I hadn't heard a word from the embers. Not unless I counted Rafe's surprise visit, which I didn't. Though I tried to fake an interest in Everett's stories and the guests immediately surrounding me through the dinner, I couldn't help but shoot glances down at Felix and Ryder on the other side of the room. Felix avoided my gaze. There were too many people in the room for me to get a good feel of his emotions, but the look on his face and his avoidance made it pretty clear he was unhappy. Ryder kept a flat affect as usual, though once I could have sworn I saw a flash of remorse in his eyes. Everett cleared his throat roughly beside me, shaking me from the stupor of my thoughts. An attendant stood between us, passing out beautiful chocolate torts, dusted in powdered sugar and garnished with raspberries, served on gorgeous blue and white vintage china dessert plates. My stomach rumbled quietly, and I couldn't remember if I'd taken a single bite of the braised duck she'd just removed from my previous course. Everett's smile was full of charm, but I knew he wasn't happy with me. I must not have been performing to his standards. The air between us was cold, and I got the sense he would have appeared a lot less even-tempered if we hadn't been surrounded by forty of his closest friends. He obviously didn't get what he'd expected by forcing me to play a part I wasn't made for. But despite his frustration, even fueled by whiskey, he certainly knew how to play his part well. It was no wonder he'd excelled in politics. With a wide smile, he pinned me with a glare, a clear warning radiating from his stormy blue eyes. As I was saying, he glanced back at Cynthia George, whose blue tattoo was almost the same deep foreboding color as Everett's eyes in this light. I think Claren will be a wonderful asset here in Lewisburg, She'll be able to tame the crowds and maintain peace among the people while I'm reporting to the supreme leadership, and she will definitely boost morale among the current leadership. I smiled at the woman, but she seemed to be carved from stone, unmoving, though I got the sense she wasn't uninterested. On the contrary, she seemed to take great interest in me. Uncertain of her empathic abilities, I worked to block my mind from her as much as possible. 
Between the awkward encounter with Everett, the mystery of the door in his office, and a surprise visit by Felix, there was no telling what kind of information she could glean from my emotions. Everett made a solid effort to include me in conversation through dessert, but to my dismay, the party wasn't over after the plates were removed. The gathering moved back into the foyer and library, glasses of port being passed around like candy. Everett downed at least two cups full of the deep red dessert wine. It was a wonder his teeth weren't purple. I stayed near him, though my eyes were constantly on Felix. He was almost as popular at the party as his father, and arguably most charismatic. The women flocked to him like moths to a flame, all giggles and flirty touches. The sight made me tense and uncomfortable, yet I couldn't look away. I didn't want them fawning over my friend like that. I needed to talk to him. After an hour or so, I managed to detach myself from Everett's side and post up against a wall of the library. My feet were begging to slip out of my heels, and my dry eyes craved sleep. But I couldn't go yet. Scanning the room again for probably the hundredth time that night, I finally spotted him. Felix locked his eyes on me, the corners of his mouth turning slightly down. He was fatigued. He didn't want to be here any more than I did. Pretending I didn't see Everett approaching from my periphery, I started forward, determined to catch Felix before he left. He never let his eyes drift from me, but he must have seen his father too. He straightened tall, his frown more defined and resolute as I reached him. Felix, I whispered hurriedly. Everett was hot on my heels, so I didn't have much time to make my proposition. Will you stay tonight, here at the house? His eyes cut behind me, focusing briefly on his father who had to be close now. I don't think that's a good idea. Please. I hated the desperation in my voice, but not as much as I would hate to leave on bad terms with him. He was one of the only friends I had, and an idea had occurred to me, one that Felix may have been able to help me with. He looked down at me, his hand reaching toward me almost of its own accord. There was something behind his softened features, almost a sadness. Don't be sad, I thought. Just stay. I can explain everything. Felix, you're still here. Everett placed a hand on my back as he took a spot beside me. Ryder approached our small group as well, standing across from Everett with a fierceness only he could possess. It's getting late. Would you like me to have my driver pull a car around for you? Felix pulled his gaze from mine, something shifting within him. No, actually, you're right. It's late. Too late for a flight back into Klassen. Mind if I stay here tonight? Everett stiffened. There is some wonderful lodging just down the road, top of the line. Wouldn't you be more comfortable there? I wouldn't want you to go through the trouble of arranging that for me, not when you have plenty of guest rooms here. Wouldn't it be easier for me to stay with my own father? Everett's fingers curled slightly on my back, pulling me just a touch closer to his side. I could see his jaw clenching from the corner of my eye. Ryder's sharp gaze was laser-focused on Everett's arm, and the tension was so thick between us that I found it difficult to breathe. The alcohol lessened Everett's charisma. His forced smile seemed noticeably more plastic somehow, the glaze in his eyes unable to hide the disdain in his stare. I shifted uncomfortably under his grasp, summoning enough courage to lean in closer to him. The scent of wine on his breath caught in the back of my throat, threatening to gag me as I whispered in his ear. He leaned in, almost brushing his cheek against my lips, before I pulled back enough to keep some distance between us. You are surrounded by leadership. Show them how flexible and accommodating you can be. Build their trust in you, so one day they might be able to rely on you as well. Everett pulled away, his eyes cold as they trailed up and down my figure again. Felix clenched his hands at his sides, but remained silent as Everett thought over my suggestion. 
Abruptly, he pulled me almost flush against him, his breath hot as he leaned down to whisper back to me. If he stays, we won't be able to explore the room you were curious about earlier. Something about the way he slurred the words sent a cold chill down my spine. I smiled despite it and whispered back, You hired me to help with appearances. Trust me on this. We can explore another day. His cold eyes grew hot as he squeezed me before turning back to his son. You can stay tonight, but you'll take the first plane out of here tomorrow. I'll arrange for your departure at dawn. Chapter 13 I turned victoriously to Felix as Everett walked away, but he didn't share in my joy. A slight sheen of sweat glimmered from his downturned brow, his cheeks flushed, breathing heavy. I'll go, he said to no one in particular, as his father was already halfway across the room. But Ryder will stay. I looked over to Ryder, whose dark eyes were equally stormy. He gave a nod and crossed his arms. How would you feel about getting your own personal bodyguard? He asked, though it wasn't really a question. Is that allowed? My skin was still crawling where Everett had touched me. Having Ryder around would definitely make me feel a little safer in this house. But I hated the idea of having a babysitter again. I could handle things on my own. Of course it's allowed. You're a leader. You make the rules. Felix's voice was firm, but his eyes were still full of hurt. I found myself wanting to pull him in for a hug and tell him everything was going to be all right. But I settled instead on agreeing to have Ryder as my bodyguard. Good. Now that that's settled, let's call it a night. I followed Felix's eyes across the room and noticed it was significantly emptier than it had been right after the dinner. One by one, our guests were returning home. I'll find Joy. She's my attendant here, and she'll be able to get you set up in a couple of rooms. I reached out to squeeze Felix's shoulder reassuringly, but he bristled under my touch. With a frown, I turned to find some help. The attendant's hall was around the corner from the foyer, just past Everett's office. A soft giggle danced its way out of the dimly lit room as I neared it, and I tiptoed as quietly as I could past the opening. Inside, I saw Everett leading the woman I met earlier in the low-cut black dress toward the secret door. His hand rested casually around the curve of her backside as he gently nudged her into a dark staircase behind the door. I paused to gather what details I could make out about the mysterious room beyond, but Everett turned to close the door behind him, meeting my stare just before it clicked shut. With a dark grin and wink, he disappeared behind it, locking it before the sound of his footfalls vanished down the stairs. I shuddered and scampered off to continue my search for joy. Felix and Ryder were standing right where I'd left them when I returned to the foyer. Joy is making up your beds now. Do you want to come up to my room until she's ready? I can't wait to kick off these shoes. Felix sighed and closed his eyes for a moment. Ryder picked up on his cues instantly and started backing away. You guys go ahead. I'm going to do a quick sweep of the first floor. I'll meet you up there in a bit. Okay, I said with a nod. I reached for Felix's hand to show him the way upstairs, but he pulled it from my grasp. Felix, I... Save it, he said quietly as he fell into step behind me. Once upstairs, he stood just inside my door, hands in his pockets, pain evident across his handsome features. Even with the dark circles kissing his lower eyelids, Felix was strikingly good-looking. I'm glad you came tonight. I would have come sooner if you'd told me where you were going. I didn't know I was coming here. Honestly, I didn't. Felix began pacing in front of my closed door. You had to have had some idea. People don't just wander into the outside and end up living with my father in the district capital by mistake. I tried to go outside. They didn't want me. He paused and snapped his eyes back to me. What do you mean they didn't want you? Outside, my dad, 
the embers. They said they didn't need me there. They wanted me to keep working within the leadership. Why didn't you tell me? Felix took a step in my direction. I would have taken you back in an instant. I would have loved nothing more than to have you working with me again. Why this? Why my father? His hands dropped lifelessly down to his sides with a soft smack. Because I need to find my own way, Felix. Emmeline offered me a position. She didn't give many details, but it was a promotion. If working from the inside is the best way I can help the embers, then I need to climb as high inside as I can. I didn't know I'd be living with your father. How did you find me here anyway? Did Emmeline tell you where I was? Felix shook his head. Your tracker. I whipped my arm behind me and began feeling up and down my back. The tracker you put on me before the exiled attack? How can that be? It was just a sticker. It's a high-powered, waterproof adhesive. It won't come off until you're ready to remove it. And even then it takes a special solvent to remove. So you've been watching me? This whole time? No. I resisted for a long time, but I hadn't heard anything after you left. I had no idea if you'd made it safely or gotten hurt along the way. I looked the day after you left, and you were still in class and city. I held off for a long time, but after several days of no word, I checked again. And you were here, of all places. I didn't know if he'd kidnapped you or— His voice trailed off, and he rubbed his thumb and forefinger across his brows. I just wanted to make sure you were safe. I'm sorry. Well, you should be. You had no right to spy on me. I'm a big girl, and I can handle myself. And you, of all people, should know your dad wouldn't kidnap me. Is it so absurd to think that I made the decision to come here by myself? Felix looked less than certain. He didn't trust his father, and he probably didn't trust my decision-making too much either. Even so, he was full of remorse, as he should have been for tracking me. But I was too angry at him to care. He was no better than the rest of the leaders, with tactics like that. Well, don't just stand there. Get it off of me. I unclasped the dress at the base of my neck and began tugging the zipper as best as I could. He paused, watching me fumble blindly with the closure. Let me help you. Felix pulled the zipper past my shoulder blades, exposing my spine where the tracker still sat attached to my skin. He ran a thumb over the edges of it, sending chill bumps across my skin. He held his breath, causing the beating of our hearts to sound that much louder, echoing in my ears. He pulled a small foil packet from his pocket, ripped the top open, and unfolded a pre-moistened cloth, which he rubbed gently across my skin. Felix didn't want to enjoy this as much as he was, and neither did I. But despite my running off, despite his tracking me, despite his horrible father and the distrust that bubbled between them, between us because of this situation, despite it all, there was no denying how much Felix still cared for me. And despite knowing better than to lean into it, I couldn't help myself. Felix was sweet and tender. I didn't want to give him the wrong idea, but it felt good to be cared for by him. My anger had melted away by the time he finished removing the adhesive. He crumpled the tracking sticker in his hand, stuffed it into the foil packet, and shoved it into the bathroom wastebasket. I was zipped back up and perched on the edge of my bed when he returned. I'm sorry, too. I should have told you when I found out I was coming here. Felix joined me on the bed, resting his hand on my knee. You know you can tell me anything, and I hope you will. Even if it paints a negative light on me or my family, I will do anything to protect you. He meant it, and I believed him to my core. I leaned my head on his shoulder, reveling in the tenderness of the moment, before launching into the plan I'd been silently brewing throughout the evening. Thank you. I'm safe here, especially now that you've sent Ryder to watch over me. I quirked an eyebrow and he flashed a gorgeous white smile. I'll send a whole army if I have to. 
I sat up tall, pulling one knee on the bed as I turned to face him. Speaking of armies, have you heard anything about Justice Hines's plan to eliminate the outsiders back home? Not a word, he replied. She's been wrapped up with some consultant for the last week. I don't think she's had any time to worry about the outsiders at all. What do you know about the consultant? Not much. His name is Conrad Reynolds, and he's from the Supreme Leadership. That's about the extent of my knowledge. Hmm. I deliberated over my next words. Well, since you said I could tell you anything, I'm going to throw out a crazy idea, a suspicion. It's probably unfounded, but I think you might be able to help me clarify something. Of course. What is it? Well, before I left, I saw a couple of men on motorcycles near the Ember Camps outside. I'm pretty sure one of them had the mark of the supreme leadership, and we suspect they might have been scoping out the camps for some reason. What would the supreme leadership want with the Embers? Probably nothing, unless Justice Hines has been feeding them false stories about how dangerous they are. All I know is that I saw his neck, and those tattoos are not easily forgotten. But he was too far for me to make out any details. I think it must have been Conrad, but I'm not sure. Is there any chance you might be able to keep an eye on things for me back home? Absolutely. Thank you. If you see anything fishy or if you notice him going outside, please let me know. I don't have a good feeling about him. There was a gentle knock at the door, followed by a timid voice. Miss Greenwood? Come in, Joy. My attendant cracked the door just enough to peek her head through. The rooms are ready. Would you like me to show your guests there now? Yes, thank you. I squeezed Felix's hand before standing and was relieved to see him respond with a smile. In a lot of ways, Felix was like a giant teddy bear, broad but gentle, kind-hearted and protective, and he always had a way of cheering me up when things looked bleak. Joy pulled the door the rest of the way open, and I saw Ryder standing behind her, looking much more relaxed than he had downstairs. I gave him a smile as well. It would be nice to have another familiar face around here. I followed them into the hall and watched as Joy directed Felix into the same room Rafe had stayed in just a few days earlier. My stomach flipped with a weird sensation that I couldn't name. It wasn't a feeling of guilt, exactly, but it felt wrong to enjoy Felix's company as much as I did. We were only friends, of course, but there was something twisting inside nonetheless, and whatever it was, it shot up with a flutter as he kissed my forehead goodnight. Deep down, a part of me wished Felix could stay here permanently, too. Chapter 14 Felix was already gone when I awoke the next morning. Everett did a good job of arranging his exit at the earliest possible moment. He couldn't have gotten more than a couple hours of sleep before leaving for his flight at dawn, and yet he still took the time to write me a note and slip it under my door. Sorry I was a jerk. I have your back 100%, always. Please call me for anything. I'll be in touch soon. Take care. F. I held the note against my chest, inhaling deeply before sliding it safely in the drawer of my bedside table. Cracking open my bedroom door, I was surprised to see Ryder standing in the hallway talking to Joy. I'd almost forgotten he was staying behind. Good morning. They both startled, turning toward me with wide eyes. Good morning, Joy chirped back. They're cooking omelets downstairs. I was just coming to see if you two are ready for breakfast. I glanced at Ryder, who gave a solemn nod. Joy picked up on the exchange and added, No one else will be joining you this morning. Director Walsh will likely be out until Monday. Oh, where is he gone? Joy pinched her lips together with disapproval before answering. I try not to keep up with the details of his actions, but he's often indisposed on the weekends. After a quick breakfast with Ryder, I decided to take a look around the property outside. The sun was shining, its rays warming my cheeks, as I strolled around the large patio behind the house. I could spot my balcony up above, 
but trees blocked my view of the estate from that high. Down here, I could see a path of stone pavers that led down to a small duck pond in the back of the yard. Perfectly kept flower beds amid the landscaping were just beginning to green up as spring promised to make her arrival. After the fall and winter I'd had, I was ready for some sunshine again. Spring had always been my favorite season. It brought a new sense of purpose each year, new life, new hopes and dreams. It brought healing after the tragedy of my mother's death and the absence of my father. And this year, I hoped it would bring about the change Cato had sacrificed his life for. Too many lives had been taken. It was time for something new to begin. Voices from the side of the yard drew me near the old carriage house where Everett's cars were parked. Asher stood polishing the driver's side mirror of one, laughing with another driver as I approached. Good morning, boys. Good morning, Miss Greenwood. Asher grinned back at me, though his friend didn't look so happy to have company. Asher turned to him and jerked his chin in my direction. This is Claren Greenwood, the leader Joy has been assigned to attend to. Understanding flashed in his friend's eyes, and his shoulders relaxed. Hello, my name is Jeremy Hayes. I shook his extended hand, taking note of his firm grip and calloused skin. He didn't strike me as the kind of man who had been an attendant for long. I imagined this man had spent many hours doing manual labor, sweating hard in the summer heat. Pleasure to meet you, Jeremy. He dipped his head, a bashful smile playing at the corner of his lips. You'll have to excuse my friend here, Miss Greenwood. This is Jeremy's first day on the job. He looked too old to be getting his first placement. Aptitude tests wouldn't be held for another couple of weeks anyway. Oh, where did you work before? I asked. Here and there, he replied, uncertainty creasing his brows. I was a city worker for a long time, mowing grass and keeping the streets clean. But when my wife... He paused to swallow down his emotion. Once my wife was gone, I was moved to handle the yard work here in the center. I came to this property last June to work on the gardens for Director Yoder, but when Director Walsh took over a few weeks ago, I wasn't needed anymore. Director Walsh isn't fond of flowers, Asher explained for his friend. But he likes cars, so we were able to keep old Jeremy here as a backup driver for Director Walsh's guests. The men shared a look that told me there was a lot more that they weren't saying. Joy had mentioned the guests as well. I'd have to ask her to fill me in a little more later. I see. So what's on the agenda for today? Well, Jeremy was taught to drive mowers and lawn equipment, but cars are a little different. He's gotten basic instructions, but we were going to do some hands-on practice today. Director Walsh probably won't be needing us for anything this weekend. They shared the same conspiratorial look as before. Can I come? I haven't gotten to see much of the city. Sure, I guess. Asher glanced up toward the house. Do you need to tell Joy or get that new bodyguard of yours first? No, I don't think so. We're just driving around, right? He shifted nervously. Yeah, that's right. I just don't... Relax, Asher. It'll be fine. I promise to behave. His eyes crinkled in the corners, and with a quick nod, we were on our way. I sat in the back while Asher guided Jeremy from the front. Jeremy was a natural. He didn't require much help at all, and after a few turns around the blocks of the center, we made our way out of the tall walls into the boroughs of Lewisburg. There was an immediate shift in the energy once we crossed over onto the main city streets. The men seemed to tense up front, and my belly danced nervously as I kept my eyes glued to the window. I watched expectantly. For what? I didn't know, but I couldn't shake the feeling that something was coming. We passed citizens on the sidewalks, each one turning to assess the vehicle as it neared them. They would scan the windows, land on my face, and greet me with a sneer or a frown or a scowl every single time. Everyone seems so unhappy here. I looked up to meet Asher's sad gaze in the front seat. It wasn't always this way, he said. 
But everything changed when Walsh joined the leadership a few months ago, and now that he's the director, he trailed off, leaving me to imagine all sorts of scary conclusions to his sentence. I know it's hard to trust the leadership, I said, trying to soothe the tightness in the air, especially once you get an inside look. But the people have kind of brought this upon themselves, haven't they? I mean, they chose to stop working. My stomach twisted tight as I gauged the men's reactions to my words. Jeremy became cold, his knuckles white as he gripped the steering wheel. But Asher was trying to be patient with me. He released a frustrated sigh and instructed Jeremy to take the next right. That's the problem, Claren. The people didn't actually choose anything. They don't decide what work they get to do. They don't decide who to marry or where to live. They have been stripped of everything, and this is the only way they could think to stand up for themselves. I get it, I said. The system isn't perfect, but they try. The jobs are given based on aptitudes. It's the kind of work we are all best suited for. It may not be exactly what you would choose, but it's usually close. And you get food and housing and all of your needs met in return just by showing up and doing the work. To rebel against it puts everyone in a worse situation. The people can't expect to receive the benefits without any work. That wouldn't be fair. Jeremy slammed his hands against the steering wheel and pulled quickly over to the side of the road. She's just like the rest of them. He cut his eyes accusingly over to Asher before turning around to face me. I love to bake. It sounds stupid, but it's the truth, and I'm good at it. I would help my mother as a boy. In fact, I would make most of the breads in her bakery, bread so good that the leaders would drive out themselves to purchase my loaves. But one look at my broad shoulders during the aptitude test had me immediately assigned as a worker, manual labor. They don't care that my spine is curved, and I feel like I'm getting shocked every time I lean down to pull a weed. They don't care about the blisters that grow across my skin from too many hours in the sunlight. They don't care that every day when I go to work, I feel like I'm taking one more day off of my life. I have broad shoulders and muscles, and that's all they saw. I swallowed, bracing myself for the rest of his story. The sorrow in his eyes told me there had to be more. The constant pain from my work made me angry. It turned me into a beast of a man, cruel and mean, unlovable. That's what my wife said when she left, that I was unlovable. She faked her death and escaped to the outside. I would have followed her, but it was easier to pretend she died than to face her with that hatred in her eyes, hatred for the man I became. So no, it isn't fair. None of it is fair. But I refuse to let them kill me by forcing me into a box that isn't meant for me. We deserve better. Jeremy's cheeks were red, his chest heaving. I wiped my eyes before any tears could escape and reached out to touch his shoulder. He jerked his arm away, but I wouldn't let it go. I'm sorry. I know that doesn't do anything to erase your pain. But I am truly sorry. I wanted to tell him about my dad. I wanted to let him know that I understood how it felt to lose someone to the outside, to have someone you love chased away by an unfair system. But this wasn't my turn to share. He deserved to have his story heard. Do you see that building up on the right? Asher pointed to a solid gray warehouse behind a chain-link fence. The lot surrounding it was barren, lifeless, with piles of dirt and a few pieces of trash blowing up in tiny twists of air. That was a food bank. Director Yoder understood our rebellion. She understood that the system needed to be reworked. She sympathized with us and agreed that we should be given more choice in how we live our lives. When the people stopped working, she arranged this food bank so we could survive. The portions were small and the food was bland, but it kept us alive. What happened to it? I asked. Walsh discovered it. Director Yoder was found dead two days later, and Walsh took her place. The day he stepped into office, a mysterious gas leaked in the food bank. 
It left everyone within a block of here sick and gasping for air. Those within the building didn't make it. The food was all destroyed, and this fence was immediately constructed to keep people away. They say it's hazardous now, and no one is supposed to step foot on the premises. I lifted the handle of my door. Miss Greenwood, stop. What are you doing? It was too late. I was already out of the car. Asher moved to open his door and join me, but Jeremy grabbed him by the arm. I could hear him yelling at Asher to not be foolish through the windows. I wasn't being foolish. I just wanted to understand. Because if what Asher told me was true, I was living with a murderer. I stepped closer to the property. I wouldn't cross over the fence, but I wanted to examine the building to see if there was any chance this could have been a true accident. I wasn't hopeful, but I had to know. Anger bubbled inside with each step I took. It started deep and rose, hot like fire as it reached my chest. This wasn't right at all. I stood on the corner, peering through the diamonds crisscrossing the fence, attempting to get a better angle through the one door on this side. It was slightly ajar, with yellow caution tape draped across it. In my periphery, a flash of darkness moved across the street. I turned to see what it was, but the street was empty. Carefully, I inched closer to the road, and in the reflection of the broken glass of a building on the other side, I saw it again. The dark silhouette of a man, hooded and still, waiting and watching me. My chest was burning now, angry and afraid. I turned back to the car, moving more quickly when I saw another figure. This second man was moving fast, really fast. He sprinted toward me, and I froze. He would definitely reach me before I could get to the car. But if I ran in the opposite direction, the other man would get me. I only had one choice, and it was probably just as deadly. I turned and jumped on the fence, forcing the toes of my boots through its small openings. Clarence, stop! I looked back toward the voice and noticed the man running toward me carried a gun. But he wasn't pointing it at me. He had it aimed across the street at the other shadowy figure. Ryder? Get down from there. Go back to the car. What are you? Don't you dare touch her. My eyes snapped across the street before I could finish my sentence. A familiar feeling washed over me, pushing through the fear and relaxing me with its melody. Rafe? He emerged from the shadows, carrying a large stick. Oh, Rafe, no. Stop! I jumped down from the fence and ran out into the middle of the road, placing myself squarely between the men with hands extended to both sides, as though I could do anything to really keep them apart. They were close enough now that I was able to make out both of their faces. Ryder, with his handsome features twisted in fury, arms extended, crouched down with the look of an assassin, and Rafe, who had to know he couldn't win with a stick in a gunfight, but was ready to die trying, willing to sacrifice his life to protect me. My heart hammered hard against my ribs at the sight of him. Please, drop your weapons. There are no enemies here. Neither moved their arms. They slowly circled around me, eyes focused on the other. I felt as though I was caught in some twisted mirror, two forces of strength and fury facing off, tall and strong, with matching dark hair. Ryder was filled out a bit more from daily strength training, but Rafe's eyes were wild. I learned long before from watching Cato that you should never count out the crazy one, no matter what he was up against. I'm serious, guys. Drop it! I put my hands on my hips, irritated that neither trusted me enough to believe that I was safe. Eventually, they each lowered their weapons. Ryder, meet Rafe. Rafe, Ryder. Chapter 15 We're all on the same side here. I dropped my hands in exasperation. They continued to watch each other closely with narrowed eyes. Ryder is a protector, and he's been assigned as my personal security. I spoke to Rafe first. 
something about the look on his face told me he'd be the first to come unhinged. I needed to de-escalate this situation quickly. Yeah, I recognize him. I just don't trust him. He was with you and Dax when you got attacked by the exiled. I ignored Ryder's twitchy trigger finger and placed my hands on Rafe's shoulders, projecting what little calm I could muster. A lot has changed since then. Ryder is on our side. He saved my life, and I know that he'd do it again. He's even worked to help the Embers. I promise, he's good. Once I trusted Rafe not to attack, I turned to Ryder. Rafe is my friend from Morton. He helps lead one of the Ember camps now. You mean when he's not being knocked out by the exiled? We never would have gotten attacked that day if it wasn't for him snooping around when we were trying to do our jobs. This wasn't going well. Look, guys, we've all made mistakes, but I think we've all learned from them as well. Put your weapons away and let's take a walk. I need explanations for why you're both here scaring me to death in the middle of Lewisburg, and I'd like to discuss it away from our audience. They followed my glance back to the car where Asher and Jeremy stared wide-eyed and open-mouthed, faces nearly pressed against the front windshield. I gave them a thumbs up and mouthed that I was okay before turning and walking in the opposite direction. Rafe and Ryder followed, thankfully. You first, I said with an angry glare toward Ryder. I was hired to protect you. That's what I was doing. Forgive me if I overreacted to the dark hooded figure waiting for you in the alleyway. He cut his eyes over to Rafe, who clenched his jaw. How'd you even know where I was? There are trackers on the vehicles. Joy saw you climb in and let me know. I followed you, but I couldn't catch up until the car stopped. Ugh. I took a deep breath and tried not to be angry about being tracked again. It wasn't Ryder's fault. He was doing his job but I didn't like it. And you, I said, elbowing Rafe in the side harder than I'd intended. What's your excuse? Ember business. I rolled my eyes. That excuse was getting old. Really, he insisted. We have some things to talk about later. He eyed Ryder warily. When we can talk privately. Whatever you have to say, you might as well spit it out. I'm not leaving Claren alone with you. Ryder stared Rafe down as we turned around the block. A few citizens were loping around on the street up ahead, so I slowed my pace to a stop. If this was about the embers, we wouldn't want to discuss it within earshot of anyone else. It's okay, Rafe. I took his hand into mine, ignoring the flutter in my chest as I did. He's here to help. I trust him. His Adam's apple bobbed as he deliberated. There have been reports from other camps. They've seen the same strange motorcycle men creeping around. How many? I asked. Two others, but I'm sure they've scoped out other camps as well and gone undetected. Any idea what they're up to yet? Have the embers noticed anything missing? No, nothing else is off at all but I guarantee there's something bigger going on here. How strange. I turned to Ryder and gave him a brief rundown of what we saw as we made our way back to the car. Well, it sounds like we need to figure out what the Supreme Leadership might want with them, Ryder said. And how am I supposed to do that? His brows pulled together. Through the only contact you have. I stopped, my frown matching his. Everett. He nodded. Rafe, aware of the apprehension I was feeling, turned to face me, concern tugging at the corners of his perfect pout. I'll explain later, I said. Let's get back to the house. With a yank of the door handle, I popped my head into the vehicle to face my two very surprised drivers. You guys know Ryder, right? Well, this is Rafe. I jerked my chin toward the guy standing behind me. Do you mind if they squeeze in for a ride back to the house? Jeremy's forehead wrinkled. But what? Don't ask questions. Driver rules 101, Asher interrupted. Of course, Miss Greenwood. Climb in. Back at the house, Ryder relaxed enough to let Rafe and me chat privately in my room. 
although I'm sure he remained alert and waiting in the hallway. You know, you could have just mailed me a letter about the sidings. I toyed with the edge of my coverlet. We faced each other, cross-legged on the floor. It seemed easier to ignore my feelings for him this way. Sitting on the bed seemed too personal, too intimate. I didn't want personal and intimate. I could have, yes, but that would have made the next part of my mission pretty difficult. Oh, yeah? And what's that? Recruiting. For the embers? He nodded. I leaned forward on my knees, excitement prickling my skin. Finally, I might get some real work to do here. So there are camps outside of Lewisburg? It's likely. Wait. Likely? Who are you going to recruit if you aren't even sure about camps in the area? Well, that's part of the mission, too. I need to locate the outside camps and then get them on board with the Embers goals. We'll need a home base around here. But you don't know if there are friendly outsiders here at all right now? I'm sure there are. But you don't know? Not for certain. And what about the camp you were placed in charge of outside of Classen City? Are they going to be okay while you search for something that may not exist here? I didn't mean to be rude, but this was all feeling like another excuse for him to watch over me, and I was clear about not wanting that. He had more important work to do back home. I refused to fawn over boys like a little girl in love when there were lives that needed to be saved and laws that needed to be changed. Being together now wasn't a good idea for either of us. Marissa has everything under control back home. Marissa. I hated the jealousy that still threatened to choke me at the sound of her name. I'm sure she does. I bit my tongue to stop myself from saying more and sounding petulant. And where are you going to stay while you're searching for these camps that may not exist? I'll find somewhere, he said, standing abruptly. I stood, too, crossing my arms. He couldn't really have expected me to put him up here in the house, not with Everett around. That would have been crazy. And I told him I would not have him babysitting me here. I don't know why you're so angry, Claren. I thought you'd be happy to have some company around. I don't need company. I need a mission of my own. If you're really here to recruit for the Embers, please do it quickly. I'm going to lose it if I don't get something productive to do here soon. The look on his face was melting through my wall, rendering my anger as weak as an ice cube on a hot summer day. Stop looking at me like that, I said. The corner of his mouth pulled up. Did he know how his crooked grin slayed me? He did now, stupid empathic abilities. Rafe took a slow step forward, really playing up the effect he knew he had on me. You're cute when you're mad. Stop, I suppressed my smile. He froze in place, lifting both hands in front of his chest. As you wish. He dropped his chin a fraction of an inch, his eyes staring straight through my defenses. His chest rose and fell with slow, steady breaths, and I wanted to touch it, to hold him against me. But it wasn't good for us. I couldn't forget. Good luck with your mission, Rafe. His gaze fell to my lips, his longing to kiss me so thick I could feel it. Or was that my longing to be kissed? I'll find you as soon as I have something to report, he said. I'm counting on it. Everett finally emerged from the secret room beyond his office on Monday morning. It was too bad, really. I'd rather enjoyed not seeing him around the house. He was alone, no sign of the woman in the black dress. He offered no explanation for where he'd been or what he'd been doing for the last two days, and I didn't dare ask. We finished a quick, cordial breakfast and left for my first day of work at the Lewisburg City Hall. Several familiar faces greeted me as I walked the halls toward my new office. Many I recognized from my party. Probably half of the leaders we passed held a certain degree of respect for Everett. The other half almost seemed to fear him. 
they tucked themselves around corners or into offices as he neared, glancing timidly out into the hall at me as we passed. I wondered how many of them suspected foul play after the previous director's disappearance. How many of them thought I might be just like him? Everett held a large corner office on the top floor. It was exquisitely decorated. A plush black leather couch and two armchairs welcomed us into a sitting area just inside the door. An oversized wood desk sat near the window, and a very well-stocked bar cart sat just beside it. We were on the eighth floor, so the floor-to-ceiling corner windows provided us a line of sight over the enormous center walls and out into the real world of the city beyond. "'You're welcome to spend your days in here with me if you choose,' Everett said with a smile. "'But I've also outfitted an office space for you just next door. Would you like to see it?' He led me through the doors into a quaint, extremely feminine office, about a quarter of the size of his. I didn't mind the size. I didn't need much space. But the decor was over the top. A fuzzy pink office chair sat behind a shiny white desk. On the desk was an enormous arrangement of white peonies in a crystal vase that sent a dizzying array of rainbows dancing off the pale pink walls from the sunlight shining through the window. The scent of the flowers was overwhelming in such a small space, and they took up most of the desk space. Thank you, Director Walsh. It's lovely. I'd really prefer it if you called me Everett, he said with a wink. I'm going to leave you here to get acquainted with your new space while I go take a phone call. Barbara will be up after lunch to speak with you about some upcoming events. She's my assistant here but feel free to borrow her if you need help with anything. If you come across something that's too difficult or out of reach for you girls, just call me. I'm known for saving the day around here. He tapped the door frame twice before making a dramatic exit. I stood in front of the window, admiring the view and enjoying the warmth of the sunlight trickling in. Don't worry. I whispered to the thousands of people who couldn't hear me beyond the center walls. I'll make things better for you. Shoving the vase over to the side of my desk, I sat to check out the desk drawers. Pens, pencils, a pair of scissors, and a notepad sat in the top drawer. The second drawer held four different shades of lipstick. The bottom drawer, designed for hanging files, sat empty. This wasn't a job. This was a joke. Excuse me, Miss Greenwood? I snapped my eyes up to a timid, middle-aged woman standing in my doorway. You must be Barbara. I'm sorry I wasn't expecting you until after lunch. I'm not here for the party planning yet. I only came to deliver this package that just came in for you. Her eyes were wide as she scanned my office. She clearly seemed taken aback and uncomfortable. I like what you've done with the place, she added unconvincingly. Oh, I... never mind. Thank you. I accepted the small parcel from the woman and set it on my desk. You're welcome. I'll see you after lunch. She turned on the spot and quickly skittered out of the office. Sliding my new gold-handled scissors along the taped edge of the box, I anxiously pushed the flaps aside to discover a black rectangular device the size of my palm. The smooth glass front resembled a cell phone, only smaller and more square. Beneath the device sat a note, and this time I recognized the penmanship immediately. Emilio made this so we can communicate. There's a button on the back. Hold it down for three seconds tonight at seven o'clock. I'll be waiting for you. F. Chapter 16 I bounced impatiently on the edge of my bed at ten minutes before seven. Lying back with a huff, I inspected the device again. It was simple, a thin black body with a flat glass screen on one side and nothing but the single button on its matte metal back. My finger danced over the button, unsure of what would happen if I pushed it early. Probably nothing. But not being able to push the button yet only made me want to do it more. 
I slid my finger around the edge of the circle, round and round, until I couldn't take it anymore. Click. Nothing happened. I sat up and glanced at the clock on my wall. Eight minutes until seven. Close enough. I clicked the button again and held it for the full three seconds this time, just as I was instructed. The device blinked to life, and Felix's face smiled back at me. I knew you wouldn't be able to wait until seven, he said with a grin. His blue eyes sparkled. I hadn't noticed it the other day, but his sparkle was missing when he was here in his father's house. The thought of Everett snuffing out Felix's natural joy made my chest ache. You caught me, I returned his smile. Behind him, I could make out the edges of the bookshelves in his study. The warm glow of the fireplace reflected off of his cheek and created golden shimmering highlights in his straw-colored hair. Oh, how I wished I could be sitting in the comfy armchair across from him instead of locked up at his father's house. These are so cool! I pulled the device closer as I admired how clear the picture was. Felix looked real enough to touch. His laughter startled me. Thanks for the close-up. I like seeing the green flecks in your eyes. The pink spreading across his cheeks matched the warmth I felt in my own. I batted my eyelashes playfully at him a couple of times. The sound of his laughter was nice. I hadn't heard much laughter lately. So, let's get to business. He nodded. I asked around about Conrad. He spends most of his time with Justice Hines, as we knew. But one of the guards mentioned he goes down to interrogate Milo every day as well. Milo? How is he still alive? I figured Justice Hines would have done away with him a long time ago. Felix swallowed. I think she's still questioning him about the others. The other exiled? He shook his head with a frown. The other outsiders. She knows there are still a lot of them out there, and she's using Milo to track them down. And now she's using Conrad, too? I just don't understand why he would care. It all seems beneath the supreme leadership. She may just be trying to prove her worth, make him see why she's made the decisions she has lately. The leadership hasn't been happy with her. Citizens aren't sure what to make of her anymore when they see her on the evening programming. This might be her last-ditch effort to keep her position. Maybe. But if Conrad has been interrogating Milo about the Outsiders, then I'm almost certain that was him I saw on the motorcycle near the Ember Camps. Do you think he's working with Justice Hines? Or if there are any plans to destroy the camps? They would have to run that by you first, right? They can't just attack without your consent. They're not supposed to. But Conrad outranks me as a part of the Supreme Leadership. If he's involved, they could do anything they wanted. I rubbed the heels of my hands into my eyes and inhaled deeply. Tell James. Ask him to get word out to the camps. Just let them know that there's a good possibility an attack is coming their way. They'll need to put up extra patrols and have their weapons ready. I bit my lip, trying to think of anything else I could do to help from here. And Felix, please make sure my dad knows. James will know how to get in touch with him, I think. Felix nodded solemnly. I will. Even through the screen, I could see that he was sincere. I just hoped it would be enough. How are things there? He asked. Anything to report? I recognized the look on his face. He'd switched to his politician mask. But under his businesslike inquiry, his muscles were tight with concern. His sparkle was cloudy. Your dad is behaving himself, if that's what you're asking. The corner of his mouth perked up. Good. He'd better. Though our conversation had reached its natural end, it was clear neither of us was quite ready to hang it up. We lingered a moment longer before Felix spoke again. Let's talk next week at the same time. If anything noteworthy happens before then, I'll call the house and let you know. Deal. I'm looking forward to it. Me too, he said with a soft smile. Once the screen went dark again, I set out to find Ryder. I wanted to update him on what Felix said, but he wasn't in his room. 
I padded down the stairs and nearly crashed right into him as I swung around the corner of the foyer into the hall. There you are, I exclaimed, a little breathless from rushing down the stairs. I need to talk to you. Shh, Ryder put a finger up to his mouth. Something wasn't right, and I was kicking myself for not noticing it in my haste. His jaw was rigid, his muscles tense. He grabbed my hand and pulled me back toward the foyer with the quiet grace of a cat. He whispered as we tiptoed along. Everett has been dr- Claren? I froze. Everett peeked around the corner with a childish grin. His cheeks were red and his hair was slightly disheveled. Did I hear you say you wanted to talk? I knew he was drunk by the laziness of his tongue as he worked to over-enunciate each syllable. He cut his eyes over to Ryder and jerked his head for him to get lost with all the subtlety of an elephant at a tea party. I inched closer to Ryder, very aware now of the threat that stood across from us. Even in his inebriated state, Everett looked to get me alone wasn't encouraging. In fact, his inebriation only made it worse. Come, my dear, let's go talk privately in my office. Ryder moved first, practically gluing himself to my side as he nudged me toward Everett. He was making a statement. It was easier to go along with Everett's suggestion without making a scene, but Ryder was going with me, and I'd never been happier to have him there. I fell into step beside Ryder, but Everett frowned as we neared him. Don't you have somewhere to be, boy? My orders are to stay with Claren at all times, sir. Your orders from whom? Me. Those are his orders from me, his direct superior, I interrupted. Well, seeing as how I am superior to both of you, I am relieving you of your duties tonight, Ryder. In fact, I insist you take the night off. Run along. Everett shooed him away with a wave of his hand, the playful grin from earlier, now replaced by something darker flickering in his eyes. Ryder hesitated a beat too long, causing Everett to raise his voice to just short of a boom. Go, he demanded. Ryder glanced at me with sorrow in his eyes. I lifted my chin enough to let him know that I'd be okay. I could handle a drunken Everett. Probably. A hungry grin spread across Everett's face as Ryder stepped around the corner leaving us alone. His stormy eyes settled on me, bloodshot bolts of red streaking through the corners. The whiskey on his breath was so strong, I began to feel a little heady myself. Was secondhand inebriation a thing? Or was this sick swirling nausea I felt just a side effect of being an empath around a drunk? He stumbled forward, settling his hand low on the backside of my hip as he guided me into his dimly lit office. I willed myself not to look at the door behind his desk. I wasn't interested in its secrets anymore. I just wanted to go back to my room. Spinning toward his bookshelf, I feigned interest in one of the titles sitting upon the shelf. The Gilded Mask of a Leader, I read aloud. Sounds fascinating. I don't know that I'd call it fascinating, though it has proven to be useful. Oh, how so? I slid my finger along the spines of the other hardbacks lining his shelf. Everett liked to be in control, and I was beginning to learn that he fed off of fear. If I wanted to get out of here untouched, I'd have to stay casual, bury my fear, and keep his mind on other things. Work seemed a safe topic. Well, the Supreme Leadership has actually requested a meeting with me this week. It seems we made a strong impression for Madame George at your party the other night. I fly out on Wednesday. I froze. Did this have anything to do with me? Had Conrad enlisted Cynthia George to work with Everett against me? It was all way too much involvement with the supreme leadership for my taste. How marvelous! It was difficult to keep my voice steady. You must be doing very well to draw their attention. We are doing very well. Madame George was quite taken by you. 
Everett stepped behind me so close that I could feel his hot breath on the back of my neck. I was caught between him and the bookshelf, unable to move. I couldn't even see the doorway from where I stood. My game was up. He leaned in and whispered in my ear. His lips tickled my lobe as he spoke and sent a revolting shudder down my spine. As am I. I knew we would make an excellent team. His dry, rough finger trailed a line from behind my ear, down my neck, and across my shoulder. Now, about that room you wanted to explore. Claren, Ryder's voice was gravelly from over my shoulder. Everett's body tensed at the sound of it, his breath picking up into loud, angry huffs. I asked you to run along. He slowly moved away from me, and I thought I might crumple to the floor with the way the tension dissipated from my tight muscles. I apologize, sir. Joy has Miss Greenwood's bath ready, and she asked me to notify her. The control in Ryder's tone was amazing. His fury was red hot. I could feel his rage, stronger than my fear, stronger than Everett's desire. It was a wonder he hadn't already run over here and eliminated him with his bare hands. I'd already taken two steps away from him as Everett turned back to me. I don't think you need a bath tonight, do you? The look on his face said he'd already decided my evening for me. Actually, I began walking to join Ryder in the doorway. A bath sounds lovely after a long day of work. You remember how stressful a first day on the job can be, I'm sure. I forced a smile and tilted my head innocently in his direction. Perhaps we can talk again another night, after your trip? His eyes grew hungry again. Of course I didn't want to meet up with him tonight or any other night, but I would need to learn more about his meeting with the Supreme Leadership. Very well. We'll make it a date when I return. Enjoy your bath. His eyes dropped from mine and lingered on my body. Ryder took my wrist and pulled me behind him as though Everett could see right through my clothes. We've got to get you out of this house, Ryder whispered as we dashed up the stairs. I'll call Felix immediately. No, don't tell Felix. I couldn't hurt him like that. His relationship with his father was broken enough as it was. We have to stay here a little longer. I'm getting close to some information we need, information about the Supreme Leadership. Can you keep me safe just a little while longer? I can definitely try, he said grimly. Chapter 17 Joy! I skipped down the stairs, my hand gliding along the slick banister as I went. The air in the house felt lighter with Everett gone. There was more laughter, brighter spirits from the staff. I'd given them all some time off while he was away, but most of them stayed at the house. We weren't sure exactly when he'd be back, but our two days of freedom had been well enjoyed so far. Even Barbara at the office had a little more pep in her step than usual, and tonight I decided I was going to prepare a picnic for Joy and myself to enjoy. The sun was shining, and a warm breeze was softly blowing through the new green leaves dotting the trees across the estate. It was the perfect weather for dinner outdoors. Joy! I called again. She wasn't upstairs, so I turned down the attendance hall, hoping I'd find her on my way toward the kitchen. Empty. The entire mansion seemed to be completely devoid of people. Where was everyone? The muffled sound of cheering drew my attention down the long hall, away from the kitchen, and back toward the carriage house. I quickened my steps and pulled open the painted steel door that served as an attendant's entrance out onto the grounds. Shielding my eyes from the sunlight, I took in an unusual sight. Several female attendants sat along the steps leading down from the house. They cheered and hollered at two men circling each other in the gravel between the main house and the carriage house. There were too many people crowded in a huddle watching the men for me to make out who they were, but I could definitely tell they were fighting. I pushed my way down the steps and spotted Joy and Asher whooping along with the crowd. Joy! 
What is going on? She turned to me with taut cheeks and wide, guilty eyes. I, uh... Asher grinned widely beside her, casually throwing his arm over her shoulder as he leaned closer to me and said, Your boys are fighting. Ryder clearly has better training, but my money's on Rafe. He's scrappy. What? I shoved my way toward the middle of the circle, attendants and several strangers, parting as they realized who I was. Two tall men stood panting in the center. Rafe was turned away from me, shirtless, sweat glistening on his sinewy back. Ryder stood across from him, determination set on his face. Before he noticed I was there, he lunged forward, swinging a powerful fist up at Rafe's jaw. Stop it! Rafe ducked and thrust his shoulder into Ryder's waist, propelling them both back into the onlookers. Guys, knock it off! Ryder twisted, throwing Rafe's balance off and wrenching an arm between them for leverage. Then, too fast for me to make out what was happening, he pulled Rafe up over his back and slammed his body down onto the gravel. No! I threw myself into the circle to get in between them, but Ryder beat me to Rafe. He extended his arm, which Rafe willingly accepted, and pulled him back to his feet. They both wiped the sweat dripping into their eyes and then pulled each other into a salty, wet handshake of sorts, with tired smiles and claps on the back. The crowd clapped and cheered, and I spotted Jeremy watching me with a smirk from across the circle. Frowning at him, I turned back to the fighters. I demand a rematch, Wraith said through heavy breaths. Ryder flashed a rare smile. If you insist, but I'm not going to take it easy on you next time. Ha! They turned to face me, completely unalarmed by the steely gaze I set on them. You boys have some explaining to do. Jeremy let out a whistle and started backing away. Uh-uh, you stay here too, and Asher. I turned back to find him and Joy watching anxiously from the sidelines and motioned for them to come forward. The rest of you can go. The remaining attendants and their friends dispersed, murmuring about how they were all going to be in trouble. But they weren't the ones I was angry with. I turned back to Rafe and Ryder, hands on my hips. What was that? We were just messing around, Rafe said. His breathing had finally slowed, and he held a crooked grin, playing up his boyish charm. But it wasn't working on me this time. No. I pointed my finger at him. You're not even supposed to be here. I want to hear it from Ryder. His smile had faded, but Ryder's eyes still danced with amusement. Unless Rafe was planning to attack me, I can't think of a single good reason why I would find the head of my security out here fighting with him. Jeremy rolled his eyes and spoke before Ryder could answer. They told you they were just messing around head of your security or not, maybe they still want to have a little fun. It's not always about you. Hey, relax. Asher held his hands out to Jeremy, as if he could physically tamp down his annoyance with me. We were just killing some time, Miss Greenwood. We didn't mean to upset you. By fighting? I dropped my hands in exasperation. We weren't fighting, Ryder spoke at last. Not really, anyway. Just working to keep our skills sharp. Rafe is actually pretty tough for a sanitation office worker. There was humor in his tone. Former sanitation office worker, Rafe corrected with a grin. Since when were these two so friendly? That still doesn't explain what you're doing here in the first place. I turned pointedly toward Rafe, but Joy was the one who answered. We put him up in the carriage house, she explained. There was an unused storage room in there. Director Walsh has never set foot in the carriage house, so we thought it was a safe place for him to stay. Until I can establish a home base outside, Rafe shrugged. You said I wasn't invited to stay in the main house. I sighed and glanced warily over at Jeremy, who still stood with a smug smile. He enjoyed watching me lose control of the situation. I cut my eyes back over to Rafe with an expression that I hoped he understood to mean, shut up. This wasn't the time or the place to be discussing the embers and outside camps. 
It's okay, Rafe said, as though he could read my mind. They know. I tried to remain expressionless, though I knew Rafe could feel my shock. Why couldn't he hear me mentally screaming at him to keep quiet? They know what? They know about the embers. There was no way I was able to prevent my eyes from widening at his words. What was he doing? A nervous giggle escaped my throat as I glanced around the circle. Everyone stared back at me with serious expressions. Everyone, except Jeremy. He rolled his eyes. You know, it wouldn't hurt for you to be a little more honest with us. You'd be a lot more likable if you let the staff see whose side you're really on. You have no idea what you're talking about. Jeremy scoffed. Right, because I'm just a lowly worker instead of a leader. No, because you think you understand me, but you don't have a clue. There is a lot more going on behind the scenes that you could ever comprehend. I didn't realize how loud I was getting until Rafe put his hand on my arm. Claren? I tried to shake him off. I didn't want him projecting his calmness into me. I was mad at him, too. But he wrapped his fingers around my elbow, gentle but firm. I told them, because I need their help. We can't do this alone. Jeremy was frowning, but the others looked hopeful. And how are they going to help? I asked. They can get me outside. They can help me find some camps. They believe in the Embers' philosophy, probably even more than some of the Embers do. They're committed. Asher stepped forward, his fingers entwined with joys. This is the first time I've ever had any real hope for my future. He looked at Joy. For our future. I'll do whatever you ask, whatever it takes, and I think you'll be surprised at how many others in Lewisburg will back you up as well. Thank you, Asher, but we can't spread the news in the city, not yet. Director Walsh won't hesitate to eliminate anyone who threatens his power here. We need to build a strong outside presence first, increase our numbers. And sharpen our defenses, Ryder added, which is what you stumbled upon today. We're training. All of us, Asher stepped forward. Even me, Jeremy said. I may not know how to wield a gun, but give me a shovel and I'm unstoppable. I smiled. Their determination was palpable. And like Asher, I began to feel a glimmer of hope as well. So what about me? Do I get to train too? Rafe grinned. I'll give you as much one-on-one -on -one training as you want. Ryder rolled his eyes and Asher chuckled. I'll take whatever I can get. When do we start? Chapter 18 We only got in one day of training before Everett returned. It was a basic review of self-defense, blocking and punching, lunging and evading, but it was enough to leave my thighs and upper arms burning with soreness the following day. It was pathetic how little physical exertion I'd had since my promotion. Kata would have been disappointed in me. Not that I could get out of the house much with Everett back. His presence brought what felt like a stifling fog throughout the house. The lights appeared dimmer, voices were softer. Everyone was on edge when he was around, even more so now that we shared a secret, a secret that he would abhor. If he killed off everyone working at the food bank his predecessor set up, I had no doubt that he'd do the same to us. Everett couldn't handle the thought of losing his power. He had to keep our plans to grow the Ember Presence in Lewisburg a secret. Growing it wasn't proving to be very easy either, even without Everett's knowledge. Rafe had gone outside every day since Everett's return, and after twelve or more hours of exploring, he returned every day shaking his head. No camps, no outsiders anywhere. Jeremy insisted they existed, and he really believed it. I could feel it. But I worried that he'd constructed some utopian world outside in his imagination, just to ease the pain of his wife leaving. What if there truly weren't any outside camps in the Lewisburg area? Or worse, what if the few outsiders that remained had all been killed off by the exiled? The thought left me on pins and needles every day when Rafe would leave. 
As much as I pretended not to have feelings for him, the thought of him not returning ripped at my heart every morning when I watched him go, and my insides remained twisted in anxiety until I watched him return to the carriage house every night. I'd wait for him there, with leftovers from dinner that Joy helped me sneak out of the kitchen. But every night, it was the same news. Monday afternoon, I sat in my office at City Hall, drumming my fingers impatiently on my desk. The same worries plagued me, but at work, I didn't have anything to do but sit and dwell on them. Barbara knocked on the door, providing a needed distraction. "'Miss Greenwood, I'm sorry to bother you, but we've just received a message from your staff at the house. There seems to be a problem they need your help with right away.' "'What kind of problem?' I was already packing up my things and preparing to leave, but I had no idea what to expect back home. They didn't say, Would you like me to notify Director Walsh and see if he can be of any assistance? No, there's no need to interrupt him. I'll fill him in on whatever the issue is tonight at supper. Thank you, Barbara. You're welcome, ma'am. I'll have them bring your car around. The car was electrified with Asher's excited energy when I climbed in. What's going on? He subtly shook his head. Someone must have been listening in. I clamped my lips shut and allowed him to speak. Joy needs your assistance with a wardrobe malfunction. Your formal gown was somehow ruined in the laundry. You'll need to order a new one immediately if you want it to be ready for the dinner Director Walsh has scheduled for Friday night. His voice was almost robotic, uniform, and monotone. Evidently, Asher shared my acting abilities, or lack thereof. I see. I kept my mouth shut the rest of the way home. Asher's smirk was barely perceptible, but I didn't need to see it to understand something bigger was going on, something pretty major by the feel of it. I pushed my door open as soon as the car rolled to a stop back at Everett's house. Asher jumped out as well, pulling me into the carriage house by my wrist. Come on he urged. I gasped at the sight inside. Rafe looked like he'd been through hell and back. He held an ice pack to his head. His upper lip was swollen and encrusted with dried blood, and both eyes were already darkening into sickening shades of purple and blue. Rafe! I rushed to his side, but he just looked up at me with a stupid grin on his beaten face. What happened? He found them. Asher lifted onto the balls of his feet, barely able to contain his excitement. Even Joy was suppressing a small smile as she tended to a cut on Rafe's eyebrow. Found who? The outsiders, Rafe said. All of them. I turned an empty bucket over across from him and sat so he could elaborate. I haven't been able to find anyone before now because they are all together in one enormous camp. It's huge, Claren, probably half the size of Lewisburg at least. What did they do to you? I didn't care how many of them there were if they were hostile. Rafe shook off my question. I'm fine, but listen, there are probably thousands of people in this camp. Men, women, children. Rafe, you're hurt. Please tell me what happened to you. He was startled, taken aback by my concern. Then the corner of his mouth twitched, and I instantly regretted revealing how much I cared. Though it's not like he didn't already know. I was a horrible liar, and he was a very skilled empath. He took my hand into his, and his eyes softened. They're very defensive, and rightfully so. They don't take kindly to newcomers, and I wasn't referred in by anyone, so they had no way to know if I was a friend or a foe. So they hurt you? Not at first, but they thought I was lying about who I was, and they didn't want to hear any false hope out of me. Eventually, their leader came out and determined I wasn't a risk. He just thought I was crazy. He ordered his men to leave me alone and told me to get out. I'm sure he won't be so kind if you go back again. Rafe shook his head. He made sure I knew I wasn't welcome back again. That's why I need to get Frank out here. He's the diplomat, not me. Well, you can't go back to Classen City in this shape. Let's get you rested and healed for a couple of days. Then you can go get him. Or, actually... I bit the inside of my lip, 
debating on whether or not I should let them know about my communication with Felix. We were set to talk again that night, and I could have Felix get word out to Frank. But somehow, mentioning Felix to Rafe made me uncomfortable. It was silly. Felix was just a friend, and technically, so was Rafe. Just a really attractive friend, and a great kisser. Actually, what? Rafe asked. I've got an appointment to talk to someone in Class and City tonight. He's a friend of the Embers. I'll ask him to send Frank out here. It'll be much more efficient than you driving all the way back. And who is this friend of the Embers? Rafe studied me, his deep brown eyes almost black. Felix, I said quietly. Rafe nodded slowly, but he didn't inquire further. I was certain he knew of my involvement with Felix, though we'd never spoken of it. Felix Walsh, as in Director Walsh's son? Asher gaped at me. Yes, but I promise he's on our side. Joy touched Asher's arm. He seemed friendly enough when he stayed after Clarence's party, and he brought us Ryder. Asher still looked uncertain. If you say so. Speaking of Ryder, where is he? I glanced around the carriage house to make sure I hadn't missed him somehow. He was good at staying hidden in the shadows. He's running an errand in town. He should be back soon. Joy locked eyes for a fraction of a second with Rafe, and I got the feeling there was something they weren't telling me. Come on, Rafe said, standing. I need to keep moving before my limbs get stiff and the soreness sets in. We sauntered out into the garden, following a winding path through the shrubs and flower beds. Spring was kind to Everett's estate. The garden breathed new life into the place, making it feel almost alive with magic. Or maybe that was the hope bubbling up from most of us who resided here. How do you think they've gone undetected for so long out there? If their camp is as large as you say it is, surely the leadership here is aware of it. I can't imagine Everett would let something like that exist outside of his control. From what I understand, the leadership hasn't always been so harshly opposed to outsiders here. You mean, Director Yoder? Rafe nodded. She probably turned a blind eye as the camp grew in size, and now they're so large, I don't think the protectors of Lewisburg would stand a chance against them. Actually, knowing the people around here, I bet most of the protectors would jump to their side if given the chance. That may be true for now, but I can't imagine Everett is going to ignore them for long. I'm worried he may not be able to ignore you for long either. Rafe slowed and reached for my hand, but I pulled it away from him. What do you mean? I haven't given him any reason to suspect I'm not completely on his side. I'm not worried about him suspecting your involvement with the Embers. I'm more worried about him trying other things with you. I narrowed my eyes at him. I'll be fine. I told you before. I can handle myself. I hope so. Rafe's mouth pulled into a frown, and his lips puffed into even more of a pout than normal because of the swelling. Ryder said it gets pretty bad sometimes especially when he's been drinking. Well, Ryder can mind his own business, I huffed and picked up my pace to the house. Claren, Rafe sighed. We are just looking out for you. You never can be too careful around someone named Walsh. I hated the way that name sounded coming from Rafe's mouth, and the jealousy that soured his tone wasn't from the inappropriate moves made by Everett. Rafe might want to murder the old man, but he certainly wasn't jealous of him. That tone had to come from him knowing I was going to talk to Felix later. My mouth parted as I considered explaining our relationship to him. Felix and I were friends, best friends really, ever since I ended up in the leadership. And though we slipped once and kissed, it didn't mean anything. It was only a means to end our pain at the time. But I didn't say any of that. I didn't have to explain myself to Rafe. After all, we were just friends, too. And there were bigger issues that needed to be taken care of than my love life, or whatever this was. By the time seven o'clock rolled around, I'd pushed all of my confusing thoughts about Rafe from my mind. 
Settling into the pillows on my bed, I held the button on the back of my communication device and grinned like a fool when Felix's face appeared. Hello, beautiful. He was dressed down for the night, his collared shirt undone to reveal a white undershirt clinging to the muscles in his broad chest. Hey, Felix, I've got some exciting news for you. Felix didn't look excited to hear it. In fact, the closer I looked, the more I noticed how weary he appeared, stressed. Wait, is everything okay? He made a weak attempt to smile before his mouth pulled into a frown. Running a hand through his golden hair, he shook his head. No, we got some bad news today. I sat straighter, pulling the device onto a pillow on my lap. What kind of bad news? Though I had a hunch I already knew, I prayed I was wrong. There was an attack. Two attacks, actually. The air deflated from my lungs. Working past the lump that formed in my throat, I struggled to form words for the question I feared to have answered. My dad? His camp was unharmed. Relief washed through me, and there were many other people out there besides my father. Were there any casualties? Felix's lower lip quivered slightly. Yes. James hadn't received a final count yet when we spoke, but it was bad. This couldn't be real. I knew it was, though. My mind shuffled through a range of emotions, shock, grief, and guilt, until it finally settled on rage. Was it Justice Hines? Let me guess, she probably called an emergency meeting to brag about her accomplishments to all the other leaders, listing the number of deaths like trophies on a shelf. My lip curled in disgust. I hate her. It was true. I hated her with every fiber of my being. But Felix wasn't sharing in my flurry of hatred and rage. He looked down, staring blankly into some void off screen. Felix? His eyes met mine again. It wasn't Justice Hines. She was in the same meetings as I was all day. That doesn't mean it wasn't her doing. You know she wanted them dead. She probably hired some protectors to do it while she was working. He shook his head again. We were together when we first received news about the attacks. She was shocked. I really don't think she knew. She's a great actor when she wants to be, I argued. Of course it was Justice Hines. Who else would do such a thing? Felix didn't belabor the point. Claren, there's more. These attacks, they weren't typical of city protectors. They weren't typical of anything I've ever heard of. The weapons they used were very technologically advanced. Even Amelia was surprised. We've never seen anything like this before. What do you mean? What happened? Reports are that the attacks came from above, but no aircraft was seen. People near the target of the attack were instantly killed. Survivors from the edges of the camps suffered pain or temporary unconsciousness, like they'd been shocked or stunned, but no enemies were ever spotted. Oh my goodness. I couldn't breathe. Those camps were full of innocent people, elderly and women, and children. It was definitely more than Justice Hines could pull off on her own. But what kind of monsters would rain down terror like this? The Supreme Leadership. Where's Conrad? I'm certain this is his fault. Felix squeezed his eyes shut and grimaced. Sorrow streaked his features when he opened them again. He's gone. No! The cry that escaped my throat was raw and full of pain, but it was more than that. I'd never been so angry in my life. My vision was darkening around the edges. I was so consumed by my fury that I almost missed the next words from Felix's mouth. Conrad disappeared, but he's not the only one missing. Milo is gone, too. And Frank. Not Frank. He'd been through so much already. The embers needed him now more than ever. But I knew Frank was too strong to submit to their will. He'd never give them the information they wanted, whatever that information may be. He'd die before he helped those monsters. 
But which monster on the loose was worse, Conrad and the supreme leadership, or Milo and his gang of exiled? And who had Frank? Chapter 19 It took a lot of effort to convince Rafe to stay in Lewisburg. He launched into action the second he heard Frank was missing. He wanted to hunt Conrad down and kill him before he could touch Frank. It's not that simple, Ryder said. We were hunkered down in a back corner of the carriage house. It was just the three of us. I wanted to talk to the men who had experienced Milo and his evil with me firsthand before cluing our new friends in on any plans. Why not? Rafe was pacing back and forth, his stare intense enough to cut through the walls. He murdered our people. Yes, but you can't simply track down a member of the Supreme Leadership. He's got connections and technologies up his sleeve that you couldn't dream of. He will always be one step ahead of us. Rafe kicked a shelf against the wall, sending a can full of tool bits crashing to the floor. Riders, right, I said. Conrad is probably long gone, and we don't know if he took Frank anyway. Milo's missing, too. I'm not afraid of Milo. Rafe ran a hand through his hair and focused on us. Frank can handle him. In fact, Milo is the one who should be afraid of Frank. I snorted in agreement, but Ryder dropped his gaze to the ground. What's wrong? I asked. Is there something else we should know? No. He shook his head. I just wish I would have taken him out when I had the chance. You were just following orders, I assured him. You did exactly what you were instructed to do. And Rafe is right. Milo isn't nearly as big a threat as Conrad. I swallowed, giving myself a moment to let everything settle in my mind. Then, turning to Rafe, I said, You do think there's a chance Frank is still alive, right? I know it. His confidence was enough for me. I wanted to believe we could rescue Frank, no matter how unlikely the case may have been. So, what do we do now? Set our sights on the exiled back around Classen City? Ryder asked, his focus sharpened. I could practically see the wheels turning in his mind as he already worked to formulate a plan. He was ready to finish the job this time. No. Both men drew their eyes back to me as I stood and slowly paced. I hadn't fully formed a plan of my own yet, but the movement helped me sort it all out as I spoke. We need to stick to our original plan and convince the outsiders here to join us and the Embers. But what about Fr- I held up a hand to silence Rafe. I wasn't finished. Frank is strong. I'm not worried about Milo, and we've already concluded that we can't hunt down Conrad. But it was obviously Conrad and the Supreme Leadership who attacked the Ember Camps. The exiled men don't have that kind of technology, and if he struck once, he'll probably do it again. Felix is working with James to prepare the other Embers back near Classen, but we need to grow our numbers. The only way to catch Conrad is to bring him into our own territory. We'll wait until he strikes again, and then we'll use our extra people to catch him by surprise. He may be surprised, but that doesn't mean we'll be able to stop him. Ryder played devil's advocate well, but I already knew he was in. I saw it in the gleam of his eye. True, I agreed. That's the part I'm still working out, but I know for sure we'll never get him if he keeps eliminating our people. We've got to get the outsiders here to join us. Rafe nodded and licked his still battered lip. The skin around his eyes had settled into deep shades of purple, but the bruising on his brow was already fading into a sickly yellow. I shudder to think about him or any of the rest of us getting beaten like that again, but going outside was our only option. I'll try to talk to them again, Rafe said. No, I shook my head. It has to be me. They'll know my face and listen to what I say. Absolutely not. Rafe began pacing again. I won't let you go near the camp until we get them to see that we're not the enemy. Oh, you won't let me? I crossed my arms over my chest. Last I checked, you weren't in charge. I turned to Ryder. 
I'll go out Saturday morning. I'd like for you to come with me, but I'm going, whether you do or not. Of course I'm going. The corner of his mouth twitched as Rafe groaned beside me. And I bet we can get Black-Eyed Betty here to tag along, too. Rafe shot Ryder a glare, but his shell was cracking. I knew Rafe wouldn't dream of letting us go without him. So it's settled, then. Saturday morning, we'll go meet our soon-to-be embers. I just had to get through a few more days of pointless work and another one of Everett's dinner parties first. Joy fussed with my hair Friday evening in my bathroom. This party wasn't as big a deal as my birthday had been, so I didn't get an outside stylist to come in and prep me, thank goodness. I didn't have the patience for someone like Olivia after the news I'd received that week. It was just me and Joy and the royal blue dress I'd originally hoped to wear for my birthday. I still like this dress better than the red one Director Walsh chose for you last time, Joy said as she pinned a loose strand in place on my head. I tilted my face, studying the reflection of the girl in the mirror. I do, too. This wasn't how I pictured my life going, but here I was, at a dinner party, faking smiles and small talk, while worrying every second if another innocent person was being attacked or killed by the very person I clinked glasses with. Did you ever find out who you're entertaining tonight? Joy stepped back and spun me in a circle, double-checking to see if anything was out of place before I made my entrance downstairs. No, but it doesn't matter. I'm not going to be able to focus on anything they're saying anyway. Joy frowned. She and Asher seemed just as upset as we were at the news of Ember Camps being attacked. Asher had sided with Rafe. He was ready for war. But it was no use fighting an invisible enemy. We had to be patient. Step one was getting through tonight. Tomorrow we'd worry about winning over the outsiders of Lewisburg. One thing at a time. Well, good luck down there. I'll work with the kitchen staff to move things along a little faster for you. She winked as she turned to leave. I followed Joy down the stairs and into the foyer. She gave me a thumbs up as she turned toward the kitchen. I took one more deep breath and spun in the opposite direction toward the dining room. But it wasn't full of guests as I'd expected. There were just a handful of far too familiar faces. There she is, Everett chuckled, his voice tinged with so much sweetness it made me sick. What a phony. We were starting to wonder if you decided to skip out on us. His tone was jovial but the glint in his eyes said he wasn't happy. He directed me to the empty seat between him and Emmeline Fraser, who stood and flashed me a wary smile. Her eyes met mine, and I swore she was peering into my soul again. They swam with knowledge and something dark, almost angry, that I couldn't put my finger on. Yet I wasn't afraid. Emmeline was a known hazard. I didn't have to fear her anymore. Dimitri, the director of defense for Classen City, sat to her right. Two of Everett's mistresses from my party sat opposite them on Everett's left. But it was the face glaring at me from the opposite end of the table that caused my heart to stop beating. With a bitter pout twisted over to one side and eyes that could murder, sat a very unhappy Justice Hines. I paused behind my empty chair, locking eyes with the beast at the opposite end of the room. She burned with rage that rivaled my own, and her lip pulled up slightly as she took me in. If we hadn't been surrounded by other leaders in our dinner finery, she might have spat on me. My first instinct was to cross the room and wipe her out with the candelabra. I couldn't stand the sight of her or anything she stood for. She was despicable but it struck me as odd that she was feeling much the same way I was. Justice Hines was angry. If she had been responsible for the deaths of the embers, she would have been gloating, smug, maybe even cheerful, as she twisted the news deep into my heart like a knife. She took great joy in my pain, so she wouldn't have been angry. Almost as though she had the same realization, we simultaneously whipped our eyes apart and settled in at the table. 
Noticing a glass of wine waiting for me, I picked it up and downed its contents, trying not to gag as the bitter liquid burned down my throat. I'm so glad you were all able to fly out with everything going on back home. Everett addressed the room before settling his gaze on me. I generally prefer to keep business discussions at the office, but given our unique personal connections to class and city, I thought it best to invite our guests into our home tonight. I hope you don't mind mixing business and pleasure just this once. He winked at me, and I wanted to flick him in his twitchy eye. This wasn't the night to mess with me. But I didn't. I played dumb, just like he wanted. Of course I don't mind, Everett. I fluttered my eyes and smiled sweetly back at him. Judging by the way Emmeline shifted in her seat next to me, it may have been a little over the top, but Everett was too dense to pick up on it. He looked like I'd made his night. His mistresses across from me looked like I'd ruined theirs. A couple of attendants entered the room carrying trays with our dinner salads. Everett steepled his fingers, donning his more serious politician's mask. He spoke again as the attendants exited. I'm afraid there has been some bad news back home. Unfortunately, some of the outsiders, citizens that have been exiled from the city, have become aggressive. I cut my eyes back to Justice Hines, who was staring me down with her salad fork held like a weapon. But I wasn't intimidated. Everett wouldn't let her touch me. I was his prized possession. The thought almost made me giggle. Or maybe that was just the effects of the wine kicking in. Yes, there were reports of that kind of activity before I left as well. Thankfully, we were able to apprehend the man in charge. How's Milo doing, Justice Hines? She stabbed a piece of lettuce and narrowed her eyes, but she didn't answer. Instead, Everett continued to drone on as though I was an idiot who had no idea what was going on. Then again, how would I? He didn't know I'd been speaking to his son, and he certainly never filled me in on anything of any importance happening here in Lewisburg or anywhere else. It seems they've turned on each other now, leaving a trail of dead bodies in their path. I tried not to flinch. All eyes were on me. How would I react if I neither knew this information before tonight, nor cared about the people who had lost their lives? That is a surprise, I uttered. But I suppose that makes a trail of fewer problems for you to worry about back home. Hopefully, I was the only one who could hear my heart pounding. It would. Justice Hines dabbed at her mouth with a napkin, trying unsuccessfully to appear cool and calm. Except they used weapons they shouldn't have had access to. It appears someone may be feeding them intelligence, or worse, providing them technology that is strictly off-limits to anyone outside of the leadership. Please excuse me, ladies. Everett casually dismissed the women across from him, shooting Justice Hines a look. She'd said too much. Maybe he should have thought about that before inviting his lady friends to a business dinner. They exited slowly, moving their hips from side to side and flashing me a final disdainful glance over their shoulders before turning a corner and almost knocking over an attendant who was coming to remove our dishes. Everett raised his glass to the attendant, tapping his finger on the side for a refill. I began to do the same, but the feeling of Emmeline's hard gaze stopped me from moving. It was probably for the best. I'd have to stay sharp to deal with these goons. No more wine for me. Once the room emptied out again, I cleared my throat. That's awful. It must be very difficult to work with a bunch of people you can't fully trust. A small, strangled sound came from Emmeline, almost like a soft laugh, but she remained completely devoid of emotion when I glanced over at her. Justice Hines, on the other hand, was seething. Dimitri looked pretty upset, too. Most of the leadership doesn't even know about these weapons. He slammed his drink on the table. It just doesn't make any sense. That information should never have been leaked to the outside. Hmm. I placed a finger on my lips. Maybe it's time to involve the higher-ups. Aren't you working with a consultant from the Supreme Leadership right now? What was his name? I tapped my fingers lightly across the table. Conrad Reynolds. That's it, right? 
How are things going with him? Justice Hines threw her napkin on the table and stood, startling the attendant carrying in our dinner plates. I never heard the words she wanted to yell, however. Growing impatient with the attendants in the room, she finally croaked. Excuse me for a moment. I'll be right back. The room grew tense with her away. Dimitri seemed to be stifling a smile, and Emmeline, ever the symbol of poise, began a casual conversation with Everett. But something was off. Justice Hines was gone for a long time, long enough for Everett to down two more glasses of whiskey. And despite her refined behavior and emotionless expression, Emmeline was worried. I felt it when her arm brushed against mine as she was taking a drink of water. I managed to keep my mouth shut throughout the rest of the dinner, listening instead for any details I may be able to use to my advantage. According to Dimitri, they feared there was a division among the outsiders, and those who craved power eliminated those who wanted to remain peaceful. He noted that the camps that were attacked weren't on the leadership's radar before this incident. They suspected the group of power-hungry outsiders may set their sights on the people of Classen City next. That's why they were here to seek guidance from Everett. I've been saying for years you need to build barriers along the outer edge of the city, just like we did here in Lewisburg. We haven't seen any sightings of outsiders since the fences went up. That may be true, but you have other problems to deal with in this city. Everett, now red in the face from too many glasses of whiskey, narrowed his eyes at Dimitri. Let's not talk about such things in front of the ladies. They can't be interested in matters of the slovenly. Finally, as the dessert plates were being cleared, Justice Hines entered the room again. It's time to go, she said curtly. I'm not feeling well, and I'd like to get back to Classen tonight. She locked eyes with Dimitri and gave him a small nod. He stood as well. Well, Everett, it was enjoyable as always. Thank you for hosting us in your fine home. Well, this is rather abrupt. I'm sorry you're not feeling well, Martha. Are you certain you can't stay for drinks? We were all standing now, and Everett slid his hand onto the small of my back. My body stiffened in response. Just a few more minutes, and I could escape up to my room. I'm sure. We must get back. Her tone was cool and disinterested. She'd made up her mind and was already turning for the door. Very well. I'll have my driver come around with the car. Everett turned to find an attendant in the hall, and Emmeline quirked an eyebrow at me when we were alone. I stared into her crystal blue eyes, and the strangest sensation came over me. But again, I couldn't quite place what I was feeling. I never really knew what I was feeling around Emmeline. She was a master manipulator of my own emotions. She was just as bad as the rest of them. I bid her goodbye and turned to head back up to my room, but Everett caught me by the wrist in the foyer. Just because they're calling it an early night doesn't mean we have to. Come, let's have a drink with our friends in my office. Everett's lady friends stood waiting and watching. I remembered the door to his secret room and swallowed down bile rising in my throat. He disgusted me. I wasn't going anywhere with him. I snatched my wrist away. No, thank you. I'm going to bed. I spun on my heels and went straight for the staircase before he could object. He couldn't have been happy with my behavior, but after the strange evening I'd just endured, I didn't care. All I cared about was getting the rest I needed to win over the outsiders the next morning. It was time to bring these horrible people down. Chapter 20 the powdery pink light of dawn was just beginning to creep over the horizon as our car approached the guards posted at the edge of Lewisburg. Asher rolled his window down and spoke to them quietly. I strained to hear what he was saying, but it was difficult to move. Ryder and Jeremy had me wedged between them in the back seat of our car. Rafe sat up front to better direct Asher toward the outside camp. After a brief exchange, the guards let us pass out of the city though I felt their hard eyes through the tinted windows as we went. Asher always made an effort to vouch for me. He tried hard to build me up in the eyes of the local people, but that didn't make them trust me. 
They still watched me through town with the same disdain I felt when looking at Everett. We were one and the same in their minds. It took nearly two hours to reach the outsiders. They made little attempt to hide the entrance to their settlement, but it was remarkably protected. Like the city of Lewisburg, a fence had been erected around the perimeter as far as I could see. We stopped the car about fifty yards away from the entrance. All right, I'll try and talk to them again first. You guys wait here. Rafe, I tilted my head in his direction. It was a nice try, but he was a fool to think we'd come all the way out here just to watch him get beat up again. We talked about this. He opened his mouth to object, but thought better of it. Shaking his head, he said, Fine, but I'm coming out there with you. Several outsiders had already gathered at the entrance, watching us with large sticks at the ready. They were trying to intimidate us, and it was working. You can come, but I'll do the talking. They'll recognize this as a city vehicle, and they'll know a leader must be inside it. I'm the only one who stands a shot at convincing them we're serious. I raised my brows for emphasis. I wasn't budging on this. Ryder nodded and shot a hard look at Rafe, who finally sighed, resigned to let me have it my way. Well, let's get going, then. I turned to hop out after Ryder and noticed Jeremy was climbing out as well. Where do you think you're going? I was still a little grumpy about the tone he took to me the other day. I'm coming, too. Uh, no, you're not. Ryder crossed his arms over his chest. Why not? Because we're here to handle business. Rafe frowned and gestured for Jeremy to step off to the side with him. He lowered his voice, but I overheard his earnest words, even with my back turned to give them privacy. If your wife is here, today isn't the day to talk to her. Let us become allies first. We'll build some trust. Then you can go and find her. My chest felt tight as Jeremy let Rafe's words sink in. Rafe was right, of course. But Jeremy was hurting. He may or may not have had a chance to get her back, but either way, he had to be patient. He must have agreed, because Rafe joined Ryder and me a moment later, while Jeremy climbed back into the car. I'll be here if you need me, Asher said through an open window. The car will be running in case we need to get out of here quickly. I looked back toward the outsiders positioned menacingly against the fence around their camp. Hopefully, we wouldn't need a quick escape, but their formidable stares didn't provide much confidence. More men spilled out of their entrance as we approached. Was it like this last time you came? My voice quivered with nerves. Not at all, Rafe answered. It's like they were expecting us today. Or maybe they're just tired of seeing your ugly mug. Ryder's weak laugh was a poor attempt to hide his own nerves. With a straight face, he pulled a gun from the back of his waistband and set it gently on the ground. Then he raised both hands in the air. We'd like to talk. May we approach? The outsiders glanced back and forth amongst themselves. After a moment, they parted to reveal a middle-aged man walking toward us. His muddy brown hair hung nearly to his shoulders, tasseled and wet-looking. His face was unshaven, his skin leathery from the sun, and his gait uneven. His swagger exuded more bravado than Everett, but that wasn't the most intimidating thing about him. Unlike the other outsiders watching us, this man carried a gun. No, he said gruffly. You may not approach. Wraith tensed beside me. I watched his hand twitch from the corner of my eye, and I knew he was fighting the urge to reach for his knife. Don't do it, Rafe. This guy isn't bluffing. He cut his eyes over to me, full of pain, and I understood. Rafe had been subjected to the outsider's abuse before. He knew what was going to happen. He just didn't care. He would do whatever it took to prevent me from suffering the same pain. He blinked and turned back to the man who was just a few yards away now and raised both hands in front of him, mirroring Ryder. I did the same. My name is Claren, I started. I swallowed down my fear, stuffing it deep in my gut. My voice rang out clear and loud. I don't care who you are. 
The man spat in the grass and continued forward. His gun swayed slightly with each step, and his lack of control over the weapon did nothing to soothe my nerves. You're not welcome here. Please. My ribs were squeezing in tight around my lungs. Fear was fighting to take a hold of me again. The man was close enough now for me to see the wild flare in his eyes and the rust-colored dirt under his nails. Or was that dried blood? I don't want to come in. I only want to talk. I'll be brief. Five minutes, that's all I ask. Rafe and Ryder were tightly wound balls of energy on either side of me. The adrenaline pulsing through their veins burned, begging for release. What's in it for me? The man lowered his wily brows, appraising me. Freedom. His chest rose and fell three times before he released his intense stare. Five minutes. He walked over to Ryder's dropped weapon and tucked it into his waistband. Ryder's jaw clenched, but he made no move to stop the man. None of us knew what we might be dealing with here. Mikey, Hal. Two other outsiders came trotting over with the man's call. Keep an eye on these two while I have a chat with the lady, especially that one. Looks like he doesn't know how to follow instructions. He gestured to Rafe with the gun in his hand. The faded brown and yellow bruises around Rafe's eyes stood out like a billboard advertising his previous encounter with these men. Ryder looked as though he might object, but again, he held his tongue. I nodded to let him know I was okay. The outsider was intimidating for sure, but something had shifted when I mentioned freedom. His initial aggression had been replaced with curiosity. He wouldn't hurt me now unless provoked, I hoped. We walked several yards off to the side, just far enough to speak privately while still remaining within sight of the others. He didn't want to get detached from his men any more than I did mine. I'm a leader in Lewisburg. Obviously, he scowled. I swallowed. This was going to be a major risk for me and the Embers, but it was the only way I could get through to him. I continued. But my heart is outside of the city. I don't agree with the way things are run, and I want things to change in a major way. Good luck. The last leader who tried to change the system didn't wake up a few weeks ago. His expression soured, and I wondered if he knew Director Yoder personally. I know, and I don't think it was an accident. I think she was murdered. He narrowed his eyes again, trying to determine my motives. I seemed to be hitting on a nerve, but his skepticism was thick. There was no trust between us yet. The thing is, there are many corrupt leaders. Most of them probably are. But there are a few of us who recognize what's right. We've teamed up with the outsiders near Classen City, and we'd like to work with you, too. The more of us there are working together, the sooner we can make real changes. The sooner we can all be free again. He shook his head. Nope. We're already free. We don't need you. And I'm not going to let you use my people to further some self-righteous cause. He turned to walk away, but I reached out, causing him to bristle at my touch. Instinctively, I took a step back. My contact reignited the feral look in his eye, sending my heart racing again. With my hands back in the air, I whispered, There's more. He looked over his shoulder back toward the men he had guarding Rafe and Ryder, then crossed his arms over his chest. Hurry up. I've got work to do, and my patience is running low. I think the leadership is up to something, and you may be in danger. Our people near Klassen were just attacked in two separate camps. The technology used to hurt them could have only come from the government. And I'm not talking about local leaders. I'm talking about the supreme leadership. It was advanced and deadly. Your camp here is an enormous target. I'm worried you could be next. And why should I believe you? Because I don't have anything to gain by telling you this. And if the leadership found out I came out here to talk to you, I could be executed. I wouldn't do it if it weren't the truth. That's what you would say if they put you up to this, too. How do I know you're not just trying to weaken our defenses before your big attack? 
I have no reason to trust you. What can I do, then, to earn your trust? My voice raised half an octave, and my palms turned up to the sky. I needed him to believe me. We needed him on our side. He pulled Ryder's gun from his waistband. With a weapon in each hand, he looked back and forth from hand to hand, examining them before raising each one to point at my chest. Weapons. He slowly lowered his arms back to his sides. Instead of bringing weapons out here to use against us, equip us with some of our own. If you're not setting us up to attack us, then you shouldn't have any problem giving us what we need to defend ourselves. Weapons like this won't protect you from the attacks that are coming. They won't work against the technology they're using. He scoffed and turned to walk away again. I knew it. This is a waste of my time. It's not. I hurried to catch up with him. I'm telling you the truth. I can see about getting you weapons, but I can't promise anything. When is the attack supposed to happen? I don't know. I don't even know for sure that they're planning it. I just want you to be prepared. If we work together, maybe we can prevent them from hurting anyone else. Maybe we can put an end to this. The man stopped abruptly. Give us weapons. Give us intelligence. Tell us when they're coming. Provide us with anything useful, and I'll consider it. Until then, good luck. It sounds like we're better off on our own. He turned back to his other men. Come on, boys. We're done here. Wait, I called out. I'll be back. I'll get you something. Who do I ask for next time I come? My name is Seth, but don't come back just to waste my time again. Bring me something good, or don't come back at all. He swaggered back to the entrance of the outsider camp, his men trailing quickly behind him. They never so much as looked back over their shoulders at us. I couldn't get them what he asked for. I didn't have access to weapons myself. Conrad was gone, and my only other connection to the supreme leadership was Everett. I could possibly lure some information out of him with enough whiskey and stroking of his ego, but it may not prove to be useful. And even then, the cost could be great. But if I could save even one life, I had to try. It was time to go shopping for a new red dress. Chapter 21 Ouch! I shook my hand to relieve the burn from the tea that splashed onto my fingers. I'm sorry, Claren. Did I make it too hot? Joy patted at my hand with a clean towel, concern tugging at her brows. No, it's perfect. I just can't sit still enough to drink it without spilling. Joy stood tall, folding the damp towel in her hands. He'll show up. I'm sure of it. His attendant understood how important my message was. I glanced at the communicator laying beside me on the bed. I turned it on two hours before, only to find a dark screen. Rafe and Ryder agreed that I shouldn't wait for my regularly scheduled Monday night meeting with Felix to tell him about the outsiders. I had Joy call over to Felix's house the moment we returned home. His attendant said he was out, but he'd have Felix return my call as soon as he came home. I'd been sitting and staring at the blank screen ever since. She bowed her head and silently left me alone again with my tea. I picked up the device and turned it over in my hand. Other than a tiny yellow light in the upper right-hand corner, there was no sign of it working at all. Maybe if I turned it off and back on again. Right as my finger moved over the button on the back, the light turned green and the screen flashed to life. Felix's handsome face stared back at me. He tried to smile, but it didn't reach his sad eyes. Felix, hi, you got my message. He nodded. I did. What's wrong? I was about to ask you the same thing. You look exhausted. Is everything okay over there? Yeah, everything is okay here. He inhaled deeply. It's just been a weird day and a long week, but it's all good now that I get to talk to you. This time his smile did reach his eyes. I bet it has been hard trying to get to the bottom of those attacks. Have you had to spend a lot of time with Justice Hines? Not until today, really. He scratched at the back of his head. But we weren't discussing the attacks. 
I leaned in. He wasn't giving me the full story. Care to elaborate? The corner of his mouth twitched. It's not important. She had an idea about something, but it's not going to work out. Now, tell me what's going on over there. Why the urgent call? I made contact with the outsiders here. Felix's eyes widened, and he glanced over his shoulder to make sure the door to his study was closed. And they didn't hurt you? No, but they didn't agree to help me either. The last time we'd spoken, I updated Felix about Rafe's initial encounter with the outsiders. He didn't want me going around them any more than Rafe did. I told them about the embers. His eyes grew even wider, but he didn't interrupt or criticize my decision. I warned that they may be attacked the same way, and I asked for their help. Unless you've heard from Conrad again, I think uniting with this group may be the only way we can prevent more attacks. They're an easy target with the size of their camp. I'm certain they're on the radar. If he doesn't attack them next, it surely won't be long before he does. And you're sure Conrad is behind this? I still can't find a motive for him to attack like that. I nodded. I just can't shake the feeling he gave me. I knew he was up to no good before I left Klassen, and after talking with Justice Hines last night, I think you're right. She doesn't seem to be connected. No one else would be capable of something like that. He winced at Justice Hines's name. Okay, so let's say he does attack again. Those camps were blindsided last time. They never saw him coming. How is this new group supposed to defend any better? I'm working on getting more information about the Supreme Leadership. I may be able to find out when they will be in the area next. And how are you going to do that? The truth was, I'd have to flirt with his drunken father. But obviously that answer wouldn't cut it. I've got some connections here. He studied me for a beat. Now there were two of us not revealing the whole story. Sometimes that's what it took to get a happy ending. Or that's how I justified it to myself, anyway. A sinking feeling settled deep in my chest. I suddenly felt very exposed. Perhaps it was the guilt of not being completely forthcoming with Felix. Or perhaps it was my body's reaction to the absurdity of my plan. Felix's expression was tight, and it struck me how alone he was. He'd always been alone. But now, with the added responsibilities of being the senator, Felix was shouldering all of the stress and tragedy of the last week by himself. I wanted to smooth the tension in his temples away with my thumbs. I wanted to pull him close and tell him everything would be okay, in the way no one ever had. We were in this together, and we still needed each other's help. If I can provide some details about the attacks, the outsiders here would be willing to talk. But until I can prove that I'm on their side, they're not open to anything. Let's hope your connections are willing to talk, then. Doubt clouded his features, but his tone was not unkind, just a little hopeless. There is one other thing that may help with a future alliance, but it's probably not possible. What is it? Maybe there was a spark of hope left in him after all. Weapons. They have none. Their leader suggested that providing them weapons of defense would add to my argument that I'm not involved in the attack, but I don't have access to anything like that. Felix nodded. It makes sense. Let me talk to Emilio. Missing weapons would cause a lot of alarm around here, but if he was somehow able to create something new from spare parts, we might be able to make it work. I'll see what I can do. Thank you. I swallowed the lump growing in my throat. I know you need to rest, but have you heard any word about Frank? Any idea where he might be or if— My voice trailed off, unable to finish the question. No. Felix frowned. But they haven't found his body, which gives me hope that he's still alive. Alive, maybe, but probably wishing he was dead. If Conrad held him captive, he was either a prisoner, or more likely, being tortured and interrogated. The more I thought about it, the more I realized Conrad and the Supreme Leadership must have discovered Frank's plan to educate the cities. It's the only reason I could think for them to attack. But Frank was harmless. The Embers weren't violent criminals. 
They only wanted to see change, change the supreme leadership was obviously unwilling to accept. Were they trying to get him to reveal the locations of other camps, trying to tear down the Ember leadership? Surely Frank would keep quiet. He wouldn't put the other camps in danger. I had to believe that he would stay strong, no matter what kind of tactics they may use to try to get him to talk. My dad was still out there. I needed Frank to stay strong for him and everyone else who depended on him. As soon as I finished my call with Felix, it was time to put things into motion. Shoulders back, chin held high, I marched down the stairs to Everett's office, talking myself up the whole way. Everett wasn't so scary. I just had to get him in his element. A fancy party, alcohol flowing freely, a snug-fitting dress in his favorite shade of red, a flirty giggle and a soft touch. I could do this. I could get him to talk. What do you mean? Everett's voice reverberated through the hallway just before I reached his office. I paused outside his doorway, listening for another voice. Silence. Then, no, she has no idea. Yes, I'm sure. Emmeline? He blew air through his teeth. She's smart enough, but there's still something off there. I think Martha would be easier to control. Right. Both of them? He sighed loudly. Yes, ma'am, of course. Two weeks, I'll make it happen. He slammed the phone on his desk with more force than necessary. I considered turning around and going back upstairs, but overhearing the end of that conversation had me more curious than ever. Everett didn't refer to just anybody as ma'am. Was it the supreme leadership? The woman I met at my party, perhaps? Cynthia? Everett was up to something, and I was determined to find out what it was. With a deep breath and a quick silent prayer for safety, I rounded the corner into his office. He glanced up from his desk with a loosened collar and tired eyes. His wariness hit me the moment we made eye contact with enough weight that I wasn't certain I had the strength to talk to him. But I persevered. With a little extra sway in my steps, I sauntered over to his desk and leaned my hip against it, propping my weight up on an outstretched arm in front of him. Long day? He blinked, seemingly unaffected by my effort to look more appealing. Yes. His eyes weren't focused on me, but looking through me, staring lifelessly into a distant nothingness. Everett was lost in thought. Whoever he spoke with moments before left him feeling uneasy. Perhaps tonight wasn't the best time for me to leech information from him. You know what might help take your mind off of work? He turned slightly, as if he just noticed I was in the room. What's that? A party. A party? We just had guests over on Friday. Yes, but that dinner wasn't much fun. I pushed my lower lip out a bit, the way I'd seen his other lady friends do when they weren't getting their way. Something twitched in Everett's cheek as he looked down at my lips. Well, you know I can never say no to a party. He stood and pushed in his office chair, a smile tugging at the corner of his mouth. And now that you mention it, a party might be just what I need. I have some guests I'll need to speak with again soon anyway. How does the Friday after next sound? He winked and placed his hand on my lower back as he escorted me toward the door. It was a weak display of his charm. It might have fooled most people, but I still sensed the unsettled feeling he was trying to hide, and the fact that he was leading me back into the hall was confirmation enough that I wouldn't be getting any more information out of him tonight. But that was okay. We had plans for a party. Two weeks. That sounds perfect, I smiled. Hopefully, Conrad would hold off on any other attacks until then. Chapter 22 Everett kept to himself the following week, busying himself with work tasks and endless phone calls behind closed doors. Tension hung thick in the air throughout the house, and Everett's faux charm at the office and the dinner table couldn't conceal the stress gripping him like a vice. It put us all on edge. 
I put all of my time at work into planning the party, since that's apparently all I was good for in my new position. But I'd often leave the office early to meet up with Ryder and Rafe. They'd been secretly scouting the city with Jeremy and built up a group of about 20 men and women who were interested in training. We'd gather in the small clearing near the carriage house, careful to stay hidden from anyone passing down the main road, and certain to disassemble before Everett returned home each evening. Rafe worked with everyone on self-defense. It was amazing what even the most petite of the women were able to do with different pressure points and twists of their bodies. They could take down full-grown men. Ryder focused on weapons training. We didn't have guns, other than a couple of stun guns, of course. But we learned how to effectively use other common items as weapons, both defensively and offensively. I particularly enjoyed watching Joy wield the handle of a mop, spinning the tool and striking in a way that sent the men running. We didn't have much, but we were growing stronger by the day. On Friday afternoon, I said goodbye to Barbara at lunchtime and met Joy and Ryder in the car downstairs. We were going into town to find me a dress for the party the following week. Asher drove with light, cheerful conversation as we rolled through the center toward the gate that led into the city. But everything changed on the other side of the wall. The same tension I'd felt near Everett through the week swirled around us on the streets of Lewisburg. There were more people outside than usual, crowding the sidewalks and lingering around buildings and alleyways. They turned and watched us drive past with heightened looks of disdain. Ryder glanced at me with a frown and pulled the stun gun from his waistband. He held it low in the vehicle, out of sight, but ready if he needed it. Our chatter grew quiet as we drove deeper into town. Asher and Joy felt it too. How could they not? The sensation was strangling, more now than ever before. The people were angry, and they weren't trying to hide it. As our vehicle approached the business district, we came upon an especially large crowd. They stood in the middle of the roads, blocking our path to the boutique. A media reporter stood on the outer edge of the group, speaking into a handheld microphone and looking into a camera. Asher continued past the intersection, turning left toward a different part of the area. I'm going to drive around the backside of the block, he said. It'll be easier to get inside from back here. Asher rolled to a stop in the alley behind the dress boutique. Ryder stepped out of the vehicle behind Joy and me. I'm going to stay here in the alley, where I can watch the vehicle and still keep an eye on you and the store. Please keep this back door propped open and call out to me if anything seems off. I nodded. We will. I'm serious, Claren. I don't know what's going on, but this isn't the day to get careless. Get my attention. I'll keep you safe. Normally I might have rolled my eyes at his insistence to watch over me like a child, but today it felt necessary. Inside, the same worker I'd met before, Agnes, was just as uneasy as we were. The visit was much different than the first time I'd gone dress shopping in the store. Our conversation was limited, the dress selection small, the fittings hurried. It was like we had an unspoken agreement to hurry up and get out of there so we could all get back to the safety of our homes. Ryder would walk in and have a look around the shop every few minutes as well, the gun in his hands a clear symbol of the overall atmosphere. His eyes were constantly roving, in the boutique, out in the alleyway, back and forth working hard to keep everyone safe. As Joy and I finished our transaction at the cash register, the crowds outside grew loud. There was shouting, though their words were indistinguishable. The mass of people seemed to move as one, a living, breathing organism in itself, traversing the streets and slowly making its way down the road. They were moving in the direction of the center. Understanding struck Joy and me at the same time, and with the bag slung over my arm, we hurried to the back of the store, where Ryder was already waiting, with the car doors open for us to jump inside. Go! he shouted to Asher, as the doors closed behind us. Asher turned the corner back to the center, speeding faster than he should have in an effort to beat the crowds. But it was fruitless. 
Despite his speed, the crowd flooded the intersection in front of us before we could clear it. Asher slammed on his brakes to avoid hitting a woman with stringy brown hair. Frown lines etched her face, and she slapped her hands on the hood of the car in frustration. Then she made eye contact with me, and I knew the situation was about to go from bad to dangerous. We've got a live one here, she yelled, and the crowd converged on us. Fists banged against the windows, rocking the vehicle back and forth with the rage of the people. Ryder pushed Joy and me down toward the floorboards, shielding us with his arms. But he couldn't shield us from the words that were shouted through the crowd. Enough is enough! Down with the leadership! We have a voice! Give us a choice! I lifted up on my knees enough to steal a peek through the window. The people were livid, pushing on the car to get our attention. But they didn't have any weapons. They were hurting. They felt abandoned, hungry, neglected. Let me talk to them. What? Ryder looked at me like I was crazy. Let me talk to them, I repeated. They don't want to hurt us. They just want to be heard. He shook his head emphatically. No, they will absolutely hurt you. I touched his leg, projecting a sense of calm and trust. I wasn't positive that I could calm the crowd, but I had to try. Drawing this kind of negative attention to Lewisburg would only bring the attacks to our area faster. If I wanted Conrad and the Supreme Leadership to keep their distance, I had to get control of these people, at least until we could organize something more efficient for the Ember movement. Their anger wasn't misplaced. It was just poorly timed. Uncertainty flashed across Ryder's face, and I instantly felt guilty for toying with his emotions. But he wouldn't let me speak to the people otherwise. And just as quickly as it appeared, his angry feelings morphed into the defeated expression of a man who was about to relent. Just be careful, he mumbled. I will. I lifted myself back into the seat, taking in the crowd that surrounded our vehicle. It seemed even larger now than before, if that was possible. Sitting up high on a patio outside of a nearby restaurant sat the media crew with multiple cameras trained on the scene before them. I inhaled deeply, allowing the oxygen to fill my lungs and clear my worries. If I could remain calm, perhaps they could too. Maybe I could even project some of it into the crowd immediately surrounding our vehicle. I moved toward the window, and the faces directly outside it registered surprise. I used the brief lapse in anger to raise my hands in surrender, urging them to relax enough to let me speak. I hear you, I shouted through the glass. I hear you, and I know you're hurting. The people nearest the vehicle exchanged glances, but the shouting continued all around them. Cautiously, I rolled the window down, constantly projecting all the goodwill I held outside into the people hoping that it would be enough to keep them calm. Without the glass barrier separating us, my voice rang out loud through the people. I want to help you! My eyes cut back to the cameras, the blinking red light a reminder that I had to be careful with my words. Not only was I speaking to the angry crowd of Lewisburg, but I was being recorded for playback to people throughout the district, possibly even throughout New America. I had to choose my words carefully. And yet, I couldn't snuff out the excitement trilling through my veins. If this footage played throughout New America, people all across the country might wake up to what the government was doing. Maybe it would be enough to spark the Ember movement everywhere. Maybe this was actually the very beginning of a bigger change. The thought spurred on my confidence, and I leaned further out the window, all eyes trained on me now. I know you're angry, but this isn't the way to make things change. I hear your concerns, and I will take them directly to the top of the district leadership. I want what's best for you, and I will do everything in my power to make it happen. My words were vague, but they had to be. I couldn't publicly announce that I wanted to change the laws, not with the cameras on me, but hopefully it was enough to appease them for now. 
they'd find out soon enough that I was completely on their side. Liar! The woman who first alerted the crowds to my presence was shoving her way through the people toward my window. I felt Ryder lean in closer behind me, the stun gun firm in his grip pushed up against the door at the ready. We've heard you leaders spout lies like this before. You fed us for a while, and then you murdered us. We're tired of it. It's time to bring the whole system down. Ma'am, I promise. My words were cut short when she reached out and snagged a handful of my hair, yanking me further out of the window. My body lay halfway out of the car, multiple hands grabbing at my arms and face, tugging on my shirt, trying to drag me all the way out. But Ryder kept a firm grip on my legs. Joy joined him in attempting to pull me back into the vehicle. I cried out in pain as a clump of hair was pulled from my scalp. I was being stretched in ways the human body wasn't designed to withstand. My joints ached at the force until finally a jolt of electricity crawled over my skin. The hairs on my arms felt as though they had been singed right off of my body. My ears hummed and my veins were on fire. But the shot didn't hit me directly. It hit the woman pulling on me, and her body went rigid from the shock of the stun gun, landing on the ground with a thud. I watched in horror as people stepped on her fallen form, unaware of what happened, and pushed forward by the force of the crowd behind them. They'd completely lost control. Drive! Ryder yelled to Asher. I can't! There are too many of them! I said drive! Ryder growled through gritted teeth. Asher obeyed, slowly rolling forward at first, knocking citizens in the legs with the slow-moving vehicle. They're trying to run us over, someone shouted. It was enough to get the people moving. One by one, they began to clear out of the way as Asher gained speed. Ryder swung the weapon in his hand, crashing into the face of a man who gripped my upper arm. The gun left the man's nose bloodied, and his hand loosened as he reached for his face. It was enough for Ryder to pull me back safely into the vehicle. Asher was moving quickly now, flying over bumps in the road past the jeering crowds on either side of us. Joy dabbed at a gash on my upper lip with the edge of her sleeve, her eyes wet with fear and regret. I'm fine, Joy. The adrenaline masked my pain. I wasn't physically hurting, but I was sick with anxiety. What would Everett have to say when word of this got back to him? I'd made a terrible mistake. Chapter 23 My face was numb from the ice pack Joy insisted I held to my cheek. Other than some bruising, a cut lip from an elbow to the face, and an unfortunate new bald spot behind my left ear, I was remarkably unscathed. My body was still a little sore from being yanked and twisted and pulled, though, and I'd yet to face Everett. My fear over his reaction was probably the most incapacitating of all. I drew my knees up to my chest and nestled further into the corner of the worn couch that sat in the carriage house. It was the same couch that served as Rafe's bed, and his scent still lingered in the tattered old fabric. It was the only thing keeping me relaxed as we waited for the evening news to begin. Asher and Jeremy had smuggled a small television out of an unused guest room on the first floor. They wiggled an antenna strapped to the top of the set until the programming came into view. I didn't want to speak to Everett until after I'd seen just how much of my little speech the media had recorded. Finally, the familiar notes of the evening programming chimed from a crackling speaker in the base of the television. We all grew quiet as the newscaster appeared, smiling like he'd just been gifted an extra year's wages. Tonight, in the greater Midwest district, Rafe and Ryder came jogging over to join Joy, Asher, Jeremy, and me in front of the screen. Rafe settled onto the floor in front of me, leaning his head back against my knees. Without a thought, my hand found its way into his hair twirling his espresso-colored locks around my fingers as we watched and waited for the story of our outing to appear. We described the afternoon's events to him when we'd returned home, and I'd never seen him with such mixed emotions. 
One minute he was fussing over my minor injuries, and the next he was pacing the floor, cursing under his breath. Rafe hated to feel useless, but there was nothing he could have done in this situation but wait with the rest of us. He was more useful than he realized, however. His presence was a balm for my nerves. The motion of my fingers running through his hair soothed me as I anxiously watched my face appear on the screen. I hated seeing myself on the television. Large blue letters scrolled across the bottom of the screen. Lewisburg's newest leader is welcomed with open arms. What? A few weeks ago, the city welcomed Claren Greenwood into the local leadership as District Director Everett Walsh's public relations advisor. Claren has an impressive resume from her time in class in city. She is credited with leading protectors to the arrests of two rebel leaders, Frank Dalton and Milo Johansson. After growing close to Senator Felix Walsh, it's no wonder she caught the eye of his father. My mouth dropped open as I watched footage from the last several months flash across the screen. Rafe leaned forward on his knees as a shot of Felix and me at his senatorial announcement appeared. Felix's arm was wrapped gingerly around my waist, and the glimmer of my golden evening gown didn't come close to the glimmer of our smiles. It was all fake, of course, designed to impress the people of class and city, but it clearly wasn't impressing Rafe. My hand dropped back to the couch as he moved his head away from me. The newscaster continued as the screen flipped to a shot of me from this afternoon, leaning out of the car window with a hopeful smile. It was a still shot, a frozen fraction of a second from before everything went wrong. And today, on a rare outing from the center, the people of Lewisburg were finally able to give her the proper greeting she deserved. The woman's eyes twinkled, and I couldn't tell if she was being sarcastic or if she truly believed the twisted footage that played before us. Silent video of the crowds yelling and pumping their fists were made to look like cheers. A split-second shot of the people moving toward our car was cut to look like they were trying desperately to greet me. There were several angles of footage, cameras that I never saw when I was out in the streets. The thought was unsettling. Where else were cameras hiding out of plain sight? I watched my face smile at the crowds again. Another shot showed me inside the boutique grinning at Agnes. Then I was shown waving. The editing of the video was a total lie. But why? Why were they spinning the attacks from this afternoon into a story of welcoming for me? I stood, a shiver crawling its way down my spine. I can't believe this. Ryder shook his head, unsurprised. They're planning something. What? I asked. I don't know, but they don't want the district to know what's really happening here in Lewisburg. None of it made any sense. What do you think, Rafe? I reached to touch his shoulder, but he shrugged me off. I don't know either, he mumbled. The whole world is full of lies and false pretenses. I swallowed. He was upset, but I didn't have time to deal with a pouty Rafe, a pouty Rafe who was technically married to another woman. I needed to find Everett. His voice rang out from inside his office as I made my way down the hall back inside the main house just minutes later. Claren, is that you? It's me, I said, turning the corner into the dimly lit room. The only light was coming from a small table lamp on his desk and the blue glow of the television resting inside one of his bookshelves. I've been looking for you, he said. It seems you've had quite the eventful day. The lump in my throat grew too big for me to swallow down again. My voice was raspy as I responded. Yes, I have, he tisked. I'd really expect your personal security to do a better job. I heard it got pretty cantankerous out there today. Shoot, he already knew the truth. We managed. I looked to the television, where the newscaster was now droning on about a new bridge being constructed on the south side of town. Did you see the news? He smirked. 
I nodded, unable to voice a response. You're welcome, he sneered and began shuffling through some papers on his desk. That was your doing? Why? He looked up again with a hard set jaw. Because I can't have you looking like a fool. We need to show the world that we have Lewisburg under control. It's more important now than ever. His voice grew louder as he spoke, his real emotion threatening to burst forth at any moment. And I realized that he was just as afraid as I was. Here I was, worrying about what he might think, but he had the supreme leadership to impress. Here, he said, extending his arm. He held an opened envelope addressed to me. I took the card from him and pulled out an invitation. He watched me closely as I skimmed the words printed on the elaborate card. It's an invitation to a party in Classen City. I know, he said. Of course he knew. He'd already opened and read it. The party is next Friday, same day as ours. He kept his watchful eyes glued to me, waiting to see how I would react. The phone rang. Once. Twice. Do you want me to get that? I asked. One of the attendants will grab it, he said with a wave of his hand. So what would you like to do? Cancel our gathering or skip the event in class and city? I chewed the inside of my lip. This felt like a test. Was he trying to determine where my loyalties were? I wanted to go back to class and city, of course, but I also needed the perfect opportunity to get information from Everett. Were you invited to the party in class and as well? The corners of his mouth lifted into a mischievous grin. I was. And have you already invited your guests here next week? Not yet. That settled it. Then I think we should go to the party in class and city together. It will be good for appearances. His grin split into a full smile. Will you wear the red dress you purchased this afternoon? A sick feeling twisted below my sternum, but this is what had to be done. Forcing a smile, I nodded. I will. Then we'll go to class and city, together. His gaze shifted to a point behind me, so I turned to find a timid young man standing in the doorway. It was an attendant I recognized from our training sessions with Rafe and Ryder. Is there something I can help you with, Bartholomew? I was sent from Miss Greenwood, sir. Everett waved me away with his hand. Go, we're finished here. He immediately turned his attention back to the stack of papers on his desk. Out in the hall, Bartholomew picked up his pace once I joined him, leading me quickly toward the staircase. I'm not supposed to ask questions, he whispered nervously, but there's someone who wants to communicate with you, now, in your room, and that's all I know. Thank you. His voice shook with urgency and fear. He didn't know what was going on, that much was clear, but he knew something wasn't right. I bounded up the stairs and swung open my bedroom door to find it empty, just as I'd expected. After locking it behind me, I pulled the communicator out of my top drawer where it lay hidden and held my finger over the button on the back. Felix's worried eyes stared back at me. You're okay, he exhaled and ran a hand through his disheveled hair. Dark circles were set even deeper below his lids than the last time we'd spoken. He looked like he'd aged a few years, though it had only been days. Of course I'm okay. Why wouldn't I be? I saw the news. My eyes widened. Did they show the real story there? No, he laughed humorlessly. They never do. But that's just it. It looked too staged, too perfect, and knowing the people in Lewisburg, I expected the worst. He narrowed his eyes and leaned in toward his communicator. Your lip. It's fine. I touched the small cut. Joy got me cleaned up really well when we got home, and it was barely noticeable. I was surprised Felix saw anything wrong at all. He didn't look convinced, but didn't press further either. Well, I have some good news. Good. It's been a long time since I've heard any. What you got? 
It turns out Emilio had an entire storeroom full of broken stun guns and their various parts. He's been working to repair them since we last talked. Has he been successful? Better than successful. Felix finally allowed himself to smile. Not the same full smile that dropped women's jaws with his good looks, but a genuine one nonetheless. He has about twenty finished weapons. They're like stun guns, only modified. Emilio set out to discover the technology that took out the embers last week, and he's determined that it was some sort of heavy-duty CED. So it's like a bunch of stun guns bundled together in a long strip, facing every direction, with their amps cranked way up to lethal levels. It was dropped in from above, and with that level of electricity going out in every direction, they weren't able to survive. He's taken the same idea and put it into a small stun gun. I'm not sure if that's a good idea. We don't know these men well enough to equip them with something so lethal. He thought of that, too. There's a dial hidden beneath a removable piece of the handle. The guns will be set to stun, but they can easily be cranked up if needed. Of course, the outsiders won't know that unless you show them. I nodded. Twenty weapons wasn't many, but hopefully it would be enough to convince Seth that my intentions were true. Thank you, Felix. I don't know what I would do without you. His cheeks grew slightly pink, but his smile faded. You're welcome. Did you get my party invitation? He looked completely defeated again now. I did. Was that arranged for us to get the weapons? Do you think I'll be able to get them without your father finding out? I'll talk to Charles down at the airport. We'll find a way to get everything back there safely. And no, there's another reason for the party. But I'm working on getting that corrected, too. Well, whatever it is, I'm sure you'll be able to fix it. I flashed an encouraging smile. It was hard to see my friend so beaten down. I didn't know what was going on back there in Klassen, but it was definitely taking its toll on him. I hope so. His blue eyes looked like endless pools of sorrow. Don't let them get you down, Felix. But I've got to get back to it now. I'll see you on Friday. I wouldn't miss it. He nodded. Just remember... No matter what you see, some things are out of my control. It was a rather cryptic way to end our call, but at least I was going to get to see Felix again soon, and better yet, we might have found a way to get the outsiders in Lewisburg to unite with the Embers. Things were beginning to look up. Chapter 24 Everett was already tipping back drinks before our plane landed outside of Classen City. He seemed nervous about the event, though I hadn't figured out why that was. Ryder sat beside me on the plane and in the car, clenching his jaw tighter with every drink Everett took. He was on edge as well. Upon arriving in the city, Everett took my hand and led me into the multi-purpose building where I'd been trained as a peacemaker what seemed like a lifetime ago. Flashbacks of Georgia running her mouth and me secretly exchanging notes with Rafe to save Cato flooded my mind. Oh, Cato. I wouldn't let my brother down. His death had to mean something when all of this was over. The inside of the building had been transformed once again into a dazzling display of grandeur. Lights, food, talented musicians, and fountains flowing with chocolate, surrounded by fruits and desserts common citizens would never ordinarily be able to afford, were meant to impress. But my days of being impressed were long over. Now all I saw was a disgusting display of wealth being flaunted in the faces of those who would never know what it meant to be fully satisfied. Returning to this place, to my home in Klassen City, reignited something primal in me. The urge to fight, no matter what it might cost, stirred up in my belly. And I knew this was all worth it. The fake smiles and the parties were just stepping stones to the bigger change that would happen. I would see to it. Everett's fingers squeezed gently around my hand. Would you like me to grab you a drink? His eyes wandered over to the bar just outside of the main ballroom. No, thank you, but you go ahead. I'll meet you inside. 
He paused, debating whether or not to let me go on without him, but ultimately his need for another drink won over. He nodded. I'll see you inside. He tapped my rear and turned toward the bar. Ryder shook his head. I swear, I've had about enough of his wandering hands. Me too, Ryder. Me too. My eyes raked over the large room we entered next, searching for the other head of golden hair and crystal blue eyes I knew so well. Where was Felix? There were more people packed into the ballroom than I'd ever seen gathered in the place before, even more than when Felix was named Senator. Whatever the occasion, it must have been big. I wriggled my way through the crowd, scratching the sides of my arms on sequined dresses and stepping around sharply dressed men as I pushed through toward the stage. Still no sign of Felix. I did see Emmeline over in the corner, though, chatting with Cynthia George. Cynthia's navy blue dress practically glowed, silver sparkles reflecting off in every direction. It made the swirls of her tattoo almost beautiful, in a terrifying kind of way. She and Emmeline seemed to be getting along well, deep in conversation. Yet, I swore I saw Emmeline's gaze flash over to me, just for the briefest of seconds, before she turned back to the woman. If Cynthia was here, did that mean Conrad had returned as well? Heat rose into my cheeks at the thought, and I spun to look for him. I didn't care if he was a supreme leader himself. He wasn't going to get away with murdering any more of my people. Emilio caught my arm as I turned around, grinning from ear to ear. Emilio! I threw my arms around him. Long time no see, he giggled. I'd miss that silly little high-pitched noise he made when he was nervous. And Ryder, my man! They exchanged some kind of guy-handshake backslap. Then Emilio turned back to me. I hear you've been keeping pretty busy in Alberg. He gave a conspiratorial wink. I laughed. I have. And Felix told me you've been helping back here. I straightened my expression and took his shoulder in my hand. Thank you. I mean it. I told Felix already. I don't know what I'd do without you guys. You got it. Where is Felix anyway? I haven't seen him yet. Emilio stiffened. Oh, you know, just preparing, I'm sure. He ran his hand through his hair. Come on, Aiden will be ticked if you guys don't say hi. We followed Emilio over to where Aiden stood in a group of gorgeous mixed company. The blonde woman I knew to be his wife draped herself casually over his arm, looking unnaturally beautiful in a deep purple gown. Claren! Aiden grinned and pulled me into a side hug. And Ryder! I always knew you'd end up in some cushy office job. You know as well as anyone that being the head of my personal security is anything but cushy. I gave him a playfully stern look. Aiden laughed. Do you remember my wife? This is Abigail. Abigail, Claren. We nodded our greetings. Where's your lady tonight, E? Aiden smacked him on the upper arm. I glanced at Emilio. The thought that he was married had never crossed my mind. He must have noticed my expression because he chuckled. At home. She hates these kinds of events. Of course he was married. He was over twenty, which meant he'd already been matched. But Ryder was over twenty-two. That meant he... I turned to Ryder, who was closely watching my every move. He subtly shook his head. Not now. Hmm. I'd file that away as another one of Ryder's mysteries. One day I'd figure him out, maybe. But right now, all I wanted to do was find Felix. I'm so glad I ran into you guys tonight. You look well. I flashed a genuine smile at my boys. They'd become a little like family after all the adventures we'd gone through in the outside with the exiled. I almost missed those days. At least the exiled were a group we could handle. The supreme leadership was a whole other beast. Take care of yourselves, I added. I'm going to go find Felix. He's prob- Aiden's words were cut off by Emilio's elbow in his ribs. Something was definitely going on here, 
but I'd have better luck finding him on my own than wasting my breath trying to get information out of these guys. That was a downside to having a team that had become like brothers. Never mind. Aiden shoved his hands into the pockets of his suit pants. Mind if we keep your bodyguard here for a few minutes? We've got some catching up to do. Aiden's eyes moved back and forth between Ryder and one of Aiden's wife's friends standing nearby. I grinned. Keep him as long as you want. I promise I'll be good. I winked at Ryder and turned back into the crowd. I moved through the warm bodies, faking pleasantries and trying to remove myself from small talk as quickly as possible. The leaders and peacemakers surrounding me were friendly enough, but I wasn't here to engage in conversation. I needed to find Felix. Where was he? Well, look who it is! A familiar, nasally voice stopped me in my tracks. Hi, Georgia. She sneered in response. I have to say, I'm surprised to see you here at my party. Your party? She twisted her overly made-up features into an exaggerated pout. Oh, you poor thing. No one told you? I tried to wave her away. I didn't have time for this. Georgia was barely a speck on my radar of problems these days. I stepped to the side to move around her and spotted Edgar watching us nervously along the wall behind her. He frowned when he saw me and looked away. Our last interaction had been a bit awkward. He asked me about life outside. I lied to him, diminishing any hope he may have had. The truth was, the deeper he got involved with the leadership, the less I could trust him. Which was unfortunate, because deep down, I still believed Edgar was a good guy, and he was the only other person who understood what it was like to be thrust from a humble upbringing like we'd experienced in Morton into the spotlight of everything the leadership stood for. Georgia pushed herself back in front of me. Today is my birthday. Be rude, and I may just have you escorted out of here before the big announcement. I turned my focus back on her and forced a sickly sweet smile on my face. Well, happy birthday, sunshine. Now if you'll excuse me, I'm looking for someone. She rolled her eyes and mumbled something condescending under her breath, but I didn't hear her. I was too distracted by the strong outline of a man who just entered the room. Felix smiled and waved at a couple of members of the media who crowded around him, but it was only half a smile at best. He was still exhausted. I could see it in the way he walked. Felix! I called out to him, but he met my eyes with a look of grief. He glanced at Georgia, then back to me, and I immediately began making my way in his direction. But instead of meeting me halfway, he turned and began heading for the platform set up at the front of the room. People in the crowd smiled and patted him on the back as he made his way toward the front, but he never turned back to me. He just walked away, as though he hadn't spotted me at all. I'd like to call Miss Georgia Hines to the stage. I glanced up to spot Justice Hines, Georgia's mom, standing proudly on the platform with a microphone in her hand. I turned back to Georgia, whose smug smile made me want to crack her nose as she passed me on her way to the front. The point of her heel crushed down on the top of my foot as she stepped by me, nearly knocking me off balance. Georgia Hines was one person I definitely did not miss in Class and City. Felix stood off to the side of the platform, staring at an invisible spot on the wall. His mind was anywhere but here, and despite my many attempts to get his attention, he never looked my way again. Justice Hines prattled on about her daughter's many accomplishments and an over-the-top birthday speech, but I was only focused on Felix. What was wrong with him? Had he been hurt? The grimace on his face definitely had me wondering. So join me in a round of applause to celebrate the most accomplished 20-year-old woman Classen City has ever seen. Justice Hines beamed as the audience roared with applause all around us. Thank you, thank you. Happy birthday, sweetheart. She kissed Georgia on the temple. 
It looked so unnatural. I wondered if she'd ever shown her daughter affection before, or if this was completely for show. I was leaning towards the latter. And now I promised I wouldn't embarrass her on her birthday, but I know you will all be just as excited as I am about one more new development here in Classen City. Would Senator Walsh please join us on the stage? Felix forced a smile as he stepped up to join them. He wore his politician's mask, the look of a true professional, but he was completely broken inside. Couldn't anyone else see that? Georgia and her mother especially should have been able to notice it with their empathic skills. He'd stepped up beside Georgia and took her hand into his. I felt like I might be sick as his tanned fingers twisted loosely around her pale flesh. Now that my dearest daughter has reached the official age of adulthood, it is time for me to say goodbye as her mother so she can go and begin a new family of her own. And while this is a difficult moment for any parent, her spouse match is a man anyone would be proud to call her son. Felix Walsh and Georgia Hines, I suppose it's official now. You have been matched. Welcome to the family, son. Chapter 25 Matched. Felix was matched with Georgia. A gasp lodged in my chest like a boulder. My sweet, tender Felix was assigned to spend the rest of his life with a loud, abrasive, self-centered girl who would no doubt leave him miserable. Her painted little pout that spewed nothing but negativity would press against the lips that once kissed mine. But then again, why didn't he stop it? He was the senator, the most powerful man in all of Classen City. Seeing him up there on the stage with that horrible girl and her beast of a mother almost made me feel sorry for him. Almost. He should have been able to stop the match. There was no reason for him to stand there beside her. Unless a part of him actually wanted it. She may have had a rotten personality, but she was beautiful in a vindictive kind of way. Maybe looks matter to Felix more than I thought. They certainly matter to Everett, and you know what they say, the apple doesn't fall far from the tree. Suddenly, overwhelmed with all the emotion in the room, I twisted around to locate an exit and caught Edgar's eye again. The way he watched me was almost incriminating. His small eyes were round with remorse, and as they locked onto mine, I felt as though I'd been punched in the gut. The ache of betrayal flexed in my core, and I needed to get out of there. Edgar moved as well, picking up his pace as I did, and angled himself toward my path. He caught me by the arm just before I made it to the back exit, and pulled me to the side near a table full of cheese cubes. I'm sorry. I yanked my arm loose. What did you do? Edgar looked down to his toes before finding his resolve and meeting my eyes again. Then he glanced toward Felix and Georgia up on the stage. I didn't think it would go this far. His eyes were glassy as he fixed them back on me. I was only trying to help you. His sincerity struck me. I would hear what he had to say, but I knew it was going to hurt. Start at the beginning, Edgar. He ran a hand through his hair. After you left, Justice Hines made it her mission to have Georgia replace you. She saw an opening, and she pushed her daughter toward it as hard as she could. Georgia was working nearly nonstop, trying to prove her worth to the leaders, specifically the supreme leadership. But something went wrong. The attacks and the consultant she was working with disappeared, along with Milo. Edgar nodded. Justice Hines swore you had something to do with it. She thought maybe you fed weapons into the outside camps. She suspected they broke in to free Milo and killed Conrad in the process. Then she believed they turned on each other. I would never, I stammered. I know, but she went mad with the idea, so she took matters into her own hands. That night you hosted her in Lewisburg. She placed an amplifier in your room. My hand flew to my mouth. She'd been listening to me, reading my thoughts. The room spun in my periphery, making me sick. 
There was no way I would be able to explain my way out of the information they must have heard over the last two weeks. It's okay. You don't spend much time in your room. But unfortunately, she put Georgia in charge of the monitoring. Georgia has always had a harder time interpreting you. It's more difficult to interpret the thoughts of empaths in general, but you're a particularly complex puzzle. Even so, Georgia was determined to catch you plotting something against us. When you were preparing to make the first call to Felix, I knew I had to step in and do something. So I distracted her. There was so much more going on behind the scenes than I could have ever imagined. But I still didn't understand why Edgar was suffering from the heavy guilt that hung between us. They made him listen in. I knew it wasn't his choice. By all accounts, he had been more helpful than harmful. What kind of distraction did you use? I asked hesitantly. Felix. His cheeks reddened. I assumed her mother had been pushing her toward Felix, based on interactions I'd seen between them, but Felix made it clear he wasn't interested. So I, uh... He shifted on his feet, avoiding eye contact with me. I might have manipulated things a little bit. I told her how much I thought Felix was interested in her. I've gotten really good at projecting, too. And when you and Felix would talk, I would focus her attention on Felix's sour mood. I made her believe he didn't want to talk to you. I convinced Georgia that he only had eyes for her. And that worked? Better than I could have imagined. She was blinded by her narcissism. She became just as obsessed with snagging Felix as her mother. And she must have fed my lies up the chain, because Justice Hines is the one who petitioned for their match. But Felix is a senator. Doesn't he get a say in the matter? Edgar shook his head. Apparently, their genetics are a strong match, and politically speaking, they make a powerful couple. It was easy for Justice Hines to convince the rest of the leadership to make it official. I looked behind me again and caught Felix's eye for a fraction of a second before he looked away. Shame was written all over his face. It was a relief to know this wasn't his fault, and it wasn't permanent. We'd find a way to break the match. It would just take some time to get proof that it wasn't ideal. Thank you, Edgar, and for what it's worth, I'm not angry with you. His face brightened. You're not? No, Felix is strong. If he knew what Georgia was about to discover through our conversations, I'm certain he would have offered to match with her himself. And it's not forever. I know. But given your feelings for him... My brows pulled together. I don't have any feelings for Felix. Edgar's pink cheeks grew even redder. His mouth parted, but nothing came out at first. Several different reactions flashed across his face before he finally said, Okay. He didn't believe me. As one of the stronger empaths in our training class, I would have expected him to be a little more perceptive. Anyway, I said with a little too much force, I need to step out for a minute. I appreciate you letting me know what happened. I started to turn away. Wait. He reached for my hand again and stepped in a little closer, dropping his voice. Georgia might have been too distracted to realize what was going on, but I wasn't. His expression grew serious. I know about the embers and the weapons, and I want you to know you can count on me. Anything you need, I'm here for you, no matter what. And whatever it is you're planning to do to get more information about the Supreme Leadership, well, just be careful, okay? I held his knowing gaze for a few heartbeats before squeezing his hand. As frustrated as I was that he was listening in on my thoughts and conversations without my permission, I was more grateful than angry. He was doing his job, keeping up the ruse, and he was on our side. I didn't doubt it. Thank you, I whispered. Then I turned toward the exit, wiping the moisture from my eyes as I went. Unsurprisingly, I found Everett propped up on the bar outside of the ballroom, glassy-eyed with a sloppy grin. 
His careful control had been slipping more and more as of late, revealing the untamed version of himself behind the politician's mask. Congratulations, I said, sliding up on a bar stool beside him. Your future daughter-in-law is lovely. A muscle twitched in his cheek, and something vile tinged the air. Everett wasn't happy about the match either. But why? It was an interesting choice, he slurred. But now any other prospects my son may have had in mind are back on the market, free for the taking. He held up two fingers for the bartender before settling his eyes back on me, allowing their burning gaze to slide up and down my body. My nerves screamed at me to get away. He was a predator. But this was the moment I'd been waiting for. A drunken, worn-down Everett was the most likely to spill what he knew about the supreme leadership. I would get my information, and then I'd be on my way. I'd planned every detail of this, after all. The scarlet dress I wore was chosen with him in mind. The neckline dipped down between my breasts, and the skirt was sheer enough to tease onlookers with the silhouette of my legs. He drank in every bit of me as I resisted the urge to cross my arms and swallow down the bile rising in the back of my throat. I'll keep this quick, I promised myself. I'll be finished before he can lay a finger on me. The bartender slid two crystal glasses filled with a deep amber liquid across the lacquered wood we leaned against. Everett palmed each glass and nodded at the young man who served him. The man looked warily at me as Everett gestured for me to follow him to a doorway just beyond the bar. Now where are you taking me? My giggle was supposed to sound playful and flirty, but it came out a bit more strangled. I cleared my throat. We're going on a little adventure. He winked and allowed his gaze to linger a little longer below my shoulders. Chill bumps dotted my arms, another warning from my body to run, but I couldn't. Not yet. I instinctively scanned the ballroom again as we passed it by, searching for Ryder or Aiden or even Edgar, anyone who might be able to put eyes on me. I didn't want to follow Everett, but it was the only way he'd let down his guard enough to reveal what he knew. I would have felt a lot better about it if someone else knew where I was going, but they were all lost in the crowd. The doorway led to a back set of stairs, and alcohol sloshed over the edges of the glasses as Everett stumbled his way up the steps. Would you like me to carry those? I think I can handle this, if nothing else. His tone dripped with bitter resentment. Everett was in full force tonight. The landing at the top of the stairs opened into a wide hallway full of offices. Everett tucked one glass in the crook of his left arm as he wiggled a doorknob beside us. Is there anything you can't handle? I've been very impressed with you in Lewisburg. He tried another door handle, then paused. Oh, yeah? How so? You just exude leadership from your pores. You're a natural. Oh, goodness, I was horrible at this. But Everett looked like he was drinking my words in. So I continued. I mean, even the supreme leadership has taken notice of your abilities. I bit my lower lip, trying to think of a segue into the real line of questioning I wanted him to answer. But that may have been a bad idea. Everett's chest rose and fell heavily with deep breaths as he dropped his eyes to my mouth. The predatorial tilt of his head caused me to retreat another step. He moved quickly to close the gap, but I stayed one step ahead. The only bad side of it is they have you wrapped up all the time. You're always in meetings or on the phone. I never get to see you around the house anymore. I pushed my lips into a pout again, knowing the effect it had on him. My feet continued to move me in the opposite direction, and he twisted and yanked on another office doorknob before prowling along after me. What are you all talking about in those meetings, anyway? After the third or fourth locked door, Everett slammed his free hand against the frame, and the unsecured glass of alcohol slipped through his opposite arm, shattering on the floor. 
The scent of whiskey stung the back of my nose, and I watched as the golden liquid spread slowly across the tile floor, channeling in the grout like a tiny stream. Everett cursed loudly. Let me help you, I said. For the first time, I wondered if Everett was maybe too far gone. Was he even coherent enough to hold a real conversation? I dropped down to pick up the broken pieces when Everett's previously polished, now sticky dress shoe crunched a shard of glass in front of me. No, get up. I squeezed my hand into a fist to prevent it from shaking as I stood. Everett was too close. His breath was hot on my face, the pungent fumes of the liquor burning my eyes and toying with my gag reflex as he leaned in. Leaders don't clean floors. I won't have my companion reduced to the work of a maid. If you're going to be working at all, it's going to be for me. His eyes shot down to my lips again, which were trembling at the raw desire I saw barely contained behind his shattered facade. I tried to step away again, but I was too slow. He slammed his face into mine, knocking our foreheads together as he moved his mouth hungrily against mine. My body revolted at his touch, but he overpowered me. As I struggled to push him away, he pushed back, slamming our bodies into the door behind me. His chin was wet with sweat or dribble, maybe spilled alcohol, and his whiskers scraped roughly against my chin and cheeks as he continued to smother me with his lips. I felt like I was drowning. I didn't even have room to scream for help. I knew Everett had the worst kind of intentions, but I never expected him to act so brazenly without warning. My well-laid plan had turned into my worst nightmare. Then we were moving again, backwards into a dark office. My hands gripped desperately at the doorframe, holding tight with all my strength to prevent him from pulling me further away from help. But it was no use. Without the door behind me, I fell backwards onto the cold floor, looking up into the eyes of a lunatic. Something was off. Everett looked frantic, but his eyes weren't crazy with lust or rage. He was terrified. I scrambled backward, rising to my feet, before I saw the source of his terror. The dark silhouette of another person emerged from the shadows behind Everett, and in the person's outstretched hands, light glinted off of a metal gun, pointed directly at Everett's head. My body went cold, and I tried to scream again, but no noise came out. I didn't think the night could get any worse, but it was full of surprises. We were only just getting started. Chapter 26 My, my, Everett, what a surprise! The syrupy, sweet tone of Emmeline's voice didn't match the fury evident on her face as she flicked on the lights. A fluorescent bulb blinked rapidly overhead, causing greenish reflections to dance awkwardly across her petite face. Her gun hand never moved. The steel of the barrel pushed into Everett's temple, stretching the skin around his horrified eye toward the ceiling. It's been a long time since I last saw you creeping around these halls late at night with frightened young women. Couldn't get enough back in Lewisburg. Had to come back to class and city. Emmeline pushed the gun harder against his head, knocking it into a strange angle. I backed up toward the desk, watching slack-jawed as the scene unfolded before me. I'd seen Emmeline angry before, but this was different. She'd snapped. And honestly, I kind of liked the unleashed Emmeline. That was until she cut her icy glare back over in my direction. What are you doing up here with him, Claren? Her question was accusing, but I didn't feel attacked. She was almost afraid. She's digging for information, and if she's gonna play with the big boys, she's gotta learn that information isn't free. Emmeline shoved his head with a barrel again, and Everett grimaced. What kind of information are you after? she asked me. She wants to know about the supreme leadership. Emmeline slapped Everett across the cheek with her pistol before immediately pointing it at him again. Let the woman speak for herself. 
part of me wanted to cheer her on. There was a sweet satisfaction in watching Everett flinch under her control. But a bigger part of me feared what else this crazed version of Emmeline had lying up her sleeve. What had caused her to snap, and would she hold that gun to my head next? Everett spat on the floor, swirls of red tinging his saliva. He was right. I was looking to gain information about the Supreme Leadership, but I could never admit that in front of these two, especially not with a crazy Emmeline gripping a gun. I just needed some air. Then Everett offered me a drink and we stepped out somewhere quieter. My voice was surprisingly steady. Emmeline raised a single brow and the corner of her pink mouth twitched. Well then, I'm sorry I interrupted. Her arms fell to her side with a shrug. I'll let you get back to it. She smirked, daring me to object, and stepped toward the door. Then, with a final glance over her shoulder, she added, But for the record, if you want to know about the supreme leadership, you should come to me next time. It seems I have a direct connection now. Everett's jaw clenched so hard I thought it might snap. His face twisted into a loathsome sneer. Not for long. Not after they hear about this. Emmeline's laughter tinkled like a music box full of delicate charms. Oh, Evie, you know they'll trust my word over yours any day, and Claren won't tell, will you? She winked. Not when I have so many juicy details to divulge to her. My heart pounded against my ribs, punching again and again with incredible fervor. But my traitorous feet were glued to the floor. I couldn't move. I couldn't speak. None of this made any sense. What had gotten into Emmeline? This had to be a trap. She would never offer information to me, not without expecting something huge in return. And I would not be indebted to Emmeline or anyone, ever. But what if she meant it? What if she really was willing to tell me what I wanted to know? Wait, don't go! The words rushed from my mouth before I could give it any other thought. I wouldn't be able to find out about the Supreme Leadership's plans from Everett anymore, so Emmeline may have been my only shot. Everett's eyes widened. She's a liar, Claren. You can't believe a word this woman says. Let's get out of here before she gets us both in trouble. Shut up, Everett. Emmeline raised the gun again. Sit down. You're not in charge here. I am. And Claren has some questions. With her weapon still trained on Everett, she turned to me and smiled sweetly. What can I help you with, dear? I wiped my sweaty palms against my thighs, but they slid uselessly across the chiffon of my skirt. I clasped them in front of me to keep from trembling. If only I could have gotten a better read on what Emmeline was thinking, I might have been able to form a more cohesive plan. But she was blocking herself so thoroughly that I was shooting into the dark. I'd have to be careful not to incriminate myself. I'm told the consultant who was working with Justice Hines, Conrad Reynolds, left the day the attacks took place outside. I know it's believed that the outsiders turned against each other, but I find his departure convenient. Has anyone been in contact with him since then? Three full breaths rattled in and out of my mouth before Emmeline answered. That's an interesting question. Are you implying that he may have been responsible for the attacks rather than the outsiders? She and Everett both turned and silently waited for my response. My mouth was like cotton, which made it near impossible to swallow the lump in my throat. I just think it's peculiar timing. I'm not accusing anyone of anything, but the question has to be asked. Her blue eyes refocused on me, razor sharp. Then, to my relief, her face split into a wide smile. She looked almost proud. Yes, Claren. The Supreme Leadership is responsible for murdering 47 people living outside of Classen City. Emmeline! I told you to shut up, she hissed at Everett. Do you have any other questions? she asked, 
turning back to me. I slumped against the desk. She stood there with so much pride on her face, looking more and more like a monster. What did she have to gain here? I would probably pay for this, but I had to find out more. I studied my shoulders. Are they going to attack again? Probably yes. I'll know more next week. No more! Everett stood and slapped Emmeline across the cheek while simultaneously knocking her weapon across the room with his opposite hand. It hit the ground with a loud clack and slid a few feet in front of me. I scrambled for the gun, but Everett came and stepped on my fingers as I reached out to grab it. That's enough! His voice was a growl, all previous symptoms of his inebriation gone. He kept his full weight pressed down on my hand, pinning me awkwardly on the floor. Emmeline approached with a fire in her eyes, but she halted just before she reached us, glancing at the door before returning her gaze to us. The fire was gone, replaced with a deeper, raw emotion I couldn't quite put my finger on, but her jaw remained taut. They'll kill you for this. Everett was fuming. They've got eyes everywhere. You'll be destroyed like the traitor you are. And you... He ground his shoe on the back of my hand, causing a whimper to escape my mouth. Your job is to stay quiet and look pretty. Stop asking questions. Now get up. We're going home. He reached for my wrist and yanked me forcefully to my feet, my hand hanging lifelessly from his like it had been shattered inside. It probably had. I looked to Emmeline, hoping that the hatred she felt for Everett would be enough for her to rescue me but she remained straight-faced, eyes fixed on the door. Everett gave another hard tug of my injured hand, eliciting a cry of pain from my lips. I stumbled forward, crashing into the back of him. Then my body burned with pain all over as I was knocked backward again into the desk. Everett's form collapsed to the floor, and just beyond him, like a raging knight in a black tie, stood Felix with a stun gun still held out in his trembling hands. Ryder stood in the doorway behind him, concern mixed with rage swirling in his steely eyes. It's about time! Emmeline crossed her arms over her chest. Felix rushed over and dropped to his knees, cradling my cheek with his hand. Are you hurt? It was then I realized I was crying. No, I'm not hurt. I glanced nervously at Emmeline. Felix followed my gaze. One monster down, one to go. Thankfully, I had backup now. She moved toward us, and I reflexively scooted back on the floor. A brief flash of hurt glimmered in her eye before she knelt down and extended her arm. Let me see your hand. I paused, unsure of what to do next. I'd never been so confused, so unsure of anyone before in my life. There was no mistaking the look on her face when she'd confirmed my suspicions about the attacks. But now I was consumed by an overwhelming sense of concern. It felt like Emmeline actually cared about me. No, she's fine, Ryder said, joining us near the desk. He looked down, brows knitted together in concern. I nodded that, yes, I was fine, and he turned back to keep a watchful eye on Emmeline. Felix helped me to my feet, lifting me gingerly under the arms so as not to disturb my injury. Emmeline stood as well, and the men stepped between us to form a physical boundary. Wait! I pushed between them to study Emmeline's expression. She seemed genuine. But she'd seemed genuine before, and that had only gotten me into traps. What were her intentions here? Claren, we have much to discuss— but first, we need to get Everett's body secured. He won't be out for long. Felix ran a hand through his hair, panic streaking his face. Oh my goodness, what have I done? You were saving the woman you love, Emmeline said matter-of-factly, which is all well and good, but now we have to clean up the mess. Felix opened his mouth, but thought better of speaking and turned back to his father's lifeless form on the floor. Ryder was already pulling zip ties from the pocket of his suit coat. It was just like him to be prepared for something like this. I'll get his hands. 
he passed a few ties to Emmeline. You get his feet. Chapter 27 Are you sure you're okay? Felix's eyes danced across my face, checking for injuries. I should have insisted for you to come back with me when I was in Lewisburg. I'm so sorry, Claren. He rubbed his thumb tenderly across my cheek. You have nothing to be sorry for. You know I wouldn't have listened anyway. We locked eyes, and he flashed me a boyish half-grin. I'd missed that smile. You two ready? Ryder stood and wiped sweat from his brow. Yeah, I'll help you carry him. Felix stood, but Emmeline held out a hand. I've got it, she said. I'll grab his legs if Ryder can get his torso. You stick with Claren. Wait, I said. Where are you taking him? Right now we'll get him down the back stairs and into the parking lot. My car is around the corner, so I'll bring it over for him. I narrowed my eyes at her. Again, it seemed like she was speaking the truth, but how could I be sure? If she sent us down there with Everett's body and we got caught in the parking lot, we'd be executed. What about when he wakes up? Felix's grin was gone as he glared down at his father's body. He's gagged and tied. He won't be much of an issue. And if he tries to put up a fight, we'll stun him again. Emmeline didn't have a shred of worry. We can't keep stunning him forever, and he'll have us all executed when he comes around again. We should just finish him off now. Felix, I gasped. We can't kill him. Ryder shrugged. Why not? He's got a point. We're going to have to do it eventually. Not yet, Emmeline said. We need him alive right now. We'll drive him out to the airport, and Charles will help us get him back to Lewisburg. Claren, do you have a driver we can trust to not ask questions if Everett refuses to cooperate? I have a driver I can trust, yes. But to be honest, I'm not convinced that I should trust you. Why are you doing this? Emmeline looked down at Everett and sighed. Because I'm tired of people like him. You and I are more alike than you might think. I want to tell you everything, but right now we have to get him out of here. There's a key in the side pocket of my purse. Use it to unlock the top drawer of my desk and grab the notebook sitting inside. Then meet us down in the parking lot. She bent to lift Everett's legs, and Ryder moved to handle the front half of his body. He picked up Everett's dead weight with ease, and they disappeared into the hall, the skirt of Emmeline's gown swishing behind them. What do you think about all of this, Felix? Do you trust her? I don't think we have a choice. Emmeline's small black satin clutch rested atop a chair in the corner of the office. Now that the excitement had died down, I recognized it as the same office I'd sat in to talk with Emmeline many times before. It was in this very same place that I'd agreed to help her capture Frank. I shouldn't have trusted her then, and I probably shouldn't trust her now. But Felix was right. We didn't have many options. A tiny silver key lay tucked away in the side pocket of the clutch, and I quickly slid it into the lock of her desk drawer. Sitting inside was a gorgeous leather-bound notebook. Its rich burgundy cover felt like butter in my hand. It was beautiful, and somehow it felt powerful, almost sacred. She didn't need to tell me to keep it safe. Somehow, the book spoke of its importance all on its own. I tucked the book safely under my arm and turned toward the door. Before we go down there, I feel like I need to explain about Georgia. Felix looked down to his feet, but it didn't hide the flush creeping up his cheeks. You don't have to explain anything. I tried to sound light and carefree, like the sight of him holding her hand didn't feel like a knife to the gut, but my voice betrayed me. Claren, if it were up to me, I held up my hand. Really, I know how the game works. I know you have to play along, and it's none of my business how you feel about it. We'll find a way to get you out when the time is right. His face twisted as he met my eyes. I'm not sure if I'll be able to get out of this one. Then we'll tear down the system that's keeping you there. 
We stared at one another for a long minute. Somewhere, deep inside, I imagined Felix still had a glimmer of hope. But if he did, it was buried so far under his despair that I feared it might never see the light of day. Eventually, he nodded and followed me out into the dimly lit hall. We stepped over the broken glass and sticky mess from Everett's spilled drink and tiptoed toward the stairs. No one was around, but neither of us dared to speak until we made it into the stairwell. Thank you, by the way. I don't know what would have happened if you and Ryder hadn't shown up when you did. How did you know where to find me? I was watching you during the announcement. You looked so shocked. And when you left the ballroom, I worried you were upset, that you might never forgive me. I needed you to know that I did everything I could to stop the match from happening. I tried right up until the party started. I didn't say anything before, because I hoped I could still prevent all of this. He laughed, but there was no humor in his voice. My heart ached for him. Felix was strong, capable, and smart. He was commanding, but kind. He was everything a leader should be. And yet he held no power. Not really. He was just a title with a handsome face, and it was never more evident than now how powerless he truly was. Anyway, I searched for you as soon as I could step off the stage. I met up with Ryder, and Edgar told us he saw you go to the bar with my father. The bartender directed us here. I would have come in for you right away, but Ryder was afraid of what Emmeline might do, so we waited just outside the door, listening. But when I heard you cry out in pain, I couldn't wait any longer. Emmeline. She knew they were there the whole time. She had to have known. That's why she quit fighting and stared at the door. Do you have any idea what she was talking about, or why she would be working against your dad? He shook his head. No. Emmeline is a bit of a wild card. I don't know what she's up to, but it doesn't surprise me that she hates my father. Most people do. I'm sure she has her reasons for wanting him out of the picture. He was probably right, but I'd make it a point to learn as much as I could. If everything worked out tonight, I would have some leverage over Emmeline. She was just as guilty in covering up this offense against Everett as we were, and she had more to lose. Well, I'm glad you came when you did, and you landed a great shot. He smiled, and it reached his eyes this time. Thanks. I've been dreaming of doing that for the last five years. It felt better than I expected. I just wish you didn't have to get hurt. He stopped on the bottom landing and took both of my hands into his. I will never let him hurt you again. I'll kill him if I have to, and anyone else who tries to hurt you. His eyes shifted to the door that led out to the parking lot where Emmeline was waiting. Thank you again. For all of it. I squeezed his hands before letting go and grabbing the door handle. Let's get out there. The air was chilly outside, and it cut through the thin fabric of my dress, sending chill bumps down my legs. Once my eyes adjusted to the light, I made out the shadowy outline of Ryder standing near the corner of the building. He was alone. Where's Emmeline? I asked once we reached him. Ryder was too busy scouring the area to make eye contact with us. She's getting the car. My heart rate jumped. How sure are you? Headlights flicked on across the street, and Ryder moved toward the bushes bordering the outside wall of the building. The sounds of laughter rang out just down the street. A small group of guests from the party were leaving. More would be sure to follow. We have to hurry. Felix helped Ryder slide Everett's body out from under the bushes, and they tossed him onto the floorboard in the back seat of Emmeline's small coupe with surprising speed as soon as she rolled to a stop near the curb. His body had to bend in uncomfortable angles to fit, and his head was pushed slightly under the back of Emmeline's seat. Once Everett was securely out of sight, Felix pulled open the passenger's door for me to climb in. Ryder hopped into the back, laying his long legs sideways across the seat so he wouldn't step on Everett. "'Aren't you coming?' I asked Felix. "'He can't,' Emmeline said firmly, and one look at Felix told me he'd already come to the same conclusion. I hated to leave him behind, forced to process everything that just happened on his own. 
but he stood tall and strong, unafraid for himself. Any concern or worry he felt was poured straight into me. He only cared about my well-being. I have to stay. Please, keep her safe, he said to Ryder. Then, facing Emmeline, he said, There's a crate at the airport. I know you're in a hurry, but you cannot leave without getting it on the plane. It's got to go out tonight. Charles knows what to do. Emmeline nodded without a trace of suspicion. I'll make sure your package arrives safely. Felix leaned in through the open window and placed a quick kiss on my cheek. Be careful, Claren. His gaze flicked briefly to Emmeline. You know how to get in touch if you need me. You be careful, too. We'll talk soon. There was more I wanted to say, so much more. But Emmeline was already driving away, away from the party, away from the center, away from the secrets of class and city. Felix stood still on the curb, his eyes never leaving the car. I watched him grow smaller and smaller through the side mirror until we turned a corner and he was finally out of sight. And a strange feeling washed over me, like I was leaving something precious behind. We hadn't even made it to the edge of town before Everett began stirring in the back seat. Emmeline, Ryder, and I sat quietly, none of us making a single sound, as his writhing increased and muffled groans made their way through the gag in his mouth. Emmeline picked up speed, going much faster than the legal limits, as we zipped across the empty streets of Classen City. Finally, we were out, flying down the roads of the outside toward the airstrip. Everett's strength was back, and he fought violently against his restraints. I turned and made eye contact with Ryder, who had one foot placed firmly against the back of Everett's head, holding him solidly in a position that kept him facing the underside of Emmeline's seat. I made a gun shape with my hand, pulling an invisible trigger as I silently mouthed, Stun him. Ryder shook his head, though his hand was gripping the weapon. He nodded toward Emmeline. When we arrived in front of the hangar, Emmeline gestured for me to get out of the car. I joined her near the trunk, aware of my position, so that Ryder could keep an eye on us through the window. I still didn't trust her. Thank you for staying quiet, she said. I know you must have so many questions, but we can't talk in front of Everett. Did you get the journal? Yes, it's in the car. Good. Take it on the plane, and do not let it out of your sight. I'll be joining you back in Lewisburg, but I won't be sitting with you on the flight. I need to speak with Everett when he wakes up again. You and Ryder stay up front so he won't see you, and I'll stay with him in the back. Unease twisted my insides. After everything that happened, it felt foolish to trap myself inside a small vessel in the sky with Emmeline and Everett. There was truly no escaping a plane in flight. And yet... I still felt compelled to trust her. Was she manipulating me again? Emmeline's lips pulled into a pout. I know you have no reason to believe I'm on your side, but I am. It will all make sense soon, I promise. We'll talk all about it when we get back to Everett's house. She walked over to Ryder's window and gave two quick taps and a nod. Ryder opened the door, not bothering to avoid Everett's body, as he harshly stepped out of the vehicle, eliciting a loud grunt from the man. Then he raised his weapon and pulled the trigger. Everett's body jolted once before going limp again. Charles! Emmeline called out over her shoulder. Will you please help us with our extra baggage here? Chapter 28 my knuckles were white around the armrests of my seat as our plane soared high up into the air. This was my third time on a plane, and the feeling was still just as unnerving as the first time I flew. Beside me, Ryder looked much less concerned. We didn't have time to grab our things before leaving the party, so I had nothing to hide Emmeline's journal in but my dress, and there really wasn't much to the dress. I slid it under my thigh once we were seated on the plane, and it pressed into my leg during the flight, a constant reminder of the treasure inside. It felt like a treasure, anyway. It could have been just a list of Emmeline's favorite restaurants for all I really knew, but something told me it was more than that, 
it was something worth hiding, even from Ryder. And as badly as I wanted to unsnap the closure and flip through its pages, I knew it would be better to wait until I was alone. The plane wasn't terribly small, but it felt as though Ryder and I were in our own private room. Charles and Dusty, our pilots, sat up front in the cockpit. Felix's large crate sat in the middle of the plane, separating us from Emmeline and Everett, who was still thoroughly knocked out, last I checked, in the back. Though we were essentially alone, it still felt necessary to whisper. Do you have any idea what Emmeline is up to? Ryder shook his head. No, but I'm not too worried about her. Why not? I thought she was pretty intimidating personally. Because as soon as she accepted the zip ties from me back in her office, she made herself an accomplice to our crime. Any peacemaker worth their weight would be able to deduce the truth in an interrogation. So she won't be able to turn us in without getting herself executed as well. I nodded my appreciation of his tactics. That's right. Ryder grinned. Hmm, I said. You're smarter than you look. I'm more than just a pretty face, he said with a serious expression, and I couldn't help but laugh. It had been a long day, and the laughter felt good, but reality would come crashing back in as soon as we landed near Lewisburg. Turning toward the small window next to my seat, I allowed my mind to wander. Asher would be waiting for us at the airstrip when we landed. But then what? Would we just drive Everett home like nothing had happened? Tie him up somewhere in the woods? Shoot him? I shuddered at the thought. He was not a good man, but the thought of purposely taking his life felt wrong. Ryder's muffled snores brought me back to the present. His head was propped by the seat, mouth slightly ajar as he snoozed. He looked almost childlike when he slept. I grinned and stood to stretch my arms and legs. It would have been nice to doze off, but my nerves were alive, almost itchy, so I decided to investigate the weapons in Felix's crate instead. But as I reached the box, I heard movement in the back of the plane. Crouching low, I scooted myself near the edge of the crate and heard Emmeline's voice, firm and deliberate, from the back row. We need to talk, Everett. Where are you taking me? His voice was angry and raw from the gag. I'm not answering questions right now. That's your job. Now tell me where they're attacking next. Who? Everett feigned ignorance. But even on the other side of the crate, I could see through his act. He must have looked like a fool to Emmeline. Cut the crap, Everett. We both know what's going on. Ask them yourself. I'm sure you'll get to hear all about it when you fly out next week. Oh, wait. That's right. You're not flying out next week because they'll have you murdered for assaulting and kidnapping me. You'd like that, wouldn't you? Only if I got to watch. The arrogance in his voice turned my stomach. Even bound and kidnapped, he acted like he had the upper hand. Look, I'm going to try this one more time. Tell me when and where the next attack is planned, or I may just have our pilot open the hatch so I can roll you out of here. Who's flying us today, Anthony? Charles? Emmeline didn't answer, and I leaned in closer, desperate to catch every detail. This is Charles's plane. I recognize the stain in the carpet over there where a friend of mine spilled her wine last month. You foolish woman. Charles is loyal to me. If the Supreme Leadership hasn't already heard about your treason, they will as soon as we land. He'll do whatever it takes to keep me safe. Charles is my pilot. Wrong. Charles works for all of us, and he's obviously learned how to keep his friends close and his enemies closer. We'll see, Everett said smugly. Emmeline tisked. Don't you understand? I don't need your consent to get what I want, she laughed. Sound familiar? Her tone was sweet, too sweet. Everett cursed loudly. Don't you dare touch me, he shouted. Trust me, Emmeline cooed. Her voice was nearly a whisper. You want to tell me everything I need to know? Everett sighed. 
Yes, okay. I'll tell you what I know. His voice was softer now, too, almost dreamlike. What? There was no way he'd actually agreed to help her. I inched around the crate and peeked past the corner. Emmeline had scooted forward to the edge of her seat. Her hands were resting gently on either side of Everett's face. Fury burned in her eyes, but other than that, she was a picture of calm. Her features were loose, her soft pout curved into a gentle, soothing smile. I'd gotten pretty good at projecting emotion into others, or so I thought. But compared to Emmeline, I was an amateur. The way she relaxed such a hostile and angry man was like an artist adding effortless details to her masterpiece. I'd never seen such power over another human being. It was both beautiful and terrifying at the same time. When is the next attack? Her voice was soothing, like a lullaby. They haven't told me, Everett said quietly. He was ashamed. Have they told you where? No. He dropped his gaze to the floor. They haven't told me anything in nearly two weeks. Why not? Emmeline tilted her head slightly, but her hands never left Everett's face. If I didn't understand what was going on, I would have believed Emmeline was genuinely concerned. Her acting skills were superb. They're mad at me. Everett sniffled. Was he crying? They found out about the protests, and they're mad that I put her in danger. They must not have realized what a threat to her you were, Emmeline mumbled. I expected a smart retort from Everett, but he remained silent. Is there anything else you know that might be useful for me? Anything at all? Everett thought for a moment. Yes. Most of them trust you, but not all of them. I confided in Cynthia. I told her I thought you were working for the other side. I see. Emmeline pressed her lips into a thin line. Her facade was beginning to falter. Well, you look tired, Everett. I suggest you get some rest. He yawned. Yes, I am very tired. Thank you. She held her hands to his face for another minute and pulled them away with the sound of his first snore. Then she cut her eyes straight to where I was crouched behind the box. Her eyes locked onto mine before I could pull myself all the way back behind it. Is Ryder asleep? She called out. Yes, I replied. There was no use trying to pretend I wasn't spying on her now. I'd been caught. Good. You should try to sleep, too. I stood and returned to my seat. I was so very tired, but there was no chance I would allow myself to sleep now, not unless Emmeline somehow made me, the same way she'd controlled Everett. A shiver wriggled down my spine. That woman was five feet of pure terror when she wanted to be. I could only hope she wasn't lying about us being on the same side. She was not someone I would want to be my enemy. Ryder woke as soon as our wheels touched the ground. Hey, bodyguard, did you have a nice nap? I wanted to tell him all about what I'd seen with Emmeline, but now wasn't the time. She was probably listening anyway. He chuckled. You're still alive. Good. Guess I did my job then. Ryder grabbed his stun gun and stood. After a quick stretch, he squeezed past the weapon crate toward Emmeline. Oh, I was coming to see if you needed help, but it looks like you've got things under control. He stared at Everett's still form. He's just sleeping. Emmeline finished gathering her things. She smoothed out the skirt of her gown and said, You can stun him again when the car is ready. She turned to me. Is your driver here? He said he would be. Are we taking Everett with us in the car? Of course. How else would we get him back to the house? She looked as serious as she could be. After a moment of confused silence, she must have sensed my growing frustration because she added, We're going to keep him locked up in his home for the time being. For how long? As long as it takes. 
Eventually, other plans will shift into movement and we can do away with him. But for now, we need him alive. I'll stay with you while the other leaders conduct their investigations, but only until next week. Then I'll have to go away for a bit. Where are you going? Nowhere, Everett yelled. He wasn't sleeping after all, and my cover was blown. You can't hide me in my own house. Word will get out, and you will be destroyed, all of you. He focused his stormy blue eyes on me. You've fallen into the wrong crowd, Claren. I expected more of you. Shut him up, please, Ryder. Emmeline coolly walked toward the exit as Ryder pulled out his weapon. A few minutes later, Charles helped Ryder cram Everett's stunned body into the back seat of our car, while Emmeline made quiet arrangements for the crate with Dusty, the co-pilot. I took the opportunity to catch up with Asher. Thank you for coming out so late. I ran my hands up and down my arms, trying to create some warmth. It was colder in Lewisburg. The sky was cloudless, and a million tiny stars twinkled around the moon, which was perched directly overhead. Of course, Asher grinned. Traffic isn't half bad in the middle of the night. I turned back to the other men, who had just arranged a blanket to cover Everett's body on the floorboard. Asher watched silently beside me, not even attempting to cover up his smile. Aren't you going to ask about Director Walsh? I asked. Nah, it's not my business. I just love that I'm getting to witness this. Ahem. Asher and I both startled at the sound of Emmeline behind us. Pardon me for interrupting, but I want to thank you in advance for your discretion, she said to Asher. Obviously, tonight's events are extremely confidential. You seem like a smart young man, and Claren trusts you. Don't let her down. Her smile never faltered, but her underlying message was clear. Asher gulped. Yes, ma'am. Emmeline's eyes flashed down to the notebook tucked under my arm and gestured for me to follow her off to the side. Things may get a little hectic over the next week. Emotions will run high as the people realize Everett is missing. I need you to keep the notebook on you at all times. You never know when you might need to pick up and leave, and you cannot leave it behind. This is for me? I could have sworn she almost teared up. Yes, I've been waiting a long time to give it to you. I don't want to sound dramatic, but this book may just hold your future, and if we're lucky, the future for us all. Keep it safe. I will. Emmeline held my gaze for a moment longer. I thought she may say more, but after a bit, she turned back toward the car and waved goodbye to Charles and Dusty. We'll keep the crate stored here in the hangar for you as long as you need us to, Charles said. Thank you. Oh, and Miss Fraser, it's okay with us if we never see Director Walsh again. I'll do my best. Emmeline pulled the door shut, and we drove off into the dark night sky. Chapter 29 The sun was streaking through my windows, what felt like mere moments after I'd laid my head on my pillow. I groaned and slid my arm underneath to the cool sheets hiding on the other side, and my hand bumped into the leathery spine of Emmeline's journal. Then it all came crashing back. I sat up and rubbed my forehead. It had been an eventful night. Felix matched with Georgia, whose mother had been trying to spy on me. Everett forced himself on me, and Felix stunned him. Emmeline helped us hide his body and gave me this journal. She said she was on our side, but then I watched her practically force Everett to spill his guts with just a touch on his face. Whether good or bad, she definitely wasn't normal. And now she was here in this house, probably. The truth was, I couldn't really remember much after getting into the car with Asher. I'd passed out from exhaustion on the way home. I struggled to retrieve groggy memories of Joy helping me out of my gown and into my pajamas, but I couldn't recall anything about Everett. Where was he? I hurried to get dressed, splashed some cool water on my face, and dashed down the stairs into the dining room. 
Ryder, Rafe, Joy, and Asher were already there. What are you guys doing? I glanced nervously around the room. Everett's gone, and we didn't figure you'd mind if we sat to eat. Asher shoved half a piece of toast into his mouth. What do you mean Everett's gone? We locked him up, Rafe grinned. You really dine in style, by the way. I had no idea it was so nice in here. He and Asher chuckled, but I found no humor in the situation. Panic was rising in my chest. They'd be in so much trouble if they were caught in here. They could even be exiled. Except Rafe, he'd already been exiled. His next stop was an execution. Come on, you've got to get out before someone sees you in here. Especially you. I scowled at Rafe. I couldn't believe he was being so irresponsible. Claren. Ryder's calm voice drew my attention. His demeanor was contagious, and my breathing slowed as he took a long sip of his coffee. They're okay. Emmeline knows about Rafe, and she couldn't care less who you invite to eat with you. Emmeline, how could I have forgotten about her? I stuck my head out into the hallway, scanning left and right, but there was no sign of her. Where is she? Sit down, Joy stood. I'll grab you some tea, and the boys will fill you in. I did as I was told, steepling my fingers above the table and focusing on Ryder. Tell me everything. He took another quick drink and set his mug on the table. Everett woke up before we got him inside last night. I offered to stun him again, but Emmeline was afraid his body couldn't handle another shock. Rafe snorted. You should have done it anyway. Ryder smirked. Apparently, Emmeline and I were the only two people not trying to kill Everett. So, Ryder continued, Asher and I needed a little extra help getting him inside. Emmeline doesn't want too many people involved, so she asked us to get someone we trust. And you chose Rafe? You know he could be killed for this, right? Rafe picked up where Ryder left off. I'm fine, Claren. Anyway, Joy showed Emmeline a secret room, and we dragged him down there and locked him up. He won't be going anywhere. He exchanged a look with the other guys, and they all became more solemn. Something had happened that they weren't telling me. And Emmeline? I asked. Where is she? She's downstairs, trying to get some information out of him. Oh, come on. Let's get you out of here before she comes back up. Claren, I'm not in danger. Rafe insisted. I was already standing. You've got to be kidding me. Do you know who she is? Emmeline Fraser, the woman who shot Sam at my test, the woman who stormed an embers meeting with a gun and arrested Frank, the woman who weaseled information out of my best friend so she could kill the man helping my brother. Cato might still be alive if... My voice cracked, and the guys all focused their attention at a point over my shoulder. If it weren't for me. Emmeline's tired voice whispered softly behind me. I spun around to face her and took a ragged breath. Yes. Her eyes were round and glossy, sorrowful. I'm sorry about your brother. I never intended for him to get hurt. She stepped toward me, and I instinctively moved back, almost bumping into Joy, who had just returned with my tea. Again, she seemed so earnest in her apology. I wanted to believe her, but our history was deep with betrayal. Emmeline was not someone I could trust, despite what my heart was pushing me to do. Logic had to win out over emotion. Well, you can make it up to me by staying out of my business. Do what you need to do with Everett, but leave me and my friends out of this. We don't want to get tangled up in whatever scheme you have going on now. I turned back to the others. Come on, we have some work to do. I didn't wait for their response before pushing past Emmeline back into the hall and up to my room. A short while later, I sat squeezed next to Rafe in the tight back seat of a Lewisburg work truck. Asher and Ryder rode up front. I was still angry with Rafe for revealing his presence to Emmeline, but he insisted she wasn't going to harm him. He really believed she was on our side. He said he could just feel it, but he didn't know her like I did, 
He'd never seen her manipulate the emotions of others or whatever she did to Everett the night before. I didn't even know what to call that, but I knew she was dangerous. Rafe's arm stretched along the back of our seats, his hand draped casually over my shoulder. Every once in a while, his long fingers would graze lightly across the tops of my arms, sending a wave of delight coursing over my skin that reminded me I was alive. He may have acted foolishly with Emmeline, but I was still glad to have him around. Rafe made me feel safe, secure, adored. I just wished he was as wildly protective over his own life as he was over mine. There wasn't much chatter on our drive outside, but I'd been mulling over the recap the guys gave me that morning, and finally I had to ask about Everett. I leaned in closer to Rafe, ignoring the fresh, clean smell that my heart recognized and loved so well. Keeping my voice low so the guys up front wouldn't hear, I nudged him gently with my elbow. So, the secret room. It's through Everett's office, isn't it? Rafe's eyes doubled in size, and he grabbed my shoulders to face him. How do you know about that place? Did he take you down there? Smoke was practically billowing out of his ears. He went from calm and thoughtful to fully enraged in about half a second flat. From up front, Ryder's eyes flicked to the rearview mirror, and I gave his reflection a slight shake of my head. We were good back here. No, I answered. He mentioned it, but I never went. What's down there anyway? Rafe's teeth ground together, his eyes burning with intensity. I'll kill him. Rafe. I put my hand on his chest, feeling his heart beat wildly under my fingertips. What is it? What's he hiding in there? Nothing you'll ever have to see, thankfully. It's awful, Claren. Promise me you'll stay out of there. He placed his hand over mine, pushing them both into his chest. I... I couldn't promise. I knew I should listen to him. I didn't have much use for Everett anymore, but my curiosity would kill me. I wanted to know what he was hiding, and as much as I hated to admit it, a sick part of me kind of wanted to see him tied up and trapped in his own secrets. Promise me, Rafe urged again. I couldn't bring myself to do it. I wouldn't lie to him, so I did the only thing I could think of to distract him. In a move that surprised even me, my fingers gripped the shirt on his chest as I leaned forward and planted my lips on his. He was startled and stiff at first, his concern and anger surrounding Everett's room still coming between us. But it didn't take long for his mouth to soften around mine. His hand moved to cup my face as his defenses melted away. When we kissed, it was like nothing else in the world mattered. We were invincible, just us against everyone else. The moment was such a surprise, so tender and sweet, that I'd nearly forgotten about his demand for a promise. Our feelings had a way of building upon each other like that, igniting like a spark that quickly built into a roaring flame. His fingers slid into my hair, and he gently rubbed my cheek with his thumb, just like Felix had the night before. I pulled back with a sharp breath caught in my throat. What's wrong? Rafe's brows pulled together. I didn't know why or how Felix crept into my mind, but I couldn't ignore the pang of guilt that resulted from it. I brought my fingers to the spot Rafe and Felix had touched on my cheek. Nothing's wrong, I lied through a fake smile. Rafe wasn't buying it, but it didn't matter. We just reached the airstrip. Dusty emerged from the hangar with a wave of his hand. Back it up over here. The timing couldn't have been better. Toying with my lip between my teeth, I leaned my forehead against the cool glass of my window and watched as Asher maneuvered the truck so the bed was facing an overhead door in the side of the hangar. Dusty flashed him a thumbs up, and we all hopped out to greet him. Rafe watched me closely as we made our way into the hangar, but I couldn't make eye contact with him, not until I figured out why my body had responded so forcefully to the memory of Felix. 
The men each took one corner of the crate Felix had sent over on the plane, and on the count of three, they heaved it up into the bed of the truck. Whoa, boy, that thing is heavy, Asher huffed and wiped sweat droplets from his brow. Rafe jumped into the back of the truck and tugged at the corner of the lid. It was nailed tightly to the top of the crate, so Ryder joined him to help. While they were checking on the contents, Dusty approached me with a heavy expression. Miss Greenwood, can I talk to you for a second? Sure, Dusty, what's up? He shifted nervously on his feet, shoving his hands deep into the pockets of his canvas pants. I'm not sure the best way to say this, so I'm just going to spit it out. I was wondering if I could come with you. Come with me where? Wherever it is you're going. Me and Charles were glad to see Everett finally put into his place last night. But it's not enough. Things have got to change. I hate being on call to fly leaders around on secret trips at all hours of the night. And something tells me you might be a part of the change we've all been waiting for. Why would you think that? Because we've seen the way the other leaders look at you. Some hate you, some love you, and that's normal. But last night, the way Director Fraser looked at you with so much respect, I've never seen her look at anyone that way before. And if she thinks you're the real deal, then so do I. Charles, too. But he's got kids to account for. I don't. And I'm ready to help you change the world. Dusty, that's very sweet of you, but I have no idea where you're getting this idea. I'm just a girl trying to do my job. No. He shook his head. You're more than that, and forgive me for being blunt, but I'm no fool. You knocked out Everett, teamed up with one of the scariest leaders I've ever met, Emmeline Fraser, and now you're carrying some ridiculously heavy crate to some super-secret outside location— I can put two and two together. You're working against the other leaders. Let me help. Please. I looked back over my shoulder and caught Rafe's eye. He was still watching me, confused, no doubt, but persistent. I jerked my chin for him to come over. Dusty wants to join us. Rafe raised his brows and opened his mouth before shutting it again. He looked at me. What do you think? I appraised Dusty. He was young, broad-shouldered, and eager. He'd been kind in our few interactions on the plane, but most importantly, he was sincere. Won't Charles miss you? Dusty's grin stretched wide across his face. Hey, Charlie, he called over his shoulder. Will you miss me if I leave to go fight the establishment? Charles popped his head out of the cluttered office at the other end of the hangar. Are you going to win? Yes, sir. Then do me proud, kid. Set us all free. Charles looked at me when he spoke the last words. His eyes crinkled in the corners, and I returned his smile, thankful for the small amount of courage our silent exchange had given me. I was nobody. The thought of leading a rebellion against the leadership was almost laughable. But if there were men putting their faith in me, I wouldn't let them down. We'd get the outsiders to join us. We'd find Frank, and together, the embers would find a way to flip the system on its head. In the wise words of Rafe, I could just feel it. Come on, guys. Let's go pass out some weapons. Chapter 30 Rafe rode in the back of the truck with Dusty on our way to the outside camp. There wasn't much room in the cab, and he said he wanted to fill Dusty in on the basics of life outside. I suspected it had more to do with me, however. I definitely made things awkward after our kiss. But that wasn't important now. Rafe could wait. I leaned forward from the back seat, propping my elbows on the center console between Asher and Ryder. The road ahead was familiar. Asher swerved around a couple of potholes, and before I knew it, we were looking at the fence surrounding the outsider's camp. Like last time, several men stood in front of the gate, holding sticks and other primitive weapons. Boy, were they going to get an upgrade today. Unlike last time, I was more excited than afraid. This was the moment I'd been working for. It was time for us to earn their trust. Stay here, I said to the guys. I'll let you know when it's safe to join me. 
I took one of the weapons Ryder had removed from the crate and wrapped it in an old towel we found in the truck. Then I set off toward the gate. My name is Claren Greenwood. I'm here to talk to Seth. I spoke loud and clear, striding toward them with confidence, but not too much bravado. I wanted them to take me seriously, without thinking I was a threat. It was a fine line with this group. The men conferred with each other before one of them turned and retreated through the gate. A minute later, Seth emerged. He sauntered over, an amused smirk breaking through the dirt on his face. I didn't think you were coming back. I told you I would, and I brought you some goodies today. His eyes flashed over to the truck, his smirk fading as he took in Rafe and Dusty near the crate. Tell them to back it up over here by the gate. I held out the wrapped weapon in my hand for him to examine while his men directed Asher to the gate. He eyed me suspiciously before accepting it. This is what you'll find in the crate. I've got a guy making them back in Classen City. He said there would be about 20 of them in there, but my guy said it looks like there are more, maybe even twice as many. This isn't a real gun. It's a stun gun, refurbished from old parts, but it's just as effective as before, if not more so. I wasn't ready to tell him about the increased amps or the power dial, not until I knew for sure that he wouldn't use it against us. Seth turned the gun over in his hands to examine it, and on the bottom of the handle a sticker caught my eye. He stuck the gun in his waistband before I could get a good look at it, but it looked awfully familiar. Felix didn't mention tracking the weapons, but if my hunch was correct, someone back in Classen City would monitor the weapons' whereabouts at all times with that sticker. The question was, what did they want with that information? Rafe, Ryder, Asher, and Dusty each took one side of the crate and carefully dropped it to the ground in front of the gate. It hit the dirt with a thud, sending out a cloud of dust. I had just stepped toward the box when four of Seth's men moved forward and seized my guys, pinning their arms behind their backs. What are you doing? I yelled. Easy, Ryder called out. Rafe took a more direct approach. He whipped his leg around behind him, swiping the outsider's feet and knocking him off balance. Rafe twisted out of his arms as the outsider struggled to regain balance, and he had his knife pulled and at the ready before the other man knew what was coming. Unfortunately, Seth was just as fast. A horrified yelp escaped my mouth as I watched Rafe's body hit the ground. It's just a stun. It's just a stun. I repeated the words over and over in my mind as I rushed over to his body on the ground. He was motionless, but breathing. I stood to see the faces of our other guys, expressions ranging from confusion on Dusty's face to rage on Ryder's. I was definitely in Ryder's camp. I spun around and shouted at Seth. What did you do that for? I had to see if the weapons really worked. I wanted to slap the smirk right off of his filthy face. Let my men go. We brought you what you wanted. I was stomping toward him, a whirl of fury and fire burning in my chest. This wasn't part of the deal. He had no reason to hurt Rafe. No. He spun the weapon around in his hand. I need to make sure this isn't a trap. You just saw for yourself. The weapons work fine. Now please, let us tend to him. Release my other men. Not until we open the crate. You said last time that the attacks were stealthy and advanced. You might have dropped a bomb into my lap for all I know. We'll keep your men here until we open the crate and I can be sure you're true to your word. Then we can talk about an alliance. I'm not sure I want an alliance with you anymore. Trust goes both ways and you just shot my friend. He's only stunned, Claren. He'll be fine. Ryder tried to call me, but it wasn't working. I was tired of people taking advantage of me. A few of Seth's men moved in to lift the lid of the box. They began pulling out the weapons and passing them around. Each one looked almost exactly like the one I'd handed Seth earlier. There were a few variations in the parts, based on what Emilio had laying around, if I had to guess. But they all had one thing in common— tracking stickers on the bottoms of the handles. Confirming my earlier suspicion did nothing to help my mood. Felix would hear it from me later.
We all watched in silence as weapon after weapon emerged from the box. I lost count after 45. There were many, many more than I'd originally thought. I didn't know how Felix and Emilio had managed such an impressive amount of guns. Finally, the crate was empty. After every one of Seth's men had a weapon of his own, they began loading them into wagons. In the end, three wagons plus one wheelbarrow were filled to the brim. Satisfied? Seth swaggered over to me. It's a start. Now tell me more about the people who will be attacking. I glanced over at Rafe's body on the ground. First, can we get him somewhere more comfortable until he wakes up, and maybe some water for the rest of us? The sun was high over our heads now, its spring rays shining down hard through the cloudless sky. Our faces were all shiny with sweat, and we had a couple of hours to go in the truck before we made it back to Lewisburg. Seth looked me over, checking back over his shoulder at his men carrying the weapons inside, and then sighed. You're right. Trust should go both ways. Follow me, but if any of you try anything, we'll kill you on the spot. He wasn't exaggerating. Asher and Ryder moved immediately to pick up Rafe's body, but Dusty hesitated. I hung back to join him. You okay? I asked him quietly. He nodded. I think so. This just isn't what I expected. It gets pretty rough. I understand if you want to go back to the airstrip. I won't criticize your decision, and I'll never mention it to another soul. No, I'm never going back. But it makes better sense now why everyone respects you so much. <laughs> I wish that were true. It is. You put everyone else's well-being in front of your own. You're fearless, and you stand up for what's right. I just want you to know that you have my support no matter what. I'll follow you anywhere and do anything necessary to fix this country. Dusty, I'm not leading the charge here. I'm just one player in the game. The Embers, those looking to make the change, they go way deeper than what you see here. I don't even understand all the ins and outs of their plans. I'm just doing my part. If you say so. We began walking in line behind the others. But I'm going to follow you anyway. We'd finally reached the gate. Seth turned around to face us before we entered. We'll lay him on a couch in my office. You can all wait there. Do not speak to anyone we pass on the way. Don't ask questions. Don't wander off. And again, don't do anything stupid. A handful of the outsider men stood inside the gate, monitoring us closely as we entered. We were several steps inside before the men surrounding us cleared enough for me to take in the sight of the settlement. It was more than a camp. It was many times larger than the biggest ember camp near Classen City. Rafe was right. There had to be thousands of people here. Inside the walls, the settlement was set up like a miniature city. Roads winded through roughly built but well-kept homes. A marketplace was set up in the center, with many booths and tables carrying all manner of goods, from clothing to household items. And the food! There were tables everywhere, with dried beans, canned vegetables and sauces, jerky, and even some early fresh produce. A green grass-covered knoll separated the marketplace from gardens and glass greenhouses beyond. Children ran and played over the hill, their laughter ringing out through the central square. I turned to Dusty, who stared open-mouthed at the sights around us. Careful, or a bug might fly in there, I said with a grin as I tapped his chin. This is incredible. Is this what life could be like? Is this freedom? I looked again at the guards surrounding the gate, the walls trapping the people here, and the grim face of Seth, their leader. Not quite, but it's one step closer. We followed Seth into a small two-room cabin at the front of the settlement. Rafe was carried into the back room and laid on a worn couch in front of a beautifully crafted wooden desk. The rest of us gathered around a table in the main room. Seth pulled the curtains closed and lit a candle inside a lantern on the table. Its light flickered eerily across our faces as we waited to hear what he had to say next. Now, 
Miss Greenwood, leader of Lewisburg, tell me about the attacks coming our way. I didn't appreciate his mocking tone. I still don't have much information to provide. I've got someone who may be finding out more about their plans next week, but I can't be sure. Emmeline wasn't exactly the most reliable source of information. And this hypothetical attack? Are you still suggesting that the leadership's intent is to kill us? The supreme leadership. And yes, I believe so. Why? Power, I shrugged. It's almost always about power with them. I don't know much about how they operate, but I can tell you that if they get an inkling of what you have set up here inside these walls, outside of their control, they won't hesitate to exterminate you all, especially if they believe you are a threat to their systems. But we're not. We are entirely self-sufficient here on our own. We don't want what they have. We've never been a threat. His face hardened as he looked at the weapon in his hands. Until now. He stood and threw the gun across the table at me. Is this why you brought us so many weapons? Are you setting us up? No. I slid the weapon back at him and he scowled. You asked me to bring these here, and I had to go out on a big limb to get them. We could have been caught and punished for smuggling these to you at any point. And instead of thanking us, you accuse us of setting you up? Maybe my reaction was a little over the top, but I was tired of his accusations. I had big problems to deal with. Everett was locked up with Emmeline back home, and Frank was still missing. If Seth and his people weren't willing to cooperate, I'd find another way. Emmeline could still come through with information, and with all the attendants and people who'd been training with us in class and city, I may have had just enough help to stop Conrad without the outsiders. I just hoped I could do it before he hurt any of them. I stood and looked Seth in the eye. As soon as Rafe can walk, we're out of here. I'm tired of fighting so hard for you. I'm learning now that we've got plenty of people inside the cities who are willing to join us in our fight against the leadership. I glanced briefly at Dusty, who flashed me an encouraging smile. I've done everything I can to help you save your people. If you aren't willing to work with me, then I'm done. We don't need you. I wasn't so sure that was true, but I did know I wouldn't deal with him anymore. It was clear that I'd never be able to trust him. I could give him everything, and it still wouldn't be enough. He was too damaged. He would never see me as one of his own people. A rustling sound came from Rafe's room. Asher stood and rushed out to go check on him. That's our cue, I gestured toward the room. But just so you know, I suspect the attack could come any day now. Watch the skies, and if you see anyone suspicious in the area, get him. Wait, Seth started. What? I crossed my arms over my chest. He didn't have time for my explanation last time we met, and I fully intended to return his lack of hospitality this time. We'll help you. I told you, we don't need your help anymore. Ryder started to interrupt, but I held up my hand. Claren, he said, think about what you're saying. I know what I'm saying. I've given him everything I have. It's up to him now. I can't trust that he would follow through with our plans anyway. He's given me no reason to. What if I stay? Dusty asked. Everyone turned to look at him. Why would you want to do that? Because, he grinned, this is the closest thing to freedom I've ever seen. And if I'm here, I can make sure they're doing their part. And I can help from here, too, if that's all right with you. He looked to Seth. Seth rubbed the scruff of his chin. If that's what it takes for her to trust us. Look, we hate the leadership. We hate that they've stripped us of our own free will. If you're genuinely looking to fix that, we will help. Are you sure? I asked Dusty. Positive. We spent the next hour going over physical descriptions of Conrad and Frank. Seth agreed to rescue Frank if he happened to see him. I knew it was wishful thinking, but I couldn't lose hope. I also told him about Milo. Seth was familiar with the exiled because Lewisburg had rogue gangs of them from time to time, too. 
I described every detail I knew about the previous attacks on the embers outside of Klassen City. If it played out here like it did there, they may be able to spot Conrad when he was scoping out the area before he struck. If they stopped him then, they may never have to worry about surprise aerial attacks. But under no circumstances were they to kill him, not until I got a chance to interrogate him anyway. The ride back into Lewisburg was much more solemn. It was all becoming real now. The outsiders were armed, our numbers were growing, and we were just days away from learning more about the Supreme Leadership's plan through Emmeline. The city felt different as well, more serious somehow, like the people of Lewisburg knew something was coming. They crowded the streets and sidewalks, glaring at our truck as it passed. Thankfully, we weren't in Everett's car, or they certainly would have attacked again. I wished I could tell them everything. They deserved to know someone was on their side. But hopefully, if all went well and we rescued Frank, they'd find out soon enough. Frank always had a plan. I just had to get him safely back with the embers. Asher stopped the truck at the guard station near the entrance to the center. They checked his paperwork and scanned the vehicle as always, but one of the men sneered at me when he caught my eye. His lip curled up victoriously, sending my stomach into flips and bringing the hairs on the back of my neck to full attention. What was that all about? I didn't get a chance to find out. A moment later, we were rolling forward again toward Everett's house. It was probably nothing, but I couldn't shake the look on the guard's face for the rest of the evening. Even in my dreams that night, I saw his bitter expression sneering at me in the twilight. Maybe it was my imagination. Maybe it was my fear of Conrad and the supreme leadership manifesting itself into the man's face in my mind. But the feeling hung over me like a gray cloud, threatening to unleash something terrible at a moment's notice. A storm was coming. Chapter 31 Sunday morning, I snuck out of my room into a secluded corner of the gardens behind Everett's home. A small metal bench, painted white, was tucked away there, and three enormous rose bushes grew around it. They were fully leafed out and covered in buds, with a few giant fuchsia-colored blooms already bathing in their magnificence. I reached into my bag for the communicator and felt the buttery soft leather of Emmeline's journal in my fingers again. I paused, considering the book. I'd planned to read it when we got back into the center the day before, but I'd never found the right time. We'd updated Jeremy and Joy with the day's events, and then Rafe immediately launched into another self-defense lesson. He'd made plans to go outside and help train Seth and his people, too. It was another way for them to protect themselves, but more importantly, it was another way for us to keep an eye on them. By the time we wrapped up, I was too tired to do anything but shower and sleep. But I would read it today, I would, just as soon as the right moment rolled around. I pulled out the communicator instead and held the button to turn it on. The light flashed yellow and the screen stayed dark. Felix wasn't there yet. Joy had called over to his house after breakfast, so I knew he was expecting me. Maybe he was just running late. I plucked a rose from the bush and pulled the petals off one at a time. My friend Sela and I used to do that as children, trying to determine whether or not the boys we liked loved us back. But today my thoughts were different. I found myself repeating two different names alternating between petals. Felix, Rafe. Felix, Rafe. Felix. Claren, wow! Where are you? His face on the communicator startled me back into the present. Felix, hi! I grinned and glared over my shoulder at the roses hanging delicately from their stems. They did look rather magical. I'm sitting outside. I was told that my room was, uh, compromised. Normally I wouldn't hesitate to throw Justice Hines under the bus, but now that Felix was marrying her daughter it felt weird. She could potentially be his mother-in-law soon. Compromised? He furrowed his brows. Maybe that's not the right word, I said, backpedaling. I just wanted to talk somewhere more private, away from listening ears, 
and it's a beautiful day here, so I thought the garden seemed like the perfect place. Well, it looks stunning. He stared into the screen with a soft smile. His blue eyes twinkled like sunlight on the pond back home, and I felt a longing to be there. Home. Or maybe with Felix. It was hard to distinguish between the two now. How are things there? Chaos, he admitted. He blew air through his lips, drawing my eyes to them. Everything went nuts after you all left. Some of the janitorial workers found my father's spilled drink in the hall upstairs, which led them into the office. It was a mess. And the worst part is, they found a little bit of his blood on the floor. The protectors are launching into a full investigation to find him now. Oh no. Everett's blood was in Emmeline's office. She may have set herself up to be implicated in all of this after all, which meant she was probably going to drag all of us down with her. Have they talked to you yet? He nodded. Justice Hines interrogated me herself. How did it go? Not bad, actually. She threw me a bunch of softball questions and didn't seem concerned. Huh, I snorted. What? Do you think she's setting me up? No, I think she's taking it easy on you for Georgia's sake. She needs your title to stay intact. I think you'll be safe no matter what evidence she digs up, because she can't have her precious little girl involved in any scandals. I hated the jealousy evident in my voice, but it was true. Felix would be fine. I wished I could say the same for the rest of us. He dropped his head before returning his sad eyes to me through the screen. I try to steer her in a different direction. Hopefully she won't be looking to you for any of this. She will. It doesn't matter what you said. She hates me, and she's not too fond of Emmeline either. With evidence found in Emmeline's office and me as Everett's housemate, it's only a matter of time before the protectors are beating down my door on her orders. Well, I'll continue to help however I can on my end. Thank you. Speaking of your help, we got the weapons delivered yesterday. Great. I knew Charles would come through for me. He did. But there were so many more than we originally thought, and I didn't realize you were going to be tracking them. That wasn't part of what we discussed. I pursed my lips, waiting for his explanation. What do you mean? He frowned. I knew we had extras. Edgar caught word of the plan up at the office somehow and agreed to help Emilio and his team. They were able to produce a lot more with the extra help. But I don't know about any trackers. Edgar? Well, every single weapon had a tracking sticker applied to the handle. If you're not monitoring them, who is? I don't know. Felix looked nervously over his shoulder toward the door. But I promise I'll find out. Hey, I've got to go. Felix, honey? Georgia's whiny voice came through the speaker, and the door into Felix's study had just started to open when the screen went black. Shoot. I slammed the communicator a little too hard on the bench, inadvertently knocking it to the ground, and tried to swallow down the frustration burning in my throat. Edgar knew about the embers. He told me as much, and he obviously knew about the weapons, too. But why would he be monitoring them? Was Edgar playing me? Ignoring the ache in my chest and my annoyance at the sound of George's extra nasally voice still ringing in my ears, I reached down to grab the fallen communicator, scratching myself on a thorn from the rose bush in the process. Ouch! I dabbed at the blood on my forearm and stomped back toward the house. The protectors would probably be here to interrogate us about Everett any minute now. I had to make sure Emmeline and I were on the same page and that our stories aligned. Hello? I called out inside the attendant's entrance. No response. I tiptoed down the hall toward Everett's office, keeping quiet so I didn't draw any unwanted attention to myself. Only a few others knew Emmeline was in the house. Fewer knew she was keeping Everett trapped downstairs. None of them would be happy with me wandering down there after her. But I had to do it. Everett's office was quiet. So quiet that I could hear my own pulse pounding through my ears. The door to his secret room was closed, but a faint light glowed from under the door. 
good. That meant she was probably down there. I twisted the knob, took a deep breath, and plunged forward. Pulling the door quickly closed behind me, I stared down a nondescript stairwell. White walls stood on either side, and a single bulb hung from the ceiling to light the lonely steps down to the landing. There was no other sound than my slight panting. My skin buzzed with excitement, or nerves, maybe, and I made my way forward, freezing in place any time I'd step on a particularly creaky stair. Not that it mattered. No one was here but Emmeline and Everett, and they'd see me soon enough. But it still felt wrong to be here at all. The light faded once I reached the landing, and the stairwell turned down to the right. It was darker at the bottom, where another brown door stood as the only option forward. I pulled it open, and immediately frowned at the eerie red light cast down from a strange fixture overhead. It was even darker in here, and once my eyes adjusted to the low light, I realized I was standing in a foyer of sorts. Shelves lined the walls on both sides, and heavy black velvet drapes hung on the opposite end. On the right, the shelves were filled with bottles of alcohol. Tall, short, fat, narrow. Some contained amber-colored spirits, and others were clear. A few decorative bottles held liquids with strange hues of blue, red, and orange. The shelves on the left were more of a mystery, however. They contained bottles and jars as well, but these were smaller. Some held plants, dried flakes of leaves settling at the bottom. Some held powders. Many contained pills of different shapes and sizes. It reminded me a bit of the pharmacy counter at the medical center, only more decorative. The display was almost seductive. I ran my fingers across the intricate bottles. The red light reflecting off of the delicate glass created a certain allure. I pulled a jar down, admiring the powder resting in the bottom. Diamond shapes were etched into the glass, crisscrossing up toward the crystal glass stopper closing the mouth of the jar. I began to tug at the lid to investigate what the powder might be when the whoosh of the curtains at the opposite end of the space stopped me. Claren, Emmeline growled. What are you doing down here? I slid the jar back into place on the shelf, guilty and ashamed for snooping around, or at least for getting caught. This was all a distraction from what I really needed to do, talk to Emmeline. And yet, my curiosity was killing me. I stepped toward her, trying to sneak a peek of what lay behind the drapes as I spoke. I was looking for you. I tilted my head slightly to get a better angle. I could make out a large black four-poster bed with restraints attached to the corners. I didn't have a good view of the head of the bed, but at the bottom I saw a pair of legs tied to the posts with thick leather straps. They laid motionless on red satin sheets. It was a large room, much larger than the foyer area we were in, but it shared the same low light and eerie red glow. It was difficult to make out much detail. Emmeline whipped the curtains closed behind her. You shouldn't be down here. It was an emergency, I said with a frown. I wasn't done investigating the room yet. Her eyes grew wide. What kind of an emergency? There's evidence connecting you to Everett's disappearance. Protectors are probably already on their way. We need to corroborate our stories. I'm not worried about the protectors, Emmeline sighed. But you're right, we do need to talk. Not here, though. She shuddered and motioned to the stairs. Wait, can I take a look inside? He offered to bring me down here once, but I didn't go. I'd like to know what's in there. Emmeline held my gaze for a long minute. Sadness reflected from her crystal blue eyes, like a horrible memory threatening to resurface. Slowly, she shook her head, eyes glistening now from unshed tears. No, I'd really rather you didn't. If I can save one girl from entering that nest of evil, I will. It's a miracle you haven't been forced in there already. In a rare moment of vulnerability, Emmeline let down her wall. I felt her sorrow, 
her guilt and disgust twisted together like knots in my belly. Pain and shame and sadness all swirled into one sickening cocktail ten times stronger than what any of these bottles along the wall could hold. I was physically ill as I nodded. Okay, let's go upstairs. Nausea still bubbled in my belly as we settled into armchairs back upstairs in Everett's office. Everett wasn't a good man. I knew that. I'd known that since the first day I landed in Lewisburg. But whatever lay hidden behind those curtains was something much darker and more sinister than I'd imagined. Emmeline's raw emotion was proof enough. That, combined with Rafe's plea for me to stay out, told me everything I needed to know. "'Have you read the journal?' Emmeline asked. There was still a vulnerability to her that I'd never seen before. She was tired, emotionally exhausted, and it somehow made her seem more human. Not yet. It's important, Claren. You're going to have lots of questions. Many will be answered on those pages, but there was no way I could include everything. It boils down to this. I know about the Embers. They hold the future of our nation in their hands, and we have to do everything in our power to help them succeed. You want to help them? She smiled. Yes, I've been helping them for years. The network is complicated, and you have a lot to learn, but I consider my work with the Embers the greatest accomplishment of my life, and now I'm handing the reins over to you. But what about Sam and Frank and all those secret meetings you sent me to? It couldn't be true. I'd seen Emmeline working against the Embers for months. It's all in the journal, that and more. But listen to me. There is one thing you need to understand right now. It's the most important thing you can do and critical to your survival. You have to learn how to block your emotions. I know about blocking. No, this is different. I've marked a page in the journal for you to read. It'll help. As of tomorrow, I will be joining the Supreme Leadership, and as you know, their security is much more stringent. She rubbed her neck with a frown. I can't protect you from them like I have the others. They'll break right through a standard block, especially the Supreme Leader. Have you met him? I asked. The Supreme Leader's identity and location had always been extremely confidential. Rumor said he's tucked away on an island somewhere off the northeast coast of the country. It seemed excessive to me, since citizens aren't allowed to leave our cities anyway. Yes. Her face was serious again. I received a phone call last week offering me a position, which is why I had to detain Everett. He was expecting the offer to go to him, and he would have gone to extreme lengths to get rid of me, so he could have the spot for himself. What am I supposed to do with him while you're gone? That's up to you. He's been close with Madame George, probably making plans with her to do away with me, but he's not telling me anything, no matter what tactics I try. She shook her head. I guess I'll find out tomorrow when I fly out to the Supreme Headquarters. It may be time to get rid of him. I'm sure Ryder will be able to handle him swiftly and effectively. We can't just kill him. Why not? That man has done horrible things to many, many people, and he was planning to harm you as well. Claren, this movement is about to get ugly. The Supreme Leadership has already made the first attack. In my mind, that was a declaration of war. People will get killed. Some of them you will love and mourn the losses of, and some will have you dancing on their graves. Freedom isn't free. The cost is great, but so is the reward. And what about you? You got an offer from the Supreme Leadership, and now you're done with the Embers? Are you going to be working against us now, too? Of course not. Like you, I've been tasked with working my way up the chain of command. Real change happens at the top. But like you, I must be careful with what I say and do. 
Sometimes that means going along with their plans and tossing in a few well-designed wrenches until we can better situate ourselves as a movement. You've done well with recruiting the outsiders here. I'll do my best to keep the attacks at bay. But first, I need to get to the headquarters and see what they know. I will be in contact with you as soon as I learn more. And what about the protectors? What am I supposed to tell them when they ask about Everett? Tell them you don't know where he is. Technically, you've still not seen inside the room, so there's room for deniability there. I'm a horrible liar. They'll see right through it. Not if you use the methods I outlined in the journal. Trust me, please. You are one of the greatest empaths I've known. There has only ever been one other as skilled as you, and I've seen the power that can come from the untapped potential dwelling within an ability like yours. I believe in you, Claren. You just have to believe in yourself. Now, go practice. You'll be put to the test soon, I'm afraid. Chapter 32 Emmeline left for the supreme leadership before dawn. I briefly wondered who would be co-piloting the plane with Charles, now that Dusty was gone, and if he knew about the embers as well. It seemed the knowledge was much more widespread than I'd originally believed, and foolishly, that gave me hope. The protectors never came after my talk with Emmeline on Sunday. I locked myself in my room, reading about extreme blocking, as her journal described it, for the rest of the evening, and I picked it up again immediately after breakfast Monday morning. Thumbing to page 52, marked with a rhinestone-studded paperclip left on the paper by Emmeline, I read her neat penmanship for what must have been the hundredth time. Extreme Blocking It is simple to block one's emotions with enough practice, but blocks falter and skilled empaths can tear them down. Extreme blocking takes a concept you know one step further. Rather than burying your emotions down, locate your peace point. Your peace point is a memory, one that is not happy or sad, one without fear or anxiety, just a moment of pure peace. Hold on to that memory with your life, frame it, and place it in your heart. When extreme blocking, you will not hide your emotions, you will destroy them. You are stronger than your feelings. Emotions mislead and betray. You must stay clear of emotion and focus on logic, especially as an empath, because you never truly know which emotions are genuinely yours and which are coming from outside sources. Destroy everything but your peace point. When stimulated, access the situation and file the emotion away. You can extract information without experiencing the feelings yourself. Return inward. Feel the peace just long enough to rebuild your block, then protect it again. This form of extreme blocking will prevent others from manipulating you. It is complicated, but with practice it will become second nature. I recommend you default to this extreme block as your natural state. You never know who may be toying with your emotions, whether intentionally or not. It may sound counterintuitive, but preventing yourself from feeling any emotion will bring you closer to contentment and satisfaction than all the happiness in the world. It's how I live my life, and I suggest you do the same. Emotion always brings baggage. Leave it behind. Leave my emotions behind. That was certainly easier said than done. My peace point wasn't difficult to find. It was a location more than a memory. I remembered simpler days, afternoons by the pond, grass between my fingers on its bank, a gentle breeze blowing through my hair. Mom would be home preparing dinner, Dad and Kato would probably be tinkering around on the back patio, and my biggest stress was homework. I framed the memory like Emmeline suggested. I poured all of the peace from that moment into a single mental image and tucked it deep inside. It was ignoring all of my other emotions that proved to be difficult, but I would practice. I'd never met anyone more difficult to understand than Emmeline. 
If it worked so well for her, extreme blocking would have to become second nature for me, too. A knock sounded at my bedroom door, and a sense of panic immediately slammed into my chest. Extract the information and file it away. Okay, something bad was probably happening, but I would remain calm. Inhale, exhale. Let's do this. Come in. Joy's eyes were wide. There's someone at the door for you. Who is it? I stood and straightened my clothes. I will not panic no matter who it is. Block it. Blank. Emotionless. Justice Hines. Shoot. This was more than a test. This was my final exam, and I hadn't studied enough. I took a deep breath and followed Joy down the stairs. Justice Hines was waiting at the bottom, watching my every step through the slits that were her cold eyes. She was angry. Noted. Back to feeling nothing. Good morning, Justice Hines. What brings you to Lewisburg? My voice was surprisingly clear. Perhaps Emmeline was onto something. By blocking my fear and keeping anxiety out of the picture, Justice Hines became significantly less intimidating. You know why I'm here. I smiled sweetly. You give me far too much credit. I can't imagine what would bring you all this way unannounced. Enlighten me. Her lip curled. Where's Everett? I tilted my head. He's missing. Haven't you heard? Oh, shut up. I'm not in the mood for your games. I know this is all a part of whatever the two of you are planning, and I'm here to tell you that I'm on to you. Once I get the higher-ups to see what a fraud he is, he'll be out of the picture, both of you will, and I'll be in charge. Oh, Martha. Can I call you Martha? No, she practically growled. I'm sure the protectors will find him, but even if they don't, you're just a peacemaker. I'm afraid the higher-ups don't think you're leadership material. I didn't know where my boldness was coming from, but I liked it. She scoffed. My daughter is. She'll be a senator's wife soon, and you know behind every strong man is a woman in complete control. And behind every controlling woman is a conniving mother. She raised her hand, presumably to slap me, but a loud bang outside stopped us both. With it came a cacophony of voices and an impending sense of doom. She felt it too. I could see it on her face. Who'd you bring with you? I asked. We moved to the window and pulled the lace curtains over to the side. Outside stood close to a hundred angry citizens destroying the plants along Everett's walkway with sticks and throwing stones at the house. We ducked as a large rock came flying toward the window. It bounced off without cracking the glass, but the man who threw it was already picking up another stone. The protesters, how'd they get into the center? She asked. Weren't there guards at the gate? Yes, she spat the word like I was an idiot. Four of them? Those four? I pointed to a small group of guards standing near the street. One of them held a gun in the air, likely the same one we heard the shot from earlier. To his left stood the man whose sneering face had haunted my dreams two nights before. This was the storm. I knew it was coming, but I never guessed it would be like this. Justice Hines cursed, and Ryder and Joy came running down the hall behind us. What's going on out there? Ryder was breathless. Protesters, they're turning violent again. They must have followed Justice Hines in through the gate. They didn't follow me. The guards sent them after me. Quit playing dumb, girl. I know you and Everett are responsible for this, and you will pay for it. You! Justice Hines pointed at Joy. Get me a driver, and then you might want to pack your bags. The Supreme Leadership doesn't tolerate traitors, and your boss is about to be out of a job. Joy glanced nervously at me. I gave her a nod. If I was lucky, the angry mob would follow Justice Hines all the way out of Lewisburg. Ryder was less hopeful. He frowned in my direction. You should get upstairs. I'll keep everything under control down here until they leave. No, not until she's gone. I glared at Justice Hines. 
She was delusional and paranoid to think Everett and I would team up against her. But she was also woefully uninformed. How could she not see what was really going on here? Did she truly think Everett was trying to take her out? Maybe he was. He'd planned to go after Emmeline. Maybe they were both ignorant to the truth. Or maybe I was the ignorant one, fed lies by Emmeline once again. No. I refuse to believe that. Any hostility between Everett and Justice Hines was trivial in comparison to the bigger problem at hand. The supreme leadership was trying to eliminate the outsiders. Emmeline had no reason to lie about that. She was probably at the headquarters at that very moment, learning as much as she could about their plans. We would stop them. We had to. The voices grew louder outside, chanting, Down with the leadership! over and over, as rocks and sticks and other unidentified items bounced off the windows. It wouldn't be long before one of them cracked. Come on, I grumbled. Justice Hines followed me down the hall toward the attendance entrance near the carriage house. I hoped there wouldn't be any protesters there yet. A wrought iron gate at the end of the driveway would make it more difficult to enter the estate from that side of the house, and she'd be able to get into the car with Asher before the protesters ever realized she'd gone. We ran into Jeremy and a few other attendants at the end of the hall. Asher is getting the car ready. His tone was clipped, poorly hiding his disdain for Justice Hines. Jeremy would probably rather have been outside with the protesters than helping her. I stepped outside as the car rolled forward and whispered to Asher through his window as Justice Hines climbed into the back seat. Be careful. They seem even angrier than last time. He smiled. I can handle it. I'll drop her off at the airport and hurry back to help you out here. Thanks. It looks like we might need it. I'm sure you'll be irrational and impulsive with these rebels, Justice Hines sneered through her own open window. But do try to protect the house. It'll make a lovely home for Felix and Georgia when they're promoted to the district leadership, and I'd hate to see it ruined. Block her out. I took a deep breath and located my peaceful pond stomping out all other emotion, or I tried to at least. Plastering a sweet grin on my face, I leaned in toward her window. You're right, Martha. It is a nice home. With any luck, you might just live long enough to see it again. Those rebels look awfully feisty today. Ryder placed his hand on my arm, a warning that I'd said enough. He was right, of course, and we had to tend to the more urgent matter at hand. I patted the car to let Asher know he was clear to leave, and said a silent prayer for his safety. Then I followed Ryder and Jeremy back inside. We made it three steps down the hall when we heard the first thunderous boom from the entryway. Joy was crouched, crying in the foyer. They're trying to kick down the door, she said through her tears. I don't know what we're going to do. The forceful pounding continued, the threat of violence echoing through the room with every moment of impact. Ryder rushed over to her side. Yes, you do. We've been training for this. Go grab whatever weapon or tool you can find. Be prepared to defend yourself. He stood and turned toward the rest of us. A few other attendants joined us now, rushing in toward the pounding, vibrating the house and bringing our group total to seven. We don't want to hurt them if we don't have to. They're angry, but not at us. Let's get them on our side. We're all more powerful together. The door came down with a crash, and the angry mob funneled into the foyer. Joy grabbed a candelabra from the adjacent dining room. Jeremy wielded a poker from the fireplace, and the other attendants held vases and porcelain busts, whatever they could find. I was empty-handed, more focused on controlling my breathing and finding my peace point. I had to remain clear-minded. You might want to get out of here, a man snarled at Jeremy. We're going to burn this place to the ground. Why would you do that? Joy whimpered. This is our home. The candelabra shook with her hands, and the man frowned in her direction. Director Walsh is finally gone, and we don't want him replaced. This is our chance to tear the system apart. We want to help you. I stepped out from behind Ryder. But there's a better way. She's one of the leaders. 
a woman yelled from the doorway. The first man threw a stone. I ducked, barely dodging it. Ryder raised his stun gun. Stop, Jeremy shouted. To my surprise, they listened. Don't hurt her, Chad. She's telling the truth. Leaders don't know how to tell the truth. She's got you duped. Do I look like the kind of guy who is easily duped? Jeremy strode toward the man with his chin up and arms slightly spread, drawing attention to his broad shoulders and intimidating frame. The man, Chad, seemed to shrink a little in place, which was impressive because Chad was not a small man either. I wondered if they had maybe worked together in the city before Jeremy moved to the center. If she says she wants to help you, she means it. Jeremy was right in his face now. The rest of us watched silently. The mob inside the foyer probably outnumbered us three to one, but all eyes were on Chad, waiting to see how he responded. Prove it. Come on, I said. I lifted both hands in the air to show I was unarmed and gestured down the hall behind me. Ryder's eyes widened as understanding dawned on him. Jeremy shook his head. I appreciated him standing up for me, but this was something I had to do myself. If he wants proof, I'll give it to him. I wasn't afraid. Turning my back toward the armed mob, I made my way down the hall, explaining as I went. Director Walsh was cruel, a murderer. I know he hurt the city. He hurt lots of people, including some who were very close to me. But he's just one part of the problem. If we're going to change things, really destroy the system, we need to unite and work smarter. Violence alone won't get us there. You can release some of your anger here, but then we need to work together. I'm afraid something big is coming sooner rather than later. I paused outside of Everett's office and turned to see if anyone had actually followed me. The hallway was full of attentive faces. Normally I would have been twisted in knots over what I was about to do, but thanks to Emmeline's journal, I felt nothing. Logic over emotion. Everett needed to go. There, I said, pointing to the door on the opposite wall. There's a stairwell leading down to a hidden room. You'll find Director Walsh there. Do with him as you please. And once you're satisfied that I'm true to my word, come back up here so we can talk. Claren. Ryder reached out for my arm, but I turned away. His sad eyes were dragging me down. I didn't want to feel down. I didn't want to feel anything at all. I inhaled deeply and found my peace point. This was how it needed to be done. I don't think this is a good idea, he said, following me out of the room. But he was too late. The protesters were already making their way down the stairs. Jeremy stood by the door with a half grin on his face, ushering the angry mob in. Claren, are you listening to me? Ryder asked, stepping in front of me. The phone rang and I turned on my heels to answer it. Excuse me, Ryder, the phone is ringing. Now is not the time. Director Walsh's residence, how can I help you? My voice was childlike. It sounded as though I were reciting a nursery rhyme instead of ignoring the impending death of Everett at the hands of his outraged citizens. Claren? Emmeline's voice was not as casual. She was uncharacteristically distraught. My heart immediately began pounding in my chest, despite my best attempts to file her emotion away. Whatever the impetus for her call was, it was serious. You need to leave, now, she whispered frantically. They're attacking the Lewisburg camp. Chapter 33 The receiver fell from my hand. There were thousands of people in that camp, one of them was Rafe, who'd gone out that morning to train them. What is it? Ryder's face paled. He didn't have to be an empath to realize something was seriously wrong. My block, extreme or otherwise, was gone without a trace. And like a boulder dropping on my chest, all of the emotion I thought I'd eliminated from the last hour hit me with the crushing force. They're attacking. My voice was barely a whisper. The supreme leadership? When? Ryder stepped toward me. Now. 
Ryder immediately moved behind Everett's desk, pulling open drawers and shuffling through the files. Jeremy, we've got to go outside, now. Can you drive us? Jeremy was talking with Chad beside the door to the basement. Yeah, of course. Aha. Ryder triumphantly pulled out an additional gun that had been stashed away inside one of Everett's drawers and tossed it to me. Then he turned back to Jeremy and Chad. Good. Can any of the others drive? I'm not sure, Chad said, but I'll find out. We need as many people as we can find to follow us to the outside. The leadership is attacking innocent people. We need to help them defend and, if possible, capture the man responsible for the attacks. He's kidnapped one of our men. Can we trust you to help us with that? Absolutely. The sound of shouting and cries of pain emanated from the basement door. They were beating Everett. They would probably kill him, and it was all my fault. I sent them down there. Ryder placed a hand on my shoulder, drawing my attention back to him. It's too late for him, but it's not too late to save the outsiders and get Frank back. Are you with us? Are you good to fight? I nodded, afraid that if I spoke I'd unleash the floodgates. I tried to find my peace point, but the frame was shattered. My fear was raw and vivid, forcing itself upon me so that I felt every ounce of it. Inhale. Exhale. Afraid or not, we had to move. I ran upstairs and grabbed Emmeline's journal and shoved it into my bag next to the letter from Cato and an extra stun gun. Then I met the others outside. We piled into three different vehicles. Ryder, Joy, Chad, Jeremy, and I took one of Everett's cars. Two of the guards drove an additional ten people in two of their vehicles behind us. We carried an array of random yard tools and other miscellaneous objects, anything that could be used as a weapon. Though deep down, I knew all of it would be useless against the supreme leadership. We were no match for their technology. I feared the entire camp would be eliminated before we even arrived, but we had to try. Why did Rafe have to choose today to go help them train? Why couldn't he have just stayed home? The others talked through the entire drive out, probably reviewing plans and fighting tactics, but I heard nothing but a lazy stream of consonants and vowels. I couldn't focus on anything. My panic was blinding. The worst part was, my panic wasn't even well placed. I could have been concerned about the camp and the thousands of men, women, and children who lived there. I could have been concerned about Frank and how rescuing him from Conrad might be the only way to keep the movement alive. I could have been even concerned about Everett. But all I could think about was Rafe and the total annihilation that took place during the last attack. Please be alive, Rafe. I need you alive. I had to get it together. Remembering Emmeline's words, which had now been inscribed in my brain, I worked on finding my peace point again. After all, if we put an end to these attacks and rescued Frank, we might just have a shot at returning to that peaceful world of my past once again, and it could be even better than before. I pictured the wind rippling across the water's surface. I pictured the birds chirping in the trees. I pictured Rafe sitting beside me, our fingers entangling together. We shared our memories by that pond, our fears and our hopes. It's where I first realized what I felt for him. I didn't know it yet, but deep down, I already loved him then. I loved him. You okay? Ryder asked quietly beside me. I wiped at the moisture in my eyes and nodded. I will be. I'm just so afraid of what we might find when we arrive. Ryder looked down. Me too but we've got to at least try to put a stop to it. He twisted his lips to one side and took a deep breath. Hey, back at the house with Justice Hines and the protesters, you seemed different, distant almost. And after you got the call... He shook his head, trying to find the right words. If this is too much for you... No, it's not too much. I appreciated Ryder. He took charge when I lost control back of the house, and even now, I knew he was only looking out for me. But his insinuation that I wasn't strong enough to handle this stress was exactly what I needed to find my resolve again. 
it was time for me to step up and regain control of myself. There was a reason Emmeline didn't allow herself to wallow in her feelings, and there was a reason I'd resisted exploring a relationship with Rafe. Emotion gets in the way. I wouldn't allow anyone to look at me the way Ryder was ever again. I wasn't weak. I wasn't mopey. I was the girl who was about to change the world. I sat up tall in my seat as we finally neared the camp. The gates were wide open and no guards greeted us today. Through the opening, we could already see the mad chaos inside, but they were alive. That was a good start. Keep going, I said to Jeremy. Drive right in and get your weapons ready, everyone. Ryder pressed his lips together and appraised me. After a long look, he must have decided I was capable of doing this after all. Here we go. Jeremy rolled the car through the gates at a moderate pace. The vehicles behind us didn't slow down either. I gripped my stun gun and leaned toward the windows, prepared to fire at the first sight of Conrad or anyone else from the Supreme Leadership. But of course, there weren't any. As far as I could tell, these were all outsiders fighting with one another. What's going on? I don't know, Ryder said. But stay inside and alert. Jeremy, keep driving that way until we know who we're fighting here. He directed Jeremy toward the office where we'd met with Seth. There were no children laughing and playing across the central square like there had been last time I was there. Half the market was destroyed, broken signs and tables cluttering the grass. A couple of booths burned with flames licking up toward the clouds. A small group of women stood on a roof, firing carefully aimed shots from their stun guns down into the crowd. But what I mostly saw was a bunch of men fighting violently with primitive weapons and fists, in the street, on the grass, through doorways. They were everywhere, stepping over stunned bodies on the ground. Did they turn on each other? Jeremy asked. Surely not. Unless Rafe really riled them up during their training session that morning. The thought almost made me laugh, but there was no humor in the reality. The outsider's camp was falling apart. Stop the car! Ryder pulled the handle and jumped out before Jeremy came to a complete stop. What are you doing? He was already too far gone to hear my yell. He ran up on a couple of men throwing fists and raised his gun. One man dropped and rolled off to the side while the other tried to knock the weapon from Ryder's hand. Too late, Ryder stunned him. It was only then that I recognized the first man. Dusty? I hopped out of the car and joined them. Are you okay? What is happening here? I heard there was an attack, but this doesn't look like the Supreme Leadership's work. Dusty's bottom lip was busted open, blood mixed with sweat and dirt in the corner of his mouth. Exiled. He bent over to rest his hands on his knees, panting. They sent someone in to talk to Seth this morning. I don't know what happened in there, but they didn't like it. An hour later, hundreds of them stormed in here, looking to take over anyone and everyone they could find. We locked up the kids, equipped every able-bodied adult who was willing to shoot the weapons you provided, and we've just been trying to stay alive ever since. Look out! I followed Dusty's gaze over my shoulder in time to witness a man swinging a baseball bat down on Jeremy's windshield. The rest of our people spilled out of the car with a fire in their eyes that intimidated even me. The sun's light glinted off the shiny metal blade of a knife in Joy's hand. Jeremy held an axe, and Chad pulled a shovel out of the trunk. The exiled man with the bat took one look at my motley crew and began backing up slowly until he felt safe enough to turn around and run. The protesters and guards from Lewisburg stepped out of their vehicles as well. Each one looked ready to fight, but we still couldn't tell apart the enemies from the outsiders who were here to help. Where's Seth? I asked. Last I knew he was still in his office. That was quite a while ago, though. Come on, I frowned at Ryder. Emmeline said the Supreme Leadership is coming. They've either teamed up with some exiled, which is unlikely, or there's another, bigger attack coming this way any minute now. We need to get everyone out of this settlement, fast. We jogged over to the main cabin where we'd talked to Seth before. I stepped up on the porch, and Ryder called out to me. 
Wait, let's see what we're walking into before you barge in there. Ducking down, I followed him over to the dirty windows. The curtains were pulled closed in the main room, so we continued around to the back. Ryder beat me to the second window, and I felt his emotion before I got a chance to see inside for myself. It was a punch to my lungs. The breath was knocked completely out of me. Panic threatened to bubble over again, and I paused, remembering my peace point. Whatever Ryder saw wasn't good. I needed to remove the facts from the emotion. Stay steady. Block it out. Filling my lungs with fresh oxygen, I managed to stifle the fear inside and continue to the window. Two men sat on the couch, one with familiar espresso-colored hair that fell into his eyes, and the other a mixture of salt and pepper. Rafe's hands were bound behind his back, and a dirty rag was tied around his head, parting his lips and keeping him gagged. His eyes met mine in the window, a mixture of terror and fury burning from within. Frank sat beside him, with his back turned to me. But as far as I could tell, he looked to be alive, which meant Conrad was probably in the main room. He'd captured Frank once, but there was no way I was going to allow him to get away with it again, and he definitely wasn't going to take Ray from me. I was going to get my men back if it was the last thing I ever did. Chapter 34 I scuttled back over to the door, keeping low in case anyone happened to glance toward the windows. With my back to the wall, I turned to Ryder, who propped himself up on the opposite side of the doorframe. We each raised our guns, and with a nod, he turned the knob and kicked the door open wide. We leapt to our feet and entered the main room, guns held at the ready, as we turned back and forth to assess the situation. My attention settled on Seth, who was hogtied in the corner of the room, lying motionless with two blackened eyes. But that wasn't even the most shocking thing in the room. Sitting at the table was a pale-faced, slow-moving Conrad Reynolds. His white hair was dingy with dirt and dried blood, which likely came from the crimson-soaked dishcloths wrapped around his neck. He was alive, but barely. Next to him, Milo stood with an amused smirk, clapping for me. Well done, princess. You found me. My eyes darted back and forth between the men, trying to make sense of the scene. Why was Milo in Lewisburg? He could have overheard plans of the attack from Conrad back in Klassen, but he didn't seem like the kind of guy who would travel all this way just to prevent the supreme leadership from destroying another camp. He would raid it when it was all finished, maybe, but he definitely wouldn't come to help them. I took a deep breath, fumbling inside for my peace point. Hello, Milo. I have to admit, I'm surprised to see you here. I wanted to shoot him on the spot, pay him back for killing Dax. This man had no concept of right or wrong, crazy or sane. The things he had done made Everett look like an angel in comparison. He shot a sideways glance over to Ryder, whose weapon was trained perfectly still at Milo's forehead. You can call your dog down, he chuckled. I'm not here to hurt no one. I think Mr. Reynolds might beg to differ. Maybe, if he could talk, Milo guffawed, slapping his knee as if this were a comedy show. That certainly wasn't going to encourage Ryder to back down at all. I looked back at the blood-soaked wrap around Conrad's neck. What did you do to him? I destroyed his mark. We can't have his people listening in to our every move now, can we? Had to cut out the trackers, too. Unfortunately, it looks like Connie here became a mute in the process. He slit his throat and injured his voice box while destroying the mark tattooed upon Conrad's skin. It was a wonder the man was still able to breathe instead of bleeding out on the floor, though sitting and breathing looked like all he could be able to do for a while. Conrad needed medical attention if he was going to survive. He barely had the strength to hold up his own head. But why would Milo keep him alive at all? Unless he thought Conrad might be able to lead him to what he was really after. With Conrad so weak and defenseless, I almost felt guilty for what I said next. 
Why not just finish him off? Milo raised his brows, a look of respect flashing across his grimy face. Ryder had the opposite reaction. I filed it away, blocking out every distracting emotion and focusing entirely on how to strategize with the madman in front of me. This was one instance where my feelings would definitely fail me. I had to think clearly, be smart, win with logic. Go ahead, I shrugged. It won't bother me any. I won't even tell anyone you're responsible. All you have to do is release the other two men you're holding. Let me take them back with me. I glanced down at Seth in the corner. And this one too, for good measure. Three men in exchange for one? That hardly seems fair now, does it? He spat on the floor. That's not all. I began pacing, my fear replaced with manufactured confidence. The familiar sense of power that tickled my mind the last time I'd done Emmeline's extreme blocking maneuver was even stronger now. I was in complete control of my emotions. In fact, it felt like there was nothing I couldn't control, including Milo. Remember those weapons you asked me about before? Well, my position has changed since we last met. Thank you for that, by the way. They were very pleased with me for leading them to your capture. Milo raised one eyebrow. Anyhow, the weapons. I can get them for you now. Ryder's eyes widened. He looked at me like I'd grown a second head. He didn't understand. I wouldn't get Milo real weapons, not deadly ones. But I could certainly arrange for Emilio to make him more stun guns if it would convince Milo to release Rafe and Frank back to me. Growing the embers was my number one priority. Milo laughed louder and louder, throwing his head back in a dramatic display of insanity before sighing. Oh boy, you're a funny one. But you're too late. Connie here already got me my weapons. I looked over at the man. His skin faded into a sickly gray. His dark eyes were full of despair and regret. But I couldn't feel sorry for a man who'd set himself up for this. If he'd never come near Classen City or the Embers with his weapons to begin with, he wouldn't be in the situation now. Kill and be killed. That's when it clicked. The first time I saw Conrad on the motorcycle, he wasn't alone. He was with another man. Could it have been Milo? I was so distracted by the mark on his neck that I never considered who he might have been riding with. Conrad's consulting with Justice Hines could have all been a ruse, an excuse to get close enough to tap into Milo's knowledge about the outsider camps. The only person who knew about the Ember Camp locations and accessibility better than the Embers themselves would have been Milo. He would have been the best person to help the Supreme Leadership plan their attacks. So, Conrad gave you weapons. Was that before or after you turned on him? Milo chuckled again. Getting warmer, Princess. But I haven't decided to turn on him. Yet. He cut a sharp gaze over to Conrad, who dropped his eyes to the tabletop in front of him. He can still redeem himself. He can still join us. Who is us? The side door opened. The flames. Frank walked out, smiling. Isn't that clever? It's a play on the nickname your brother came up with. I saw him with my own eyes. Otherwise, I wouldn't have believed it. Physically, this was the same Frank I'd grown to know and respect. But inside, something was off. Way off. He laughed. The embers are what remains after society burns its trash. The flames are what will bring the system crashing to the ground. Milo laughed too and clapped Frank on the back. So cheesy, he said. Why not just call us what we are, anarchists? That works too, Frank agreed. I shut my gaping mouth and cleared every confused feeling rushing through my brain. Then I zeroed in on Frank. Are you working with Conrad, too? The men both laughed. Conrad was working for us, sweetheart. 
He just didn't know it. We shared a common goal, eliminating the people who disagreed with how things should be run. Or not run. Frank laughed. We helped him destroy the camps outside of Classen City. Now we know where the Supreme Leadership's weapons are stored, so it doesn't look like we'll be needing his help anymore. Frank tilted his head, examining me in much the same way Emmeline had so many times before. Like her, he wasn't merely looking at me. He was searching me deeper, somehow. But I was ready this time. Frank would find nothing. I was emotionless, an icy monolith. He smirked. You're getting better at blocking. And you never mentioned you were an empath. He was blocking just as well as I was, probably better. I had no idea what he was feeling. I didn't know what he could have been thinking either. This man was a stranger to me. The corner of his mouth quirked up. She never told you, huh? It doesn't matter now, anyway. I'm going to give you one fair chance, just like we did with the leader here. He motioned to Seth. You can work with us toward building the freest society of all, every man for himself, no rules to hold anyone back. Or you can choose to become our enemy. But you should know, we don't hold back against our enemies. We have the same goals. We're all working toward greater freedom. There's no reason to harm anyone. My voice didn't quiver in the slightest. So you don't mind if me and my men join your camp? Milo touched his hand to his chest. Aren't you just the sweetest? Can we be roomies? My stomach revolted at the thought, but I pushed it back down. You're a murderer. There's a difference between freedom and lawlessness. But is there? Frank asked. I mean, true freedom means not answering to anyone for anything, does it not? I swallowed. This wasn't the Frank I knew, and I wasn't going to play his mind games. Is Rafe still alive? For now. I hoped you'd be able to bring him around. I actually like Rafe. The problem is, we have to eliminate anyone who resists us and tries to keep us under control. All those rules and regulations, they're exhausting, and we're tired of trying to convince them otherwise. So now we just kill them, Milo grinned. Good thing I'm such a happy murderer, as you put it. And if I resist, what then? Will you kill me, too? It was a bold question with an obvious answer, but something told me it wouldn't be so easy for Frank to kill me. Neither he nor Milo held a weapon, and underneath that thick layer of crazy, he seemed like he genuinely wanted me to join his side. A muscle in Frank's cheek twitched. It was barely perceptible, but I noticed. If we must. But I really hope you'll consider my offer— your dear old dad abandoned you, and with Cato dead, I hoped I might be able to step in as your family. We'd be quite powerful together, you know. A knock sounded at the door, and Jeremy popped his head inside. After a quick glance at Conrad's blood-soaked neck and Seth tied up on the floor, he turned toward me with a look of horror. Do you need help? he asked. No, Jeremy, we're just finishing up here. Go keep the other safe, and we'll be right out. About that. It's getting chaotic out there. We're not sure who to fight and who to protect. Frank laughed. Sounds like a common problem for all of you. I glared at him. Call down your men. The people here don't deserve this. They want freedom, too. Let's work this out together. No can do, princess. Milo looked at his watch. Any minute now, Frank. Look, we've got to go. Frank moved toward the door. Think about what I said. I'm certain we'll be meeting again soon. And if you decide to join us before then, well, you'll see our calling cards all across the nation. You can come find us. His calling cards? Ryder stepped closer, holding his weapon point blank at Frank. Not so fast. Boom! The cabin shook with enough force to knock me to the ground. I scrambled to get up, cutting my finger on some broken glass from a fallen mirror that shattered off of the wall. 
My ears were still ringing from the sound. It must have been an explosion, but the cabin was still standing. I searched the room frantically. Rafe was already on his feet, peering out the door. I lost them, he cursed under his breath before jolting outside. Seth never moved. He still lay on the floor, covered in dust, but he was breathing. Conrad was also on the floor now, his fear threatening to strangle me. It was such a strong emotion from a leader of his rank. What had Milo done to him to bring about so much terror? Or worse, what had Frank done to him? Jeremy stuck his head back inside the door. Claren, I think you need to see this. Wait. I stood and rushed to the back room. Rafe was inchworming his way to the door, the skin around his wrists and ankles raw and bleeding from rubbing against the ropes that bound him. I untied the gag around his head. Are you okay? Claren, you're alive. His eyes glistened. I'm so sorry I wasn't there to protect you. I can't believe this. Frank is a traitor. He tied me up. I know. I rubbed his hair, trying to soothe him before starting on the ropes. It's okay. We'll get him. Is he gone? I think so. Ryder went after him, but I think they got a pretty good head start. What was the explosion? He stretched his arms, and I noticed a slight tremble. Poor Rafe. He was so brave, even in the most awful situations. I finished cutting through the last rope on his ankle with a broken shard of glass, and we stood. Let's go find out. We rushed out to the porch to find Jeremy, Chad, and Joy, all staring off into the distance. The fighting within the camp had concluded. A number of men were running for the exit, while others stood frightened among the rubble that had crashed down from the shock of the explosion. I followed our friends' gazes over the horizon and gasped. Rising high up into the sky was an enormous mushroom-shaped cloud of smoke. It towered over the land where Lewisburg once stood, its ominous shadow nearly reaching our camp, blotting out all the light from the sun, all the light from our world, it seemed. Joy collapsed to the ground before me, overcome by the sobs racking her body. Ryder came strolling back toward us, his eyes a mixture of rage and regret. They're gone. Chapter 35 We've got to go back, Joy cried. Asher is still in there. We've got to save him. I met Ryder's eyes and confirmed my sad suspicions. There was no one there who could be saved, not any more, and we would probably be killed if we went back into the wreckage. Frank said he would eliminate anyone who stood between him and total anarchy. That meant the cities of New America would all be leveled, starting with the district capitals. I turned back to the cabin and found Conrad still on the floor. His body was limp, and a sheen of sweat covered his pale skin. Help me get him into the chair. Rafe and Ryder lifted the man under his arms and plopped him back into his spot at the table. I walked around the perimeter, arms crossed in front of my chest. That explosion was intended for this camp, wasn't it? The supreme leadership is trying to bomb the outsiders out of existence. My chest rose and fell with hot, angry breaths. Every lungful only seemed to fan the flames burning inside me. But they played you. Frank made you trust him, made you believe he was on your side, I scoffed. How many more weapons are there? Conrad's brows turned up in the center, ashamed. I'd forgotten he couldn't speak with the damage done to his throat. A lot? He nodded. Are there more bombs? Another nod. And they have access to them? A tear rolled down Conrad's shiny ashen cheek. He closed his eyes and nodded once more. Do you know where they're going, where I can find them? His eyes never opened. He rested his head on the table before him and shook it softly. We were losing him. I looked back to the sorrowful faces of Rafe and Ryder. Like before, all the emotion I had tucked deep down inside came rushing to the surface. Fury, the strongest of them all, 
There was no containing it anymore. I'm going to kill him, I whispered. I stomped out onto the porch. Jeremy sat on the stoop with his arm wrapped around Joy, who was still sobbing into his chest. The love of her life had just been killed. I understood the pain of losing someone you loved. I'd experienced it more than once with my family. Chad stood off to the side. I met his eye. Are you still willing to join us in our fight? He looked over his shoulder at the billowing smoke and returned his eyes to me with a steely gaze. I've never been more certain of anything in my life. Good. Grab the guards and the rest of your people. Dusty, you get the rest of the camp gathered over here as well. I'll be out in five minutes to address everyone. Back inside the cabin, Ryder had untied Seth, and Rafe was rubbing a cool wet cloth across his forehead. Will he be all right? I asked. I think so. But the other one is gone. I looked at Conrad's still form slumped over the table. I wouldn't mourn for him. He was a part of the problem. Emmeline's words played across my mind. Some will have you dancing on their graves. Let the music rage on. Rafe, you probably know more about surviving in the wild than most. I'm going to need you to lead these people, at least until Seth has recovered. Help them get only the necessities so we can leave. This settlement is on the Supreme Leadership's radar. It's only a matter of time before they attack again. And if they don't, Frank and Milo will. He nodded. And Ryder, I'm going to need you to train up the others. Any citizens who escaped the damage in Lewisburg, all the people here who are willing to fight, and any stragglers we find along the way. We need to build an army with as many able-bodied people we can find. Of course. I grabbed a wooden chair from the table and walked back out to the porch, watching as hundreds of new faces gathered around me. Their cheeks were streaked with blood and sweat and tears, mingled with dirt and debris. But these were resilient people. These were fighters. These were exactly the kind of people I wanted on my side. Once the crowd settled down, I stepped up on the chair and called out to them. My name is Claren Greenwood. Like you, I have felt the pain from a society who doesn't care about its citizens. I have lost people I love, I have been cast out of my house, and I have been tasked to do horrible things against good people. But like you, I am stronger than they think I am. There are dark times coming. Evil is at work. The supreme leadership views us as a threat to their world. They will stop at nothing to eliminate us. But there's another threat as well. The men you fought so bravely against today, they also see us as a threat, and they should because you and I will not go down easily. We will not accept a lifetime of mediocrity, and we will not succumb to a world of evil, of death and destruction. They can try to burn us down, but we are like embers, still glowing bright at the bottom of the rubble. With patience, we will grow strong again into a roaring fire they cannot defend against. Seth is inside. He's alive but injured. We are doing our best to restore his health. In the meantime, Rafe here will help you gather your things and lead you to a safer destination. Ryder will train you up and help you prepare for what is to come. I can't promise you that everything will be all right. I wish I could. But what I can promise is that I will live every second of the rest of my life fighting for you. And they'll have to kill me before they can harm you again. I'll make sure of that. I stepped down and turned back to Rafe, ignoring the murmurs of the crowd behind me. There wasn't time to answer questions now. I had men to find and establishments to tear down. I'd been fooled too many times. It wouldn't happen again. A part of me, the old Claren, urged me to reach out and stroke Rafe's face. She wanted to tell him she loved him. She wanted to taste his lips on hers once again. She craved the comfort of his embrace in these scary times. But the new Claren? I felt no love. I had all the strength I needed on my own, and the look on Rafe's face said he already knew it. He was stoic, looking at me as though I were a different person. And I suppose I was. My soul was thirsty for revenge. Frank could not destroy an entire city and get away with it. 
the supreme leadership, could not eliminate everyone who believed in freedom and lived to tell about it. These games of back and forth had gone on long enough. It was time for war. This has been From the Embers, Ember Society Book 3, written by A. R. Colbert, narrated by Jennifer Groberg, copyright 2020 by A. R. Colbert, production copyright by A. R. Colbert.